Good morning, Vietnam. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Hey, it's D Day. It's uh, April Fool's Day. We're waiting on the fool to enter the courtroom. So, how's it going? Good to see you guys here. Uh, Darlene, um, the lady last night, her name is Dana. The name of her channel is Rotting Jewels, like just like it says, <laughs> Rotting Jewels, Rotting Jewels. Um, it, it's a meaningful name between her and her best friend that passed away not long ago. So, you know, hey, <laughs> but yeah, she is very nice and very knowledgeable. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Dora. Miss Dora, how are you? Hey, Missy, how are you? Hey, KJ. Morning, Dora. Hey, Trace. You think Zuzu had anything to do with Nate's vehicle issues? Oh, man. <laughs> Oh, right. Who knows? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm glad he's okay, too. I just, Donna just told me this morning about Nate on his travels to Boise. So that's good. I mean, I'm glad he's okay. I'm praying hard, too. Yeah, I got up at like five something this morning, <laughs> drove, went to the store, McDonald's, already came back, <laughs> been working on some things and in, in my Canva app. and. And then here we are with you good people. So glad to see you. Hey, Trace. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm waiting on another shoe to drop too. Always. I'm always waiting on the rug to be pulled out. <laughs> I'm like, mm, I try not to get too comfortable. Mm, you never know. He can't accept a plea deal anytime. Could you imagine getting like going all the way to this point and then just being like, okay, I plead. <laughs> But it's like, how how far is Chad willing to go or how obviously far? I bet John Pryor would be relieved if he did. Right? And he'd get his book deal. <laughs> he'd get his little book deal and his little TV show. Hmm. It's terrible. <laughs> yep. Oh, I hear your birds. Mine are quiet. They're They're noisy during the afternoon for some reason. What the heck? Why won't I click on the screen? Okay, I guess you can't. <laughs> That's different. Let me refresh and make sure. I saw that uh, Nate did some kind of report out in front of the courthouse about, uh, it's like a seven-minute report. Um, at some point, we might listen to that. He's talking about jury selection. I don't know what he's saying about it, but. Hmm. Oh, was it a couple days ago? No, it was seven minutes ago, I think. Oh. Okay. Right. He says there's less people there. Last night when he got to the courthouse, he said the night before Lori's trial, there was lined up with trucks and media mm -hmm. trucks. And that was not the way, but it could be because, I mean, they don't have to be there. Right. We, we're they, seeing it. We're seeing it live. Plus he's, he's nothing to look at, man. He's not a looker. <laughs> no. Is Gigi going? Do you know if Gigi is going to be covering? I watched, or? I watched her podcast this morning from yesterday, and um, she said that she's going to try and make it up there. Um, I, I forget how long she said, like a week or so. Uh, sit in. She said she's going to sit in for like a week of trial or, to, you know, a week and a I half see. maybe. No. So kind of like I me. Think before, you know, I think before she was, I mean, this is fine and I'm not saying anything bad about it, but I think before she was working for uh news nation or one of those things crime. and they were paying and they were paying for her. It's cause that's a big expense to yeah, go. It is. There. Oh my gosh. And, uh, Me and Jason figured it up. Oh my God. It, it, it was very, it was like 30 something thousand dollars in total. <laughs> Straight up. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> No, I mean, that's it just takes a lot of money to go and remove yourself to go live some other place for a couple of months and eat. Yeah. And and that doesn't mean you Three get to times. stop paying your that doesn't mean you get to stop yeah. paying your bills at home. You still mm -hmm. got to pay your rent and all the stuff. And oh, it's, yeah, um, it's crazy. It's crazy. And then just flying back and forth. And uh, it, it is very, very expensive. Very. Well, I. I hope that we are able to raise enough money at some point so that you can go for a, 
the important parts of the trial. Not that all of it's not important. This is important yeah. too, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I do want to be there for his sentencing. Um, and me and my daughter, I, well, I say me and my daughter, but Ashlyn graduates May 19th uh, this year. And so I, I've got to be here for that. And then after that, uh, she and I may fly up there, you know, just to, I don't know. We, we don't really have those plans set yet. I'm, I'm shooting for that. So I don't know. We'll see. It would be nice to, you know, schedule those plane tickets or whatever now or soon. That way they're not as expensive. He ain't worth all that. <laughs> you know? Isn't it something? Those assholes. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No. My mother <laughs> wanted to watch and I was thinking, I don't know if I... Hey, mom. My mother would hear me cussing. <laughs> yeah. Nah. You good. Oh, well. Potty mouth, Donna. <laughs> Your baby turns seven, May 19th. Big days ahead. Yeah. Yeah. My mom didn't even remember my birthday last year. <laughs> we were at mm -hmm. the, I went to the courthouse, you know, and Audrey had just gotten off the stand. Thank God I didn't see her. Cause I didn't, anyways. And um, so I, I went up there and sat after that went into the courtroom and everything and mom was like today's your birthday i was like yeah today's my birthday. she was like oh my god i'm so sorry you want to go out to eat or something i was like no i'm good <laughs> good <laughs> i'm good it was just different though it was like the first time you know she ever forgot it <laughs> it was weird no he's not in the courtroom yet not that we know of and that's definitely the wrong courthouse but it's definitely the right channel <laughs> hey mr mark how are you hey miss valerie good to see you oh what happened to miss ann just popping in to say hi uh say i'm praying and thinking of all you guys i'm sorry i'm making up words just popping in to say i'm praying and thinking of you all that justice will be done my mother-in-law passed away this weekend so i'll be with everyone in thoughts and love so sorry for your loss thank you so much for your support and your loving words. They're so sweet. So sorry for your loss. Oh. Hey, Michelle, how are you? Yes. Um, hey, Todd. Who that? Clement. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I forgot to, um, whenever I go, once this gets cranking, I'll go to my bedroom and grab um, the address for Todd, my brother. <laughs> That just reminded me um, for anybody who wants to write him. He is, you know, he's, he was like, oh yeah, please, you know, let everybody know. He has like 30 minutes a day that um, he can do a conference type zoom, you know, like a face-to-face -face call. He's in jail. So it's just like, anyway, so um, he's going to try and keep up that way. Um, we'll see. I feel for him, you know, Ugh. but he's, he did let us know uh, the other night when I was on here, he had called Jason and they were talking and he said that the night that that um, news nation documentary came out, that the whole dorm watched it. And he was like, everybody just had like a different um, attitude, you know, after that with him, I guess, just seeing how, you know, it's his son, JJ, and, and, and Charles, and it's just terrible. <sighs> so, you'll be Todd's pen pal. Well, he'll love that, KJ. Everybody needs some KJ in their life. <laughs> Especially me and my brother. <laughs> hey, Suze. Mm. And yeah, I know you will, Jody. Yeah, I appreciate that. Hmm. You think they will call her? I think she's pro Chad and will help prior to try and lay out to lay all the blame on her. Ah! Dang, your phone scared me over here. <laughs> it scared me. Sorry, so I, that was I, my, put the PTSD. I, brought, I put my phone on silent, but I brought my mother's phone in here. Ooh, or something. The, <laughs> I'll take it I back. I hate to her being so this jumpy. It it's so embarrassing. Me too. I went. With my daughter and granddaughter, uh, 
on a little trip and we went to see some live music and and we were sitting really near the stage and when the drummer hit the cymbal i don't i should be expecting that but yeah. i promise you i almost I almost got under the table it's yeah <laughs> it's it's a reaction my mom i can't help i'm gonna how... pop out and take this to my mom okay <laughs> it's like you can't help how you react and oh man that's been a big thing for me is just that startling thing. I know a few of you know what I'm talking about. It really sucks. What heart attack, right? <laughs> you come in and walk out like a skinned cat. What? <laughs> Headphones. Oh, poor thing, Rombo. <laughs> hey, Carrie, how are you? You saved his address. When I have some downtime, I will write to Todd. That's very sweet. I know it takes a lot to pen a letter, right? Mary, uh, detective's daughter, she writes one uh, of long, I mean, five, six pages uh, every couple weeks or so. And she's done that for like the past, uh, I really don't know when it started, but at least a good year, maybe more. Um, yeah, it's been more, but it's just very, it means a lot, you know? When somebody actually pins a letter to you and um, it's all about the thought. <laughs> Hello, Carolyn. Happy April. Happy April Fools. <laughs> Happy April Fools. Ding dong. Right. Oh, today would be uh, today would have been my Momo Mary Trahan's birthday. And yeah. Um. I just saw KJ say something. How am I feeling today? Refreshed? Stuttering though. <laughs> um, last night I was stuttering so bad. Just, I don't know. It's like excitement. Is, but I've been nervous cleaning too. So it's just like a nervous energy. But I'm not nervous. I'm not like scared or worried. It's not like that. It's just the anticipation, I guess. Um, I'm ready to get this on the road. I'm ready to put this in the rear view as much as possible and move the hell on. <laughs> I'm ready. You know, my family's ready. I'm ready to engage more with, with my life um, than I have, you know. Oh, I've learned a lot, but it's like, okay, now what? What's the next? What's my second phase or the second segment, right? Like Chad. Hey, my goodness. <laughs> Such a prophet, seer, and revelator, huh? <laughs> what? What? KJ, what? Where did I see that? <gasps> uh uh. Are you really? Oh my God, KJ. I'm so glad to hear this. I'm so glad. Yay. <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that. Oh, that is so good. <laughs> wow. Well, We're going to have a grandma shower. Yes, We're going to have are. a grandma shower. <laughs> is that what you want to be called? Well, I say that because my mom wanted to be called um, Grammy. And then she even purchased a brick at this Millennium Park we have here that was being built at the time when Zach was, you know, I was pregnant with Zach. And so she was referring to herself as Grammy. And she even got it on the brick and everything that's at the Millennium Park still. And so he's like, Mama. <laughs> and so that's what sticks. It's whatever they call you. <laughs> that's what sticks for the, the rest of the brood. <laughs> but I'm so happy for you and Mr. Wayne. Um, so happy for whichever one of your sons is, uh, you know, uh, sharing this good news with you. That means that's really, I'm so proud and happy if you'd, yes, finally, <laughs> right? Oh, poor baby. You're going to be spoiled, spoiled, spoiled. Now we got to go all up there. Of my, all of my <laughs> kids called their grandma, grandma, but they were grandma Ann, grandma Nana, mm -hmm. grandma Bessie, wow. and my little girl could not say grandma bessie so she called her bb so oh. after that grandma bessie was bb to everybody 
<laughs> that's so sweet. It is. And the same for, yeah, Ravina Denver says, it's true, Crusher. They asked me what I wanted to be called. I said that my grandson could call me what he wanted. So what did he call you? <laughs> right? Um, like my little boy, he calls his mom, uh, his grandmother, me mom. Because, you know, the first grandchild went with me mom. And then I called my mom and Charles's mom, Nani. You know, my, my cousin Daniel went that way. He's he's the oldest. It's crazy how that works. Yeah. yeah. I think that's sweet, KJ. No, nobody more deserving. <laughs> oh, remember oh, no. last year this about this time? A... Oh no. KJ. What? what? She said April Fools. God dang it, KJ. <laughs> KJ, you have killed us now. We're trying to have a shower over And here. I walked right into it, you know, D to D. But you know what? You're going to be a grandmother. <laughs> right? She just hexed you, I think. Uh-oh. <laughs> no, 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 I didn't hex you. I didn't hex you. I'm hey, just you saying, can. I'm putting it out there. Grandma, KJ's going to be a grandma. <laughs> whether, okay, so. Whether this... <laughs> Grand Mirror, French. I like that, Clancy. How about uh, Grand Mirror? Yeah, I like that. I never heard that. Thank you so much, Anna. I know you've been you've been around for a long time. So glad you're here. I do appreciate it. I'm gonna go and refresh this just to make sure. Get y'all's butts in the courtroom. Go time. Courtroom Daddy is laying the law down right now. <laughs> oh, I'm man. gonna I'm gonna remove myself and look around and see if okay. somebody. Something. Okay. What the hell? That's not it. My bad. <laughs> That's pretty lies and alibis. And here we are. Okay. All right. Just making sure. Uh, let me do cinema theater mood or mode. Uh, I wish I could just have a layout the way, you know, just place it wherever you want it. But you, you don't work like that. Hey, good morning to you, Miss Maria. How are you? Yes, it's finally time to send this evil creep to prison. I'm good, Natalie. How are you? Oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I'm good. I'm ready to go. It's go time. Been ready. As late as I always am, I'm ready to go. <laughs> um, let's just pray that, uh, you know, that, that they pick a good jury and that with minimal hiccups, let's hope it goes smooth and uh, everybody has a clear and clean, you know, fresh mind and uh, let's do this thing, you know, it's time to get justice. Um, thank you, KJ. Uh <laughs> that I, I pray for old KJ that I get a grand um grandma <laughs> thank you so much so appreciated so appreciated it'll help me it'll help me get up there you know um to go look at the toad in person mm, so excited right <laughs> I really you know I mm, I don't know I just feel like I need to I don't want to be there the whole time. And that was way too long. And without my, my baby. But. Whew. It's like a good time. But it's a bad time. Because the kids are still in school. I'd love to bring them. And just actually. You know. Make it about them. And not make it about Chud and Lori. Mm, you can send me a message. Um. Since I know you're going to be reaching me, uh, send it on um, Messenger and I'll go check. <laughs> Thank, or email me, uh, Kresha0123 at gmail.com. Hey, Jansky. Good morning. Let's get this started, right? <laughs> Wasn't that one of Chad and Lori's songs uh, from the Black Eyed Peas? You know how they had those few songs. Let's, there's one from Faith Hill. Um, Let's make love or something. And the other one was let's get it part. Uh, let's get it started. 
and um I forget the other one. The other one was like an 80s song or something. It was different. <laughs> very, very weird people, these these ones. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Kresha0123 at gmail.com. So like during, whenever they are, you know, on screen and everything is rolling, um, you know, I'll, we'll be in the chat me and or the mods you know we're gonna kind of you know we have to i don't want to be chained to my computer all dang day <laughs> so um but I'll, i'm always listening you know and then um i don't know wouldn't that be something or rombo <laughs> yeah chad and Lori had songs ew <laughs> hey janetta how are you girl Thank you. You too. <laughs> oh, Miss Vicky. I've been waiting a long time for this as I know so have the rest of you. Yes, ma'am. Oh, it's such a long road to justice. But, you know, you reap what you sow, in my opinion. After his surgery, yeah, yeah, he's doing much better. He looks like he's losing a little too much weight, though. <laughs> I'm a little worried about him with, with that. Um, it seems like, it seems, to, and this is just me, this is my observation, but it just seems like Larry has aged a lot here in this just this last year. And I mean, I know he's in his 70s, geez, you know. Um, I hope that I have as much energy and spunk as he does. I mean, I'm 45 and I don't, <laughs> so... But you can just kind of tell and <clears throat> sense that and see it. And, you know, I just hope that, um, uh, I just hope it all goes well. And it should. Go for sentencing and go to Yellowstone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a good idea. Cause I didn't, yeah. That would, that's a really good idea, actually. Never been there. I was so close to. <laughs> Good morning, Miss Tracy. How are you? Uh, hello from the UK. I don't know how to say your name, but Musa? Musa? My name's Crusha, so <laughs> my name gets butchered too. Hey, Grammy B. How are you? Let's do this, huh? Chad, we hate your books. <laughs> Which I made some uh, little designs and stuff. I was showing Donna before we came on. And so she's going to slap it on to some, to some merch. And we are going to hate his books together. <laughs> Far and wide. Let me go and refresh it again. Let me just see. I'm worried. Like I'm, I'm worried. I'm just don't want to miss it. <laughs> Y'all know how things roll for me and my, my luck over here. Let's see. Let me try a different view. Is that a better view? Yeah. Um, Ravina says, I really believe that if Kay wouldn't have been so insistent on talking to JJ, they might have successfully disappeared these kids without getting caught, right? Uh, nobody else was looking for them at all, right? Ugh. Yo, that, that was such a horrific time. Really. It's a blur, but... From what I maybe I don't want to remember <laughs> all the way. Maybe this is just the safety mechanism my brain did. Because <laughs> it was just so that helpless feeling. Uh I mean, I'm nowhere near Idaho, Arizona, none of those places. And I'm just like, oh my God, you just want to help, you know? And you just can't. <laughs> you don't know where to help, how to help. I was preparing, though, to go to Yellowstone. Oh, I mean, I was ready to throw my boots on the ground. Um, <laughs> right, Natalie. Good morning, Brenda. I gotta know. Is there going to be another show from KJ like the one she did for the Hussy? Praying for this trial to be speedy and justice to be served. Right, Miss Brenda? <laughs> 
Yeah, I'm sure KJ's got some stuff up her sleeve. She she's on it today. <laughs> it's April Fool's, so I'm scared to ask. <laughs> right. <laughs> Good morning, Hughes. Jay Hughes. Or well, it used to be Jay Hughes. I'm sorry. <laughs> hey Joe Joe Field, how are you? I'm captivated uh, from my own experience with this cult slash group. Oh. Hmm. That's interesting. If you ever care to share, I'm a vault. If you need me to be. <laughs> I'd love to know. Just to get more insight, you know. I just don't want this to continue happening. That's my thing. And it has. In, in different ways. Different little spurts of it different legs of the the one movement or as some people have called it a uh, hydra head you know a hydra cult uh, you chop off one head and another <clears throat> another one or three pop up you know it's like whack-a-mole <laughs> yeah i know but then again really the dude or i'm sorry i'm not gonna say the dude meaning chad you know the children were found in his backyard uh, while, and we know that they were buried there while his wife, Tammy, of 29 years, was alive. That is so wicked all in itself. Um, ballsy. And then, you know, through all this process, we learned that, okay, thank you, Fancy Nancy. Um, and, and through all this, we've learned about the train station, so to speak. That's what they call it on that the show Yellowstone. And um, anyways, and so you drop them off of the train station, meaning there's a 50 mile zone of death right there between Idaho and Yellowstone. It, uh, it's it's not owned by or it's I'm sorry, it's not there's no residents in within that 50 mile zone of death. So it's like kind of a loophole where. You can never find a jury of your peers because there's nobody living within that 50 mile zone. And so it would just go from the state capital of, um, uh, what is it, Wyoming or Montana? Y'all, <laughs> I don't remember, uh, Montana, huh? And, and, and it would go to boy, you know, just go back and forth and seems like a big circle jerk. <laughs> I wonder if there's anybody that ever tested that theory. It's interesting though. And I'm like, why didn't they do that? <laughs> right there. You're on your way back. Uh, so creepy, these people. I'm glad they didn't either. <laughs> I mean, I remember. Do y'all remember, for those of you have, that have been around that long, like, just wondering what the hell did they push Tylee or whatever into one of those geysers or, uh, oh my God all the the worst things possible went through your mind went through my mind such a mockery in so many ways right Janelle it's terrible these poor babies and Tammy and uh my uncle Charles Joe just uh it's gross it wasn't traumatic to I knew what was happening oh Wow. I'm so glad that you're on this side of it, though, Joe. Yeah, well, I'm glad to see you on this side of it and, you know, seeking your own kind of justice in a sense. <laughs> Zilema poisoned Alex. Are we agreed? Um, yeah. I feel like um, or he poisoned himself. I don't know. I don't know what the deal was, but it definitely seemed like the last rites type of deal. With the priesthood blessing and everything. Mm -mm. <laughs> Crazy. Yes, you have, Miss Anna. I've been around since the day it was announced the children went missing. Wow. We're glad to have you, really. You know, I've seen so many of you just here and in other, uh, on other channels in the comments. And, you know, I just appreciate everybody contributing, you know, and, and just sharing your, your ideas, your thoughts, your opinions, your theories your experiences some of you um it's very helpful and it helps paint the picture of what was truly going on <sighs> something happened there who dies on command i don't know hey miss jean how are you <laughs> um granny whisperer 
I say yes, Faye. If she didn't, Natalie says, if she didn't, then she knew he would take it himself, right? But uh, I mean, let's say he did. Let's say Alex did off himself, unalive himself, you know, then can you imagine the the mental crap that was going on? Like knowing that maybe is there a pact that's made? What what spurred it? I mean, and why, you know? Um was it just to I don't know. I don't know. It's so weird. <laughs> Uh, I get lost in the, the weeds. I often have to come back up for, for air, you know. I'm just like, oh, I don't even know where to go. <laughs> um, oh, I'm just, I'm glad to be, I'm glad you're on this side of it. I'm so glad. And your peace, good, right? That's, that's where I'm at. I'm right there. I'm wanting my peace back. <laughs> yes. You think, so you think that Alex was murdered? All right. And if so, if Alex was murdered, do you guys think that he would deserve justice? I mean, that's just one of those little conundrums, right? Interesting. I've thought about it over the years and I'm just like, yeah, no. <laughs> yes, Miss Maria, we do. We do. They're not stopping. That's for sure. They've been going and going and going like the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> um, Mr. Eric Jasper says, I've often wondered if Tammy knew about Chad and Lori when Chad and or Alex was taking her life. Did it all come full cir circle for her at that moment? Poor woman. Shake my head. Very sad. It is. I, oh, my God. I imagine that moment, too. And I can't even. Un I can't, you know. Y'all, whenever they started the trial last year, they started it with, on the projector, they had Lori and Chad's hand in hand on the beach when they got married, the Malachite ring. That's all they showed were, were the hands. And Lindsay, I got chills, <laughs> Lindsay opened up um, with all the hands that Chad and Lori affected and, and you know took out of this world like Tammy's hands and how she built the business and and, and all these things and I mean, it was pretty powerful um, mm, images in my head that I'll never get out of my head oh wow you live in Idaho on the snake river my mom was cooking and my grandma picked me up and drove off never said anything for three days my parents thought I was in there oh my god it reminds me of baby Dior Coons, right? What the hell? That poor kid. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much. Glad to see you here. Thank you for being here. And thank you for gifting the memberships. It helps always. <laughs> just you being here, y'all liking the video. Um, and just being here and sharing, commenting. Uh, that's what it's all about. But thank you so much. Let me Let me do this again. I'm so scared I'm going to refresh it and it will have been on or something. Let's see. There's 282 people in this chat, in this room. I was going to say I've been checking and um, I've been checking other things and they're kind of all. Yeah. Oh, wait, they're all on Nate. standby okay. with us. I'm just making sure yeah. I get I get nervous. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Too many times. I feel like though. somebody's talking about something somewhere. We're missing it. What is yeah, it? Yeah. Well, there's 1,600 <laughs> people watching at East Idaho News. And I know there's hidden to crime and so on and so forth. Everybody, everybody's streaming it. So, you know, thank y'all for being here with us. Um, you know, you could be anywhere in the world, but you're right here. And I appreciate that. Oh, wow. Sunny. I live five miles from the home where they all lived in Chandler and, and Charles. Yeah. Um, Trace has gone by there and, and on the anniversaries or birthdays and stuff like that. And, um, um, shared some really deep experiences, you know, just going by the house, making peace, you know, paying respect and stuff. I appreciate her for that. Oh, oh, all right. Let me remove my, well, I'll remove myself whenever they get going. You're at work listening. All right. Well, it says view of judge. It says something different on the screen right now. You wouldn't be anywhere else, Anna. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. 
Hello, Seeking Justice. <laughs> Good to have you here. Eric, we win the lottery from Chris. What? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, do I need to change my Nightbot, uh, Donna? Did you say that I have the wrong link on there? On my Nightbot for the merch? I think it is the wrong link. I'll see. Let me see if I can grab it okay. right now. Oh, no, no, no. I'm just, I'll, well, whenever they go on, I'll go and try and fix it. <laughs> oh, thank you, Ashley. I just didn't know. I remember you saying something the other day and I was just trying to make sure I was remembered right. <laughs> um, yeah, because so many things go on in between. <laughs> thank you so much, Ashley. I appreciate it. I'm glad you're here. I'm, oh, you're listening? All right. Well, thank you. <clears throat> it it should be just pretty routine and mundane, just kind of going through the motions. I didn't I didn't keep up with any of this part last last time with Lori. Um, I think there were a few things that I listened to, maybe from Nate Nate that Nate had gathered or whatever, and um, you know. But other than that, I think it's going to be pretty routine and a lot of downtime in between you know the questioning and everything oh thank y'all so much hey robinette hey mad donut looks like they're hiding in chambers <laughs> selling sellings <laughs> no ceilings right <laughs> yes it's jury selection chris sure is um good morning thank you sunny thank you so much oh my goodness so glad y'all are here. Thank you, Ms. Dora. That's what I'm saying. Thank y'all for being here. I said, uh, <laughs> I think that Chad may successfully have a uh, break oh, YouTube oh, today. There they are. Okay. Court? Yeah. It sounded like Court? it was raining. Mm -hmm. Just waiting. It's That's not my mouse. <laughs> He's up there in the corner. <laughs> He's working the corner over there. <laughs> Hey, Jansky. Uh, Crush, remember to take care of yourself during this trial. You need to keep healthy. I need to get back <laughs> to healthy. Oh, my gosh, right? We're, we're going to try and do the get fit for trial. And, I mean, yes, thank you for that. And so, anybody that is here, we're going to be kind of nailed down for the next 8 to 10 weeks. So, this goes for everybody. Self-care, he ain't worth it, okay? So, let's go take a walk around the block or something. Every now and then, let's get moving. Let's stand up and you know, um, kind of stretch and everything and just not be so mean to our bodies. Chad Daybell is not worth it. Just because he can't move doesn't mean we want to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. It feels like they picked him from space, right? Let's see. Beach lady. Only 48 days till we leave for Dolphin Island. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> Go fancy. You know, be like John C. Lilly. And, and he's obsessed with the, uh, with the dolphins. <laughs> yeah, I know, Robin. He ain't shite. Jailhouse justice for the joke of the cult. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, you're welcome. And thank y'all for being here. And we got to do this together. We got to do this together. I want to be able to visit with you guys in the future, you know. <laughs> so if we're not healthy and we don't keep up. Um, even the mental. I mean, seriously, on the mental part and the mental health, you know. And if it gets to be too much, push away. This, this shit will be here. <laughs> it ain't going nowhere. It's a lot. Um, thank you, Deneen. Thank you so much. Uh, is that camera as big as it's going to get? I sure in hell hope not. <laughs> I wouldn't think so. Um, I don't know why. Uh, hold on. I'm trying to look at it. I'm looking in there. I wonder if it's the same courtroom that we were in last year. We were in 403. Which was right right next to 404, y'all. I was like, well, that should be the courtroom. <laughs> 404 not found, you know. Ha uh ha. -huh. Anyways. <laughs> um, health, 
healthy for me is breathing. Amen. <laughs> I'm right there with you, girl. <laughs> right there. Uh, Gresha, I will be traveling next year in your neck of the woods. I will come on down. Come on down. I would love, love to, to meet you. That would be awesome. It really would. Hit me up. Kresha0123 at gmail.com. Uh, email me. Email me and I'll give you my phone number. That way I don't have to, you know, we don't have to wait till a year from now. And then, you know. Kresha, what are your thoughts on the death penalty? And wonder what Lori knows about Chad's trial. I don't know. My thoughts on the death penalty is I don't really don't care. <laughs> I mean, I really would. I really would prefer they get life only because it's punishment. Death is too easy. Um, and then not only that, but then learning, I'm sorry. And it, but learning about how Idaho in the past has, Oh, sorry. <laughs> Idaho in the past has um, handled things as far as the death penalty and everything, you know, with Thomas Creech that, I mean, just, just some sketchy stuff. Uh, Gerald Pizzuto. Um, I, I just, it's weird. It, it just seems too technical. Uh, it's extra. I mean, I understand the, the logic behind it. I'm, I'm for that, but all the other stuff, it just seems like, I don't know, just seems so technical and red tape and, uh, it's politics, basically politicking. So I just think that they should have to sit in prison for the rest of their lives. You know, they, they didn't want to die so bad, but they wanted to control all the people so close to them that loved and trusted them. And, um, you know, they were quick to betray that, but you know, it sucks. They suck. I, I wonder what Lori, well, I mean, Lori knows the same thing, you know, what she did, Chad did. That's the conspiracy. But do you think, do y'all think that she's going to be called in to testify? I, I mean, <laughs> and then if so, what would she even freaking say? She didn't say nothing at her trial. <laughs> it's like, I mean, and would it be for the state or would it be for the defense? Hmm, curious. Thank you for asking. <laughs> All right, let me go refresh this again. I mean, I know they're on there. Yeah, I see that lady moving. <laughs> um, Miss mm, Clancy says, no one has impressed me with their words and insight on this case year after year than Larry Woodcock. No one. When he speaks, I listen. That's awesome. Hey. I love him so much. <laughs> I do. I'm so blessed uh, to have such a great stepfather. <laughs> Y'all, <laughs> look, it looks like gray hair. I, I hope that's not. I really think that's my makeup. I hope. <laughs> we'll just say it's my makeup. <laughs> yeah, I'm starting to look like my mom and my dad <laughs> with their little gray hairs. You wish she would testify against him and he would testify against her in Charles's case. Ooh, smack, <laughs> right? Ooh, I, I like that idea. Mm -mm -mm. That's nuts. I didn't even, I've never even entertained that. I never thought of that. <laughs> oh man, can you imagine? And that would, that would explain why Arizona did, wouldn't have charges on Chad. I mean, I think he should have charges. That's just me. I understand the business behind it, kind of, but I don't really, mm -mm. not the things that he said, not the calling the, um, the mortuary arranging my uncle's cremains. Uh, uh, these people are atrocious. <laughs> she won't testify against her toad. <laughs> I told you so, right? <laughs> Ooh. I thought about y'all ordering like a cardboard cutout of Chad, you know, because that's basically what this is going to be like. If the camera ever goes to him, if it does, if it catches him, it's just going to be like this. <laughs> you know, he don't blink. He don't move. There's nothing to watch. 
I, I'm really more excited to see what John Pryor's got. <laughs> He's so animated. Um, Lori would be a very hostile witness. Kind of like I think about Melanie Pulaski, right? Uh, off the hook, way too easy. I don't, uh, Carrie says, I don't think so. If she was going to, if she was going to be, we would have seen a transport order for her. Like I said, I got a vine thing the other day and I was just like, well, I even gave it to Jason. I was like, what does this mean? <laughs> you know, and he was like, and then just saying that she's still in the DOC. And I was like, okay, well, what was the point of that? But I'm just saying, you know how they have their little glitches. <laughs> it would be interesting. Oh, I can hear the the jailhouse bluesy music, you know, playing as she steps off the bus. <laughs> can you imagine? Oh, fancy Nancy. Lori is all of our papa. Uh, he would like that. I know he. Yeah, that's sweet. He is incredible. Yeah. His birthday is on the 12th of April. I know KJ's, uh, KJ's is on the 8th, I think. Right. <laughs> and then Jen's is today also. Um, True Crime Unveiled. So happy birthday, Jen. Love you. Getting old, lady. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, Faye Fair says, snap. I was going to ask that. Would she? Could she? I hope not. But then what else can we expect from a pair of narcissists? <laughs> That's a rhetorical question. It's not a challenge. <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, he does. He he works a room, so to speak. Um, Kind of charismatic in that sense. Yeah. And empathy, you know, you, it just, I don't know. He means it. He's always been like that. <laughs> Mm, why wait I just saw something Melanie's eyelashes look gross look y'all so when I met Na uh, Natalie Pulaski when I went up there January 2021 I met her and I met her and Ian's two children and that's what she told me basically that like she went and had lunch with Melanie you know this woman's going to be around her children I would do the same thing but I wouldn't have ate anything around her. <laughs> I was like, did you eat anything? And I'm so glad you're here, you know? And, um, but she was like, her eyelashes freak me out <laughs> and her teeth too. She said, they're just too white and perfect. <laughs> I was like, I get it. I get it. <laughs> oh man. I'm so, I was like, I'm just glad you're okay. And you know, that she basically, she acted too. And she contacted Brandon and they were in contact and then kind of, mom kind of came into the loop mom and larry and you know it it's nuts oh good to have you here christy graham thinking of your family from melbourne australia good to have you here y'all i turned that show on uh is it wentworth <laughs> and jason he's like i really like this show and i'm like what i just turned it on just because i was tired of looking for anything and then here we are we've already watched it twice Oh my goodness. Um, thank you, Olive. It's so hey girl, how are you? How are you doing? How you doing? <laughs> thank you. Lori and her Kool-Aid lipstick. <laughs> right? Right. The face starts falling. <laughs> oh, do you there's a, a couple shots or whatever from her whenever she was ch uh like checking in, I guess you could say, coming in. She was being extradited and she got to the new prison. So, you know, they're walking her through the process. And there's just one where her, it, her face is all contorted. And I'm like, yep, there's that. <laughs> that that matches the rest of her, her soul. Oh, right. Wouldn't that be awesome? I wonder if uh, Audrey's going to stick with her story about, you know, Lori allegedly. Or, I don't know. Does that mean it's true? Do I have to say allegedly still? <laughs> um, Lori saying that she would kill her. Or whatever. I wonder if Cardboard should. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He stays in that portal. 
The fake eyelash game that the kids are breaking out disturbs me. My daughter wears them and it looks like bugs. What? I don't even know. What is that a thing? <laughs> There's a fake eyelash game. What? I'm going to have to Google it. <laughs> Larry's authentic uh, folk. Feel him. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry, Eric. I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. It's still, I'm sorry. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. That's crazy. It just reminds me of the like the ending of the notebook. Y'all, <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> you know, back in the day when that came out, and it was just like, oh. Mm-hmm. Oh, Larry, she has a birthday with your oldest son, 22 this year. I know I'm getting old too. My son's 24. <laughs> My daughter's 18. Yeah. And then 14. I gotta remember all the ages. They're all on their even years right now. I have three bonus children. And uh Silas is eight, Tay is ten, and Leland is fourteen, I think. I think I have that right. I know Tay's the same age as JJ would be. And I think that's right. No, he'd have been eleven. So she might be twelve. Hell, I don't really know. I'm gonna shut up. Audrey is surely she better be a damn witness. Audrey is surely not a witness. Either side could trust much. But then again, she is in that circle. She was visiting Chad after he was locked up. She served on the grand jury and a witness. So mm, she better damn be. Oh, <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, they saved me a Google search. <laughs> oh. Fun Tuski says John Pryor is going to chew them up and spit them out. They were probably already sweating a month ago. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, dapper Dan. He looked so dapper the other day in his um his little interview extravaganza, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> oh man. Maybe John Pryor hit Johnny Walker too hard this morning. <laughs> Oh, good. <laughs> Me too, Zero. I think so, too. Who's here for it? John Pryor is going to tear Melanie Gibb apart. I. <laughs> I'm here for that. Yeah. She allegedly told this woman that. <laughs> I'm not in a condition to, but I'll get myself there. Like she was big and scary. Yeah, if it's true. I don't believe it's true. That's just me. It's easy for people like Melanie Gibb and David Warwick and even Audrey and Zelena. All these people, but mainly I see it in David and Melanie. I feel like they um, are very close to the situation. Maybe even, in my opinion, had their hands in it personally. And um, literally having, you know... Uh, blood on their hands and then they concocted what we hear recited over and over today that to me it's like you know they took part and then they kind of constructed the story around what had already come out and what they knew and then they based it around that that's just me I really think that's what's what happened here and I wish you know I wish I could know <laughs> uh that would take, you know, all the all the wonder and the uh, um, mystery out of it. Everything. Oh, I'm so sorry. My husband passed away 15 years ago today. I don't do April Fools anymore. Oh, shut, baby. Oh, I I can't imagine. Mm -hmm. So sorry for your loss. <laughs> you go girl Matt Donut says I've been off YouTube and on a law and order SVU binge <laughs> I've had to cleanse your cleanse your palate before the trial right well hey I don't blame you I've been doing the same thing too um I do my my rounds um yeah me too me too me me too Things it's like I wonder what things would be like today had the police listened to Charles. 
initially and not just kook, you know, labeled him as a kook. <laughs> Melanie Gibb. Yeah. Remember? Oh, no. I was thinking Audrey when you did that little emoji because, you know, Audrey did the whole um, emoji with the with the X'd out eyes for Tammy, you know. I think so too, Faye. Audrey said that tale for Chad's benefit. I think so too. And to just kind of seal the deal. You know. Because it, she didn't even say that. She didn't say it anytime she met with the grand jury. She didn't disclose that. She never testified to it. And then boom, she comes in here. And it wasn't even, you know, direct uh, examination or whatever with prosecution. It was, it went direct cross and then back to direct and then it went when did she say it? it was like two or three times after when they were going back and forth between prosecution and defense and I was like now you're gonna say it so it's I feel like she got provoked you know like she was just like okay I'm about to just cut the ties right the ties that bind huh <laughs> anyways <laughs> so glad y'all can't see inside my head <laughs> all the things I say in my head and I'm like you know don't say that mm -hmm. oh all right showtime let's get it on it looks like the same damn courtroom all right I'm gonna be quiet All right, good morning, everyone. We're going to go on the record now. Uh, we will not start the broadcast here for a moment while I make a few. No, it's, it's not that full. That's the same exact courtroom, though. It looks like it, except for the, maybe the table where Chad's at seems to be turned facing the same direction as prosecution. When Lori was there, it was like an L shape, you know, it was like, um, it was parallel with the jurors, which, you know, was opposite of Lori and the defense. The wise voice of Judge Boyce, says Jessica Rutledge. You hung your do not disturb sign. <laughs> All right. Court in session. Right. Yeah, he makes my... He's in there with his white shirt like he's a damn missionary. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I know, Ray. I know. I just don't know. I don't get how these people think they could get away with this. Oh, that's right. They thought they were exalted. Right? Oh, this is what happens when, when you know, you, you get them God powers. <laughs> the God complex. It, it's occurring way too often now. Missionary is <laughs> mad donut. Uh, maybe you were not meaning it that way, but I read it that way. Missionary is all Chad will ever know. <laughs> hmm. I'm in the gutter. Maybe he still thinks he is still part of the ministry. Right, Chris? Oh. They thought they were gods. Yeah, Joe. And you know firsthand, right? <laughs> Someone go plug in the laptop. <laughs> mm. Chad looks like he has constipation. Well, he's right there with his, his uh, attorney, who always looks constipated as well. <laughs> A.B. was scared shitless. Chad would come after her to silence her. A.B. Who's A.B.? 
Oh, Audrey. <laughs> Durr. Sorry, Robinette. <laughs> Had a little blonde moment there. That song, They Call Me a God, right? <laughs> That's jail food for you. They have to wear prison garments. <laughs> oh my God, Jax. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Oh my god, I gotta, I, I'm gonna write that down and I don't know, we'll throw that on a meme or something and put your name on it. <laughs> we'll credit you. Oh, my bad. <laughs> gotta write that down. <laughs> they went from wearing their undergarments to prison garments. Mm -hmm. Maybe I just found that way too funny. <laughs> it's about how I go. <laughs> I appreciate it though. Where's the damn pants? Oh, there they are. Way behind me. Can can you see anything? No, not right now. They turned that off when Judge Boyce was like, "Hey, I'm gonna say this before we go on." You know, I'm thinking, "Uh oh, <laughs> here we go, right out the gate." Light them if you got them. Okay. I don't think they can wear their garments in jail. That is what I heard anyways. <laughs> Interesting. Well, like Lori, you know, I mean, sh she thought she was invincible and a goddess. And so she didn't think she had to wear her garments anymore. So, you know, now Chad was this fellow. He was, he went through a disfellowship, uh, a disfellowship uh, from the church, not an excommunication. They're different. I just want you to know <laughs> that means he can go back into the good graces of the church. I don't know how he'd pay his tithing, but then he don't have an income to pay tithing on. Interesting. I wonder if like he paid, you know, his 10% off of the money he got back from, from Tammy's death. No, Miss Deneen, uh, none of us are there right now. Me, mom, or uh, Larry are not there. We're here in Lake Charles. They're, they're going to be heading up this week. <laughs> that is interesting, huh, Jessica? Now I'm actually curious. Are Mormons allowed to wear their uh, their garments in jail? I mean, Muslims get to wear some of their stuff. I mean, and they basically just look like, um, you know, under under like boxers and a t-shirt kind of thing. Um, but according to his disfellowship, you know, he's not supposed to be able to enjoy these kinds of things. Ooh, Eric says he's carving the rest of the ham off the bone. The Mrs. roasted yesterday. Oh my God, it was so delicious. Oh, and happy, happy late Easter to you guys. Any restrictions on Larry being in the courtroom this time? Not that I'm aware of Michelle's mixed media madness. <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. He's actually a witness in the death penalty part of Chad's trial. Um... Chris says that Jessica, they can go, I mean, uh, they can if they go through the proper channels. Jill is only intended to keep you away from general pop. Hmm? What, Jill? Huh, I'm confused now. <laughs> uh, uh, Lisa Tag Tagliabu. <laughs> Arizona needs to be held accountable for not taking trolls seriously. If they did their job, none of us would be here today. Right. Uh, Jean Marie says, no, no garments in jail per someone who was in Salt Lake City jail for almost a year. Interesting. Thank you, Jean. <laughs> See, you guys are such a great community to have, I swear. Yeah, I don't know. And that is a question I want to ask. Like, when do you even start? When does a Mormon, um, when do they start wearing their garments? That's one thing I was unclear about, if any of you know. I mean, is it different for a guy and a girl? Um, I know you don't take them off, even for relations sometimes, but, or to shower. I've even heard people keep them on. As far as I know, Joyce Meyer, um, she wasn't, I mean, we haven't heard anything publicly. Uh, and, and then again, you know, it was leaked by court TV um, that Chad had been disfellowship. 
uh, this it don't even sound right. It sounds like a made up word. Disfellowshipped, <laughs> you know, but it is different than excommunication. And um, it's kind of like a suspension. Because you can still earn Pressure. it back. I mean, oh, yeah. I believe that they start wearing their garments when they go through one of the um, I forgot now I had it on, I had it in my mind, but I've, I've forgotten what they call it. But it's not when they get baptized. They get baptized at eight. But right. then later on, they go through like the, a confirmation uh, for a Catholic the I guess. orientation when they wear their outfits and going through go through the oh missionary the um, mission on their mission. Yeah, so and... usually usually they're old enough to to like be missionaries or be getting married because you would want to do this before you oh. get married or before you go. So okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're on the record on Fremont County case CR 2221-1623, State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Abel. I'll note that the attorneys are present. The state is here represented by the prosecution, the defense, and the defendant. I'll further introduce them in a moment. Uh, is the state ready to proceed this morning? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Is the defense ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Before we begin with further board dire examination, let me inquire of the state. Is there any objection to the manner in which the jury panel has been recalled and seated today? No, Your Honor. Any objection from the defense? No, Your Honor. Thank you, counsel. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, then thank you for returning this morning. You've been recalled as prospective jurors in this case now before us. I'll again reintroduce my court staff. Uh, my name is Stephen W. Boyce. I'm the district judge of Fremont County, Idaho. I'm in charge of the courtroom in this trial. Uh, court clerk here assisting today is Shannon Holstein. She's taking minutes of the proceedings and will be administering oaths to you this morning as well. The marshals here assisting with courtroom order and helping the jury movement are Steve Holmes, Ken Beige, and James Ravello. Uh, court reporter this morning is Mary Fox, who's taking a stenographic record of everything said during the trial proceedings. And my staff attorney is Courtney Stallings, who's seated to the far right over there at a table. She assists me from time to time with legal research and administrative issues. Each of you, 16 jurors here, have been qualified to serve as a juror of this court, and each of you filled out a questionnaire that's been reviewed now by counsel in the court. And it was determined to recall you for further questioning. The thing we're doing in this trial at this stage is to select a total of 18 jurors, compromising 12 jurors and six alternates from among you. At this time, the clerk will now read a roll call of the jury, not referring by name, but referring by your red card number. So I'll have the clerk do that. If you would just hold your number up once your number is called, we'll make sure we all know where you're seated and that this is the proper seating for this group. Once I call your number, if you can audibly answer that you're present. Juror number 11. Okay, present. Juror number 27. Second. Juror number 31. Second. Juror number 41. Present. Juror number 48. Present. Juror number 56. Present. Juror number 67. Present. Juror number 121. Juror number 146. Juror number 186. Perfect. Juror number 219. Present. Juror number 249. Juror number 296. Present. Juror number 321. Present. Juror number 348. Juror 394. Present. Thank you. All right, to assist you in understanding and participating in the jury selection process, I'll now reintroduce you to the parties and their attorneys and briefly summarize what this case is about. When I introduce an individual to the stand and briefly face the jury panel, then we take your seat. This case has been brought by the state of Idaho. I'll sometimes refer to the state as the prosecution. The state's represented in this trial by Lindsay Blake, Fremont County Prosecutor. Rob Wood is the Madison County Prosecutor and Special Assistant Prosecutors Ingrid Beatty and Rocky Wixom. 
The defendant in this case is Chad Guy Daybell. He's represented by his attorney, John Pryor. This case is a criminal matter, which means the defendant is charged by the state of Idaho with the violation of the law. I previously read to you a summary of the charges in the amended indictment when you were here last week to complete your questionnaires. With regard to the defendant, the state of Idaho alleges that Chad Guy Daybell committed the crimes of Count one, conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grand theft by deception. Count two, first degree murder. Count three, conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grand theft by deception. Count four, first degree murder. Count five, conspiracy to commit first degree murder. Count six, first degree murder. Count seven, insurance fraud. Count nine, insurance fraud. Mr. Daybell has pled not guilty to these charges. Please remember, this is simply a description of the charges. It is not evidence. Under our law and system of justice, every defendant is presumed to be innocent. This means two things. First, the state has the burden of proving the defendant guilty. The state has that burden throughout the trial. The defendant is never required to prove his innocence, nor does the defendant ever have to produce any evidence at all. Second, the state must prove the alleged crime beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is not a mere possible or imaginary doubt. It is a doubt based on reason and common sense. It may arise from a careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence or from a lack of evidence. If after considering all the evidence, you have a reasonable doubt about the defendant's guilt, you must find the defendant not guilty. I'll next discuss your duty as jurors. Duty of the jury is to determine the facts and then apply the law set forth in the instructions I will later give you to those facts. In this way, you will decide the case. In applying the court's instructions as to the controlling law, you must follow those instructions regardless of your opinion of what the law is or what the law should be or what any lawyer may state the law to be. During the course of this trial, including the jury selection process, you are instructed that you are not to discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else, including use of email, text messaging, social media, or any other form of communication, electronic or otherwise. Do not conduct any personal investigation or look up any information from any source, including the internet. Do not form an opinion as to the merits of the case until after the case has been submitted to you for your determination. This time, I'll instruct the clerk to administer an oath to the jury panel. The clerk will now swear the entire jury panel for this word our examination. If each of you would please stand and raise your right hand. You solemnly swear or affirm that you truthfully answer such questions as may be asked of you by court or counsel, touching upon your qualifications to sit as a trial juror in the cause now on trial, so help you God. Thank you. Please be seated. I'll note that each juror took the oath just now. <clears throat> Clerk has impaneled 16 prospective jurors for questioning in small groups today. Uh, we've gone through their roll call as well. At this time, I'll ask the state, will the state stipulate that the jurors were properly called and impaneled today? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Will the defense stipulate as well? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, thank you, counsel. Uh, next, I'll inquire of the marshals here. I did require that the jurors complete a jury affirmation that they've not gone back to review or uh, investigate the case since they filled out the questionnaires. Did each juror complete an affirmation? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you for following the court's admonishment and completing your affirmation today. In this part of the jury selection process, then you'll be asked questions touching on your qualifications to serve as jurors in this particular mm -hmm. case. This part of the case is known as Vordire examination. Vordire is an ancient Anglo-Norman term dating back hundreds of years to the origins of the common law. In Old French, it simply means to speak the truth. Vordire examination is for the purpose of determining if your decision in this case would in any way be influenced by opinions which you now hold, or by some personal experience or special knowledge which you may have concerning the subject matter of this trial. The object is to obtain 12 trial jurors who will impartially try the issues of this case upon the evidence presented in the courtroom without being influenced by other factors. 
Please understand this questioning is not for the purpose of prying into your affairs for personal reasons, but only for the purpose of obtaining an impartial jury. Whenever you need to answer a question, please raise your hand and call upon to speak. Please identify yourself by that red card number you have. Because these proceedings are being stenographically recorded by a court reporter, also please speak clearly and give audible answers such as yes or no, rather than, for example, nodding your head. In addition, please wait for the person you are addressing to finish the sentence before speaking so the court reporter doesn't have to deal with two people speaking at the same time. Uh, importantly, if you have any answer to questions and other questions I'll identify that will either be embarrassing for you to answer publicly or you think are best answered in a more private setting, the court will arrange that. Similarly, if you have an answer that you think could prejudice other prospective jurors, uh, for example, of information you may know about this case, please refrain from discussing that in front of the other jurors, and we will talk to you about that individually as well, outside of the presence of the other jurors. As I mentioned then, if you have knowledge of this case from pretrial media or coverage or publicity, please don't discuss any specific facts of that in front of the other jurors. And there is a special instruction that's been given in this case, which I'll now give to each of you together. And the special instruction is as follows. The defendant, Chad Guy Daybell, has been charged in the amended indictment with certain counts of entering into a conspiracy with Lori Ballow Daybell and or Alex Cox. The crime of conspiracy involves an agreement by two or more persons to commit a crime. You must only consider the evidence against the defendant in this case and should not speculate as to any other case or legal proceedings involving the alleged co-conspirators. You must remember that the defendant has the presumption of innocence and you must consider his guilt or innocence based solely on the evidence provided in this case. That concludes the court's special instruction. At this time, I would also instruct the attorneys for both parties to avoid repeating any questions already asked by the court. The attorneys do, however, have the right to direct follow-up questions to a juror regarding a juror's response to the court's previous questions. The jury should be aware that during and following this court dire examination, one or more of you may be challenged. Each side has challenges, what are called for cause. That means they can ask that a juror be excused for some specific reason. Later, there will also be what are called peremptory challenges. And that means each side can challenge a juror and ask they be excused without giving any reason for the dismissal. If you are excused by either side, please do not feel offended or feel your honesty or integrity has been questioned because it is not. I'll now begin the court's portion of the board dire process, after which the attorneys for both parties will be given an opportunity to make their own board dire inquiries. Those of you who are not called should pay close attention to the questions being asked here because you may be later called upon to answer those same questions. First question I'll ask you all as a group, um, when you completed your questionnaire last week, I'm going back to that. Are the answers given by each of you in the jury information forms true and accurate still? Okay, everyone's answered affirmatively. Let's next talk about the issue of the time commitment that may be required in the trial in this case. If you are required to serve as a juror here, it will be for a period of approximately eight to 10 weeks. Would this time frame create a serious hardship upon you or your family or your business or profession or occupation so as to prevent you from rendering service as a fair and impartial juror in this case? Is there anyone that has a response for that question? Okay, uh, please raise your red card. Juror number 249, uh, express your concern, please, regarding the timing of the trial. My work only allows approximately 80 hours of any time. After that, it will be all entirely work for having the bank. Okay. And are we going to have a roving microphone perhaps for jurors? If not, we can get one set up for the next group. Juror number 249, I was able to hear your concern about 
the most time frame involving work. Have you had an opportunity to discuss if they've got any other policy if you are in a longer trial such as this case that may allow for additional uh, time off if you were required to serve? I did read the policy, um, but I feel like the time I found out about this day last week uh, that I was selected. Um, I simply went online for our, our policy or team member handbook as well and read up on it because I was concerned that this was going to be a long time. So I, I double checked the policy and that's what it stated. 80 hours. All right. Um, given the concern at this point, let me pass over first to the state and the defense. If you have an additional board dire at this time, specifically on the issue of a potential hardship for year 249. And Your Honor, the state actually did have a question regarding a potential hardship with regard to juror 249. Um, it's one that hasn't been talked about, but on the questionnaire, there was an indication that there was a May uh, camping trip plan, but we just didn't have a lot of details. So we had actually planned on inquiring further regarding that hardship. Okay. Or if the court wants to get into that, the state does not have an objection given what he's indicating his work policy is either. Okay, well, uh, I'll allow you to return to that issue then in your individual board dire. Um, juror number 249, I'll let the attorneys come back to you in their portion of board dire to further question uh, the hardship issue you've raised. Is there anyone else that uh, would also express a concern of hardship if they were required to serve for that time frame? Yeah. Okay, we've got a few more. Juror numbers uh, 67. Uh, I'm a sleep provider in my family. My wife is has an autoimmune disorder, and so sure. it would be uh, difficult for me to do this, and I'd be losing out on a lot of money. And my job also would probably lay me off because I'm an alarm operator, and they're already short staffed. That's what I was told. When you say that's what you were told, did you discuss the potential of having to serve in this case since you filled out your questionnaire? Yes. And could you be a little more specific about uh, your, you don't need to name it, but the occupation and what your employer may have related to you? Uh, the occupation is with alarm codes. I have on the central station, so I just answer a lot of alarms for places all over the country. And what I was told was is that they're extremely short staffed. If I was gone for 10 weeks, I, they would probably have to let me go because they'd have to have somebody else uh, take my place. All right, with that particular concern raised, let me, I am going to pass over for additional questioning at this time from both the state and then the defense. Does the state have any further questions for this juror number six, seven in regards to the stated hardship? We don't have any further questions, Your Honor. We would have no objection to this juror being excused based on the hardship expressed today. All right, uh, from the defense then, Mr. Pryor. Judge, there'd be no objection to having this uh, All right. Well, uh, juror six seven, if you are facing uh, loss of employment over this, the court would find that would qualify as an undue hardship that would prevent your service in this case, given the length of the trial. So the court thanks you for your service for coming in this morning. I'll allow you to be excused. Please drop off your copy of your questionnaire with the bailiff on your way. I believe juror 348 raised their card as well. Juror 348, you've heard the questioning about the trial length. What's the issue you would have in, the, in the relation to that? Let's get the mic to you. We have two family events that will transpire um, here. 
during this time or directly after, one of which is my daughter's graduation from college. I did note these on the questionnaire um, in the circumstances with her graduation. Um, that would be at the beginning of May. Uh, we did not, we were not able to have any kind of graduation uh, celebration for her from high school as that was 2020. Um, so we were all looking forward to that as something we would um, all participate in as well. Um, my mother passed away in February and I am responsible as executor for her estate um, to prepare documents. I'm working with lawyers on the East Coast, which makes it um, a challenge as far as the time difference is concerned, as well as um, planning for her service, which will take place in June. Again, that is taking place on the East Coast. Um, and I am responsible for planning that event as well. So those are the two circumstances as I noted on the questionnaire. And could you um, specify again, is it the first weekend of May that the graduation would take place? Is that um, on weekdays or is that gonna be on the weekend? The graduation takes place on a Friday. We would that would also involve transportation down on either Wednesday or Thursday as it's out of state. All right, um, Council, I'm going to again inquire of you. I know we're skipping ahead. You'll get your own individual board dire, but on the narrow issue of a hardship express with jury three four eight, does the state have any additional inquiry? No, Your Honor, we would have no objection to this juror being excused. I do know on the questionnaire she had indicated the graduation would be the first weekend of May, um, including Thursday to Sunday. All right, any more direct from the defense on the issue? No, Judge, I was also aware that she had the obligations that required to drive by town. Okay, well, between the combination of that planned graduation and your uh, services as executor of an estate and uh, that wealth being expressed in your sworn questionnaire, the court does find there's a rationale here for a dismissal based on a hardship given the length of the trial and the timing. So juror 348, you can be excused with the thanks of the court. Thank you for providing your service here up to this point and please drop your questionnaire off on the way out with the bailiff. Were there any other jurors that had an expressed concern over a hardship at this point? Okay, juror number 321. I have not looked into any policy as far as the amount of time, but it just it would be a financial hardship if that length amount of time went without me working. All right, I'm going to note juror 321 that you've expressed a concern over hardship. Uh, I'll pass on that at this time and allow for the attorneys to conduct some individual board dire further on the topic if they so wish. Uh, so we'll come back to that. Anyone else have a concern? Juror number 296. Good morning, Your Honor. Um, I am currently in school on Mondays and Wednesdays and um, CWI. It would conflict for the next five weeks. I put on my um, questionnaire that it's possible that I could take online courses or switch to an online course, but I'm not entirely sure of that policy. Okay, I will note your concern as well. I'm going to allow for some additional board dire from the parties uh, before we make a determination on that. Anyone else have a stated concern for the hardship? Okay, thank you. Let me next discuss any previous knowledge you may have of this case. As I mentioned before, if you do know something specific you've heard in the media or otherwise, please refrain from stating specific facts about that, but we do want to go into that issue. 
So first, let me see, I guess, by raising your cards, other than what you were told when you came in to fill out that questionnaire and further advice today, do you know anything about this case, either through your own personal knowledge or by discussions with anyone else or from uh, media information you've received? Uh, is there anyone that knows about the case? Okay, if you'll hold those up for a moment, we'll know. So we've got <laughs> juror three, two, one. Uh, the question generally is just, do you know something about this case other than what you've learned by coming in for uh, the questionnaire last week or today? All right, so on the back row, 321, 296, 219, 249, 146, 121. On the front row, we've got jurors 56, 48, 41, 31 and 27. So the majority of the group here, which is why I give that instruction, what we don't wanna do is uh, start seeing what everyone knows about the case. We'll talk to you individually about that. Um, let me ask some specific questions for you then without getting into those details, but then is there anyone here that believes they already have a state of mind with regard to the charges or some knowledge you already have about the case that would prevent you from being impartial in this case? In other words, has anyone you think already drawn some opinion that maybe the defendant is guilty just based on what you know or what the charges are? All right, we've got a juror number 121 who brought that concern up. Uh, in order to further get into that discussion, we'll talk to you individually so we can delve into that. Anyone else that thinks they've already perhaps made their mind up in some way about guilt or innocence in this case? All right, we've also got juror number 4-8. We will discuss that with you individually as well. For those of you that do know something about the case, um, the next question is, do you feel you could eliminate or disregard what you've heard or read pertaining to the case and render an impartial verdict based solely on the evidence you hear in court today? All right, the remaining jurors then indicate they would be able to do that. And I'll allow the attorneys to follow up with Fort Dyer on that subject. Judge, could you approach for all of those? Sure. I see Detective uh, Kia Kamani right there on the prosecution side. Looks like Whitney, and I think that's Ron Ball at the very back. I, I think they're just local people behind Chad. You know, well, I mean, I'm I'm looking. <laughs> uh, there's Nate Eaton to the left of Kia Kamanu. Um. Oh, hello. I wish they'd do that to the rest of the courtroom. <laughs> I love the white noise machine, y'all. <laughs> Am I in here? Okay, I'm just making sure I'm in here. <laughs> I know huh, language they shouldn't be uh, allowed to see members of the public, in my opinion. <laughs> oh, dang, you brutal girl. <laughs> right? I agree, though. It sucks. I know it seems like they have so many more rights than for sure the victims because they're not even here. Um, it was about a week long, Ravina. Uh, jury selection in Lori's case. Uh, it was Monday through Friday, I believe, and then Friday. Uh, Judge, I think that's how it went. Yeah, and then Judge Boyce was like, "All right, well, let's just show up on Monday." I think that's what Nate said. I, uh, on the latest thing I watched last night, uh, I thought we would see Lauren from Hidden True Crime there. Yeah, um, she may be in there. I'm, I'm looking. <laughs> I haven't been looking. I've been typing and 
conversing with you guys and I don't too much, you know, I don't know. I, I go, I, I listen more than anything. You know, I like to do other things and that's where I multitask. <laughs> I just can't do it when I'm online or I'm live uh, with with you guys. Like, <laughs> I don't know what it is. But if I'm behind the thing, I'm fine. You know, it's just when I'm on camera, I freak out <laughs> automatically. So what are y'all's first initial um, thoughts besides the one you've been sharing here with me? She said she was going to be there. Yeah, she's she's supposed to be there. I don't either, Ravina. I don't hardly know anything about the Idaho 4. I know I watched the entire trial for Myrtle. I mean, that for, that was a very interesting trial, in my opinion. When he got on the stand, when Alex Myrtle got on the stand, I was like, oh, my God. You know, I mean, I, kind, I he kind of got me. And then I was like, oh, damn. <laughs> you know, I mean, what a tangled web we weave, huh? Interesting. Is Lori allowed to see this trial? I don't know what kind of... Um, amenities they have over there in her little where she at Esalen Esalen I think is the name of the jail where she's at I don't know what kind of uh privileges they have and you know I don't know if they have YouTube <laughs> so uh, I don't know how that works it would be it would be so interesting to find out exactly you know like what they get to do and no one, I could just see her like kind of pulling a Susan Smith, you know. <laughs> Ugh. These uh, KJ says these potential jurors have lives, and to think how, oh, and to think that uh, they have to give up their wages, family events, what sacrifice? My heart goes out to them. All right. Right. All right. We're back on the record now, continuing on for this group. Next issue the court's going to talk about with. The prospective jurors is the subject matter of this case. Court has read to you a summary of the charges. Those include charges involving uh, murder, conspiracy, and insurance fraud. Is there anything in particular about those charges for any one of you that would make it impossible or difficult for you to fairly and objectively evaluate the evidence in this case and to render a fair and impartial verdict? Um, so the question is, would that make it impossible or difficult? If that is the way you feel, please raise your red card. Okay, none of the jurors responded affirmatively to that. I next have some questions that may seem obvious, but they're required by our statutes for me to go through as well. Let's talk about relation or acquaintance to the defendant. Are any of you related by blood or marriage to the defendant, Mr. Daybell, if you know him or her from any business or social relationship? If you do, please raise your red card. All right, no one answered affirmatively to that. Let's talk about the relationships you may have with any alleged victim, defendant, or attorneys here. Does the relationship of guardian and ward, master and servant, employer and employee, creditor and debtor, landlord and tenant, boarder or lodger exist between any of you or any of the attorneys involved in this case? So raise your red card if one of these lawyers is your landlord, for example. All right, no one has responded affirmatively to that. Are any of you involved in any kind of a legal proceeding, including a civil action against the defendant? No affirmative response. Have any of you ever bought, uh, brought any kind of a criminal complaint against the defendant or been accused of a crime by any of these prosecutors present today? There's no affirmative response to that. Do any of you have any kind of an attorney client relationship with any of the attorneys here or with Mr. Pryor or his law firm? Okay, no one responded to that. Do any of you have any kind of a relationship by blood or marriage to any of the lawyers in this case, or do you know the lawyers from any other professional business or social relationship? 
All right, no one indicated they know the attorneys are having any kind of relationship that would be prohibited. Uh, this next question is a general question, but let me ask, have any of you ever formed or expressed an unqualified opinion that the defendant is guilty or not guilty of the offense charged? Okay, no one indicated they've got an opinion. Do any of you have any bias or prejudice either for or against the defendant in this case, Mr. Daybell? No one responded to that. Are there any of you who would be unwilling to follow the court's instructions to you, the jury, as to the law that you must apply in determining this case? No one responded to that. Now, in this case, we will be asking you further questions individually about the section of the questionnaire you filled out relating to the death penalty. So I understand that may come up here. We will talk about that individually, but uh, notwithstanding, I'll ask the group here, do any of you have a religious or moral position that would make it impossible for you to sit in judgment of another or to render a fair and impartial verdict in this case? Okay, no one responded affirmatively to that. Are there any of you that have selected as a juror in this case would be unwilling or unable to render a fair and impartial verdict based upon the evidence presented in this courtroom and the law as instructed by the court? All right, no one indicates they would be unwilling or unable to render a fair and impartial verdict. Uh, kind of a catch-all question here. Do any of you have any other reason why you cannot give this case your Full undivided attention and render a fair and impartial verdict. Very well, no one responded to that. That concludes the court section of group for Dyer for this group. At this time, then, I'll permit the state to conduct its for Dyer of the group. After that, the defense. Uh, will that be you, Ms. Holt? Your Honor, Mr. Wood will be starting the for Dyer process. All right, Mr. Wood, if you'd like to commence with the state's board diary, you may do that at this time. Thank you. And is it all right if I do so from the podium? It is. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, again, my name is Rob Wood. I represent the people of Madison County, Idaho. And just as a reminder, if I ask you anything today uh, that makes you uncomfortable and you would rather answer it privately, just let us know. We, we want you to be comfortable. And we need you to give full answers and fully truthful answers. Uh, the defendant is entitled to a fair trial, and we only get there. And the, the state's entitled to a fair trial. We only get there if you're being really honest with us. And so I'm going to start by asking juror number 321. What do you think of when I say the phrase brutal honesty? I believe that just means not mincing the words no matter what, just telling the 100 percent truth, no matter how we're honest. All right. Does anyone else have a different definition of brutal honesty? But not mincing your words. Can everybody agree that uh, telling the full truth, not mincing your words? Is a, is a good definition. Okay, and, and we need you today to be brutally honest. Um, there's just a, a quick analogy I like to use. Who, by raise my hand, who here has flown on an airplane? Everybody's flown on an airplane, right? And you get on the airplane and that pilot, you, you know, you get strapped in, they give you the safety warning and the pilot tells you when he's going to land that plane approximately and where he's going to do it. How many of you would feel comfortable if the pilot said, uh, I might be able to land this plane? You're all smiling. Would anybody feel comfortable with that pilot? Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, today we need you to land the plane. And what we mean by that is, is not a specific destination, but that you're completely, again, completely honest. It's that important. The, the court asked you about following the law. 
Is anybody here like and enjoy every rule, law, and regulation you live under? Nobody does, right? Can does anybody just by a raise of hand? Can you not that you need to tell us what it is, but think of a law or a rule that you think is unfair. Everybody, you can think of a law or rule that's unfair, great. Right? Multiple people feel that way. Um in this courtroom, the court will give you the law that applies in this case. And you may like that, you may not like that law. Um, but for fairness to this defendant and for fairness to the people of Idaho, we all have to agree to follow that law. So even, even considering that, that maybe you won't like the law that you get, maybe it doesn't go with your gut. Can this defendant and can the state all rely on you to follow the law as it's given by this court? Can, if you agree, yes, can you hold up your red card? This is important. 121, I saw a little bit of hesitation. Was, was that accurate or was that just me? There is some hesitation. Tell us about your hesitation. And that's, and thank you for your honesty. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you were going to get into this later, but my hesitation is with the death penalty issue. That's where I hesitate. Okay. So, and we will talk about that. But, but thank you for bringing that up and thank you for being honest. I'm gonna just shift gears really quickly. Does, does anybody here believe everything they hear on the internet or see on the internet? I'm the only one. <laughs> so does anybody here believe everything they hear on the news? We under everybody understand that the news is not always accurate. I'm, I'm not saying that to offend any reporters who might be here. But we all understand that facts change sometimes, right? And you might hear a story one day, and some of those facts are different the next day. Um, this, this case has had a massive amount of media attention. And the judge asked you this, but we just want to check again. Can, is there anyone here who has any concerns of what they've heard before? And we don't want to go into a lot of detail now. We'll get into it later. But, but what they've heard before is going to cause them to not be able to give this defendant a fair trial. Okay. Some of you talked about hardship, and we're just going to go over that really quick. Juror 249. If I recall, and if, I'm, if I say it incorrectly, just feel free to correct me. Uh, you, you get about two weeks of paid juror time. Is that accurate? Okay. Are you, are you if, it, if it's all right, if I ask you the sole provider in your home? Yes. Okay. And is it fair to say that you and your family rely on your income? Yes. Okay. Um, and have you, I, I forgot, did you speak with your employer about this specific issue? I have. I just let the supervisor go with that. This oh. could potentially be a long, a long term commitment. And then when I was thinking about it a little further, I thought I'd better, you know, look into what the current policy says. They, that's what I was talking about. That and they, only, they only account for 80 hours for it. So, okay. And after that, you're basically on your own. Either you have to use your vacation, which nobody has 10 weeks of vacation, right? or unpaid, unpaid, uh, I don't know. Would, would you see that as an undue hardship for you uh, that would create difficulty for your family? Yes. Um, Your Honor, the state would move to excuse juror 249 for hardship. I'd like to hear a response from the defense. And if you have any additional board diagrams prior, you can do that as well. Nothing additional to mention. Stipulate. All right. Based on the comments made by juror 249, as it relates to an employment hardship and financial with the length of this trial, the court will uh, agree that the juror will be stricken for cause based on a hardship 
concludes his service. So thank you for appearing today and for performing your service as a jury. You can be excused and please drop your questionnaire with the bailiff. Juror 296, you had spoken about uh, potential hardship, and I noted in your questionnaire, you said you had school Mondays and Wednesdays, but could do online classes. And you, you mentioned that, but I, I guess I'm not quite sure where it stands. Are, are you able to do online classes to finish that? Um, I'm not oh, I'm not entirely sure, but um, I I know they offer online classes for the, class, the classes that I'm currently in. So I'm I'm assuming they could probably move me to the online class. And the only issue that I have is there that I would have is the testing that I have to take either after hours or via online. Okay. So um, you're part of the class. Like I can do that. There's a lecture you might can do online. All right. And it's it's not school five days a week, just the two days a week. Just two. Do you mind if I ask how many classes? Um two. Two. Okay. I'll do class. All right. Uh, and so if with the court's schedule of getting out at 3 30, uh, do you think that would be something you could make work? Yes. Okay. And so would it do, would it be an undue hardship to be on this jury with your school? Not that I'm aware. Okay, thank you. Juror three, two, one. Uh, you had mentioned a hardship. Could you? I apologize. I kind of can't remember what, exactly what you said a few minutes ago. Can you tell us what that was? Yeah, I'm just unsure as far as because I've not spoken with the employer about the length of this trial I may, may go. Um, I just know that it would be on the time off. Okay. Um, are you a sole provider in your home? Yes. And but so you haven't spoken with them yet. Uh, so are you sure that it would be unpaid time off, or do they have some type of juror policy where they pay you on the on jury? Honestly, I'm I'm not aware. They might possibly have a policy. I just don't know about that. Do you, do you think that's information you could find out in the next couple of days and notify the court if there was a change? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I also did note in your. Um, I believe it was in your questionnaire that you wanted to see some college games of one of your children. Is that you? Oh, my goodness. Okay. Um, and where are those games? They're in Oregon City, Oregon. Okay. Um, and is uh, baseball? Yes. Okay. Uh, what year is your son, your son? He's a sophomore. Okay. And and I'm not I'm not trying to be insensitive. Juror, being a juror is hard for everyone and inconvenient, but if you weren't able to see some of those games, would you be able to see them next year? Yes. And so would would it be an undue hardship to miss some of those games? No. Thank you. The, the court spoke with you briefly about the nature of this case. This is a case about murder and conspiracy to commit murder and insurance fraud. Uh, two of the victims in this case, two of the alleged victims in this case are underage children, a seven-year-old and a 16-year-old, and the other alleged victim is a mother. Um, there will be some autopsy photographs in this uh, in this case, and they they are hard to look at. There's no way around that. Uh, but does anybody here think that seeing those would automatically sway them one way or the other, or that they'd be able to objectively weigh those, uh, still weigh that evidence against all the other evidence? Did you, I'm sorry. Did you raise your hand? No. Oh, okay. So did, by this is important. If you guys can raise your cards, if your answer is yes, would you be able to still weigh all the evidence properly, even if it's difficult to look at those pictures? So, juror 48. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
Or do, do you, what do you, what do you think? Do you think well, you'll be able to do that? I just want to make sure I understand the question. If I could uh, see the photos and, and not be swayed one way or another, continue to weigh the totality of the evidence. That yes. Yeah. And then I just have a couple more questions, Your Honor. Uh, I know Ms. Blake has a couple of questions. Uh, juror 294, in your questionnaire, uh, you said that you you marked a box saying that you think a person, excuse me, who doesn't testify is probably guilty. Yes. So do you, do you understand that the state has the burden of proof? I do. I was just being honest, you know, like just for my gut. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And we, we want you to be honest. Yeah. Um, and I, we appreciate that. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, so you will get an instruction and, and you'll be told by this court that the defendant doesn't have to say anything. The defendant doesn't have to prove anything. It's 100% on the state. And so is that feeling you have, is that something you could follow the rule and the law the court gives you and set that feeling aside and not hold it against the defendant if he doesn't? Yes. Bye. I'll just correct the record there for a moment to that, sir, 394. Oh, I said 294. Yes. I apologize. That's 394, right. thank you. Can I take this moment to mention hardship? Please do. Okay. Yeah. It's not just like hardship. Um, there's a family vacation, family reunion uh, scheduled for week 10. Um, June 6 through 10, but travel would be needed on either side to Arkansas. It's not a hardship, but I thought I'd just mention that um, I'm not losing work. I didn't anticipate um, checking on my jury duty leave for work, so that's an open question in my mind as to if I can take the whole time, if that's acceptable, or if it actually is a restricted amount of time on other people who's refreshing it by today. Okay, and if, if that does create a hardship, will you let the court know? Yes. And juror 41, you had marked something similar on your uh, your questionnaire that you, you want the defendant to testify. And I'm just going to ask the same thing. Do you understand that only the state has the burden of proof in this case? And that it's the state's job uh, to prove something. The defendant doesn't have to prove anything. Okay. And so even though you you have that feeling, is that something you can set aside and follow the law and the rules that the court gives you and not hold that against the defendant? Okay. Your Honor, at this time, I know Ms. Blake has a few questions, so I can turn the over back. Very well. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thanks for being back with us today. I know you were all here last week, and this is a bit of a process, so we appreciate you hanging in there with us. And I will try to be fairly brief because I know you've already had a lot of questions today. Um, so the judge has already started to give you some instructions, and as you go through this process, he will give you more instructions. So I'd like to um, talk to you a little bit about, I have a son, and Usually in the mornings, if I ask him what he wants to eat, he tells me cheesy eggs. And there's a very specific recipe that I have to use. So it's the eggs and the milk, and he likes quite a bit of cheese, and then some salt and pepper. But if I try to modify that recipe, he doesn't always like it. So I don't know, have any of you had that experience where whether you're cooking or doing something else for a kid or a family member, they like things just done a certain way. Would all of you agree? And um, turning to juror 27, can you give me an example of something like that? Um, yes, I have four kids and they are very opinionated of how I cook and prepare their toast and their sandwiches and how I cut it in, so yes. You can relate. Really, yeah. And so um, even if you think there's a better way to do it, do you sometimes just follow what, what your kids are asking for? Well, in a relationship food, yes. <laughs> if it's something that's going to injure them, no. Yes, I'll keep it with the food example. So yes. if it's food, they want the crust cut off, something like that, you'll you'll do it because that's what they're asking you to do. 
Yes, I mean, unless there's a nutritional opinion I have, but thanks, Nicole. Sure. And uh, in the back there, juror 186. I think I also saw you nod. Can you give us an example of something like that? Same thing as you guys. I have four kids as well. And they like their food a certain way, especially when they're little. Anything to get them to eat. And if you know a better way to do it, or maybe you would add something because it gives it better flavor, do you sometimes follow what your kids want? I try to give them, you know, sneak something in there that maybe I think will taste better. Try to change their mind. Just food. Under a little. And um, so with this court, because I'm like a kid, we're going to get instructions from the judge. And if the judge gives you instructions, they may say these are the specific elements of a crime. And sometimes it's easy to look at that and say, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Or if you added this, it would make it a little bit better. Would everyone here agree that regardless of what you may think with the rule and instruction given by the judge, that you could absolutely follow what he outlines? Would everyone agree that you would hold the state to the burden of the specific elements outlined by the judge? So even if you might say, this would make it a little more nutritional this time, or hey, I might sneak a new flavor in, everyone could refrain from doing that if it was an instruction from the court. Does anyone have concerns with doing that? Thank you. And as I talk about, the judge is going to give you instructions. And some of those instructions are going to be regarding the burden of proof being on the state. And then they will also be the elements. With regard to charges of conspiracy and first degree murder and conspiracy to commit first degree murder, one of the elements is not going to be that the state has to prove the cause of death meaning the state is not going to be required to prove exactly what caused the death uh, of a person. Our element would be to prove that it was a uh, homicide. Does anyone have concerns if you were to be presented evidence that someone was killed, but the state did not provide a specific cause? No concerns. So if the state put on evidence that it was a homicide, but not the exact cause of that homicide, that wouldn't cause anyone concern. Because again, you'll have instructions from the judge. 394, I see your mark. Sorry. Sorry. If you're given an instruction, though, that says that that's not a requirement, would you be able to follow that instruction or would would it be difficult for you? I think it would be difficult just based on the question. So in this case, you are going to hear from quite a few witnesses, and some of the witnesses may have different religious views than you have. Does anyone have concerns that it would be difficult for you to listen to or give proper weight to someone's testimony based on them holding different religious views? Would anyone have problems if someone held different views in general, again, just with being able to weigh their testimony? And you're also going to be given some instructions. Um, actually, back that up. So if you were sitting in here today and the window wasn't there or they put the blinds down and you couldn't see outside, but you, when you came inside, everything was dry, everything was clear. And then 
as you enter the building, you see the sky starting to get a little bit dark. It's starting to turn gray. You come in here, they, they close the blinds, you can't see outside, and you go outside and there's water on your car and there's water on the pavement, water on the grass, everything's wet. What would you, would you be able to determine what had happened? I see some nods. Juror 296, what would you determine had happened? And would you determine that even if it had quit raining by the time you got outside? So there would be enough there without you actually personally, physically observing the rain. And 321, I saw you nodding as well. Similar. And so would everyone agree, you may hear the term circumstantial evidence. Um, even if you don't see something happen, there could still be other evidence to support that. And would everyone be willing to weigh that evidence? Because again, as jurors, part of your job is going to be to weigh all the evidence and give it the weight you feel that it's due as you're listening to all the testimony and the evidence come in. Anyone have concerns about their ability to do that? I can have just a moment. The state has no additional questions, Your Honor. All right, that will conclude the state's portion of Board Dyer of the group. Mr. Pryor, you may do so on behalf of your client now. Good morning. My name is John Pryor, and I represent Mr. Before we start, I really want to talk to you about. Fact that there's no wrong answer. What's more important than anything else is that you tell the truth. Mr. Pryor, apologies. Could you into the microphone a little more and fairly get your signal? Thank and you. I'll turn it on. Does that help you? That helps a lot. At my age, Judge, technology is a challenging uh, job, and uh, I apologize. Can all of you folks hear me now? So I'll reiterate the fact is that as jurors, your your job is to uh, judge the evidence. Your job is to uh, make a determination, apply the facts to what the judge gives you as the law. But before we get there, what we have to do is go through this painstaking process of talking to you folks about some personal things and some private things, some of your thoughts and processes. And part of that is to, uh, before we get there, is we really want to talk about uh, um, just being honest and truthful about your position. There is no wrong position. If there are some people here who say Mr. Daybell is absolutely uh, innocent, that's your position. If people feel that Mr. Daybell is absolutely guilty, that's your position. If you really haven't made up your mind, that's your position. But it's your position and it's your own individual position. And what's important is that you, you, you apply the facts, not as you see the group and go along with the group, but that you basically tell the truth and you uh, speak your mind. This is your opportunity to say how you feel and to be honest about how you feel. Is there anybody who really doesn't understand that? Perfect, that must have been pretty clear and you can hear me now, that's wonderful. Uh, before we get started, this is uh, an unusual question I ask. And I ask this because um, I've had the opportunity to sit in that box uh, a handful of times in, uh, in over the number of years that I've uh, been an adult. And this happened to me many, many years ago. I was 21 years old and in college, and um, the lawyer was uh, involved in a criminal case. And uh, he asked an unusual question. As soon as he got up there, he asked an unusual question. He said, is there anybody who just doesn't want to be here today? And uh, a number of us uh, were hedging and moving and everything else. And I thought, yeah. I don't want to be here. I, I don't really want to. Well, why don't you want to be here? Because I just don't want to be here. I, I just have so many other things in my life, and I have so many other distractions, and I have so many other processes. 
and, and I, you know, I was a college student, naive and wide-eyed, and I said, I understand the obligation to be a juror. I understand that it's a, something that we have to do as our civic duty, but I just don't feel like I can give the attention to this thing that I really think it deserves. And surprisingly enough, uh, uh, the lawyer said, well, thank you for being so brutally honest, and the judge let me go on my way. Now, I don't want to give all of you an opportunity to raise your hand when I ask this question, and please don't, if, if you really think you can give the attention. But is there any of you folks who, quite honestly, you just don't want to be here today? And please be truthful with that question. You're all very excited to be here. And you're all very anxious to, to, to get involved in this. Okay, number 394, go ahead, sir. Yeah, um, I, I definitely want to do my civic duty. I feel like that's the, the proper thing to do and thank you for everything that you guys do. Um, I'm fair to a year and a half, about a year and a half into the new job building a team. Um, we have one person, I'm a team lead, I've got one person under me. We're trying to hire another person. So I question whether my success in my job will be um, as good as it could be if I was there versus being out for potentially the next um, and of course, I don't want to think deeply about a murder case. It's mm -hmm. just a comment. Um, but again, I want to do my civic duty. So that's kind of where I'm at. And I, and I appreciate that. Your, your job's important. You're a data engineer, if I remember right. I'm going off of memory. Yes. My memory serves me. Yeah. That's what you do as a data engineer. Is that right? I am a data, data engineer. I said data. It's data. Yeah. It's data. It's back and forth. Um, um, yeah. Um, my wife's a part time boy about 10, 10 hours a week. So I'm the primary. Do you have children? Yes, we have three. I remember that as well. I just wanted you to tell me that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And do you really think this could potentially affect your uh, your occupation? I, I don't know. I need to talk to, to my manager today and see realistically how this would impact either my future growth or the time off policy for a jury duty. Well, the one thing that, that caught my attention was that as a data engineer and having been married and she's going to kill me for announcing this to the world, I guess, my ex-wife was an engineer and it was uh, everybody smiling about that. Um, I, I understand that when you're working on projects, that a lot of time those projects are, are particular to the individual engineer. Is that your position as well? Yeah, we basically serve all areas of the business, whether it's product or finance or Customer success. Um, so they're long. They could be very short requests, but usually they're long, multiple weeks. Okay. Okay. Is there anybody else who would like to, you know, provide me information about whether um, they just don't want to be here? And frankly, folks, there is no wrong answer. I can assure you that the story I told you about speaking up and saying I didn't want to be there, absolutely true. And then it was just one of these situations where I just felt like I, I couldn't provide the necessary attention. And that was going to be a, a two or three day trial. What we're dealing with in this case, folks, is a 10 week trial. And it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of effort. And I, I want to make sure that all of you are, are going to be able to do that. That's, that's, a, that's a significant request from all of you. And, and all of us, the four prosecuting attorneys, the judge and myself, Mr. Gabel, we're asking you to put that kind of a commitment into this. If it's 10 weeks, it's, it's two and a half months of your life that we're going to be asking you to, to put forth. Um, juror number 27, you're shaking your head. Do you have any concerns or questions about that? Or thoughts, please? No. Um, I'm shaking my head in agreement that it is a big commitment, but um, you know, if this is what you feel I should do, then that's just my thinking to it. And, and I guess I'd be clear on that. I, I, I welcome everybody's thoughts on that. And I don't want anyone to think that, well, you're doing this because it's what you feel I want you to do. In your own mind, and I can't evaluate for what each of your life situations are. I, I'm given a very small description of facts in the questionnaire that you just filled out. And the difficult situations that I have to determine. And so did the four prosecuting attorneys who are working on this case. We have to determine with that small window of information 
what kind of impact this is going to have on you. That, that's very important. I do spend time on this. I spend a lot of things. And I do that because the consequences are significant here. You've all read the or heard the, the allegations against Mr. Tabell. And I just want to make sure that all of you are going to be able to put that time commitment in and spend the time to, to, to work on this, this, this significant project. Much like our friend 394, it's a significant project. So again, uh, is there anybody who's having any hesitation? Please speak up. Please speak up now because the time to change your mind and believe me become difficult. So I, I ask again, is there anyone who's having any concerns or hesitation? 121, please tell me what your thoughts are. I mean, I feel kind of similar to what he said, where like I do recognize it's you know my duty and um yeah. but I just think like I've just been thinking a lot about just how a lot of the troubling aspects of it, and that's the reason why honestly I was I like, didn't want to be here today. Um would be the troubling aspects. And is it your position you would just rather not be part of this? And, and please be honest about that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Do you think that your views and your thoughts on that uh, would create some sort of uh, concern in how you look at the evidence? No. Would you be more inclined to rush through this because you want to get this done? Yeah. No. Would you be able to take the time to look at the facts and look at them, you know, in an impartial manner? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I appreciate your honesty. I really do. Please. Um, and I'm going to forget your number uh, one. 21, I think. No, 146. I'm sorry. Would you, officer, would you please give a I have a loud voice, but not everybody's uh, gifted with such an objective voice as I am. Um, I hate my voice on the microphone. I think every one of us probably would be lying if we said we were like so excited to be here and wanted to, but I feel like it's just jumping out of my chest. Like if any of us are supposed to be here, we will be here. Okay. I'm not particularly excited to be here. I have five little kids, but it is what it is. And if we're supposed to be here, we'll get picked and chosen. And well, I don't know why I'm talking about but that's just how I feel about it. And that's one of the things that I looked at when I saw your Pokemon. Um, you have five children. Yeah, five kids, and I run a daycare. Run a daycare. So. Yeah. And then I'm going to use my cheat sheet a little bit. But uh, um, in addition to that, I guess I didn't have to just pop. Your husband is involved in landscaping. Yep, we have a landscaping business too. So, do you help in that landscaping business? No. no. I, mean, <laughs> I mean, like, you know, making invoices and things like that, I do, but oh. not. So, you do paperwork in your free time. In the free time. When, you're, when, you, uh, when you raise the pen, I'll get to you in a bit. I just saw the reaction. I'm wondering. Um, um, you're a number of, uh, 186. I just saw the reaction. I'll get to you. In your free time, when you're not dealing with your five kids and gathering them up and taking those family responsibilities, you're then taking on the obligation of running a daycare. How many kids do you have in that daycare? Uh, three to four. Okay. And then, like you said, in your free time, when you're done taking care of the kids and taking care of the daycare, you then do the um, the uh, paperwork. Yeah, when it's needed. Yeah. It almost sounds like this would be a vacation. Um, if I'm being totally honest, when the judge said at the beginning you could be sequestered, I was like, oh, it's going to be a spa for me. <laughs> I think it would be. Well, I think it was your questionnaire. I read that you made some comment in the questionnaire saying, you know, uh, LOL or something like that. That was your probably being a smart ass, but a sequestered would not be like the worst thing for me. <laughs> okay, and thank you for your honesty. And then juror number 186, you had you smile and you had some thoughts. Please talk. Oh, I was just smiling at her comment of being free secretary. Okay, and tell me about that, how that applies to you. I just thought it was funny that the way she worded it. Oh, had right. nothing to do with me. Okay. okay, okay. Is there anybody else? And, and I know I've spent a lot of time on this. It is important, and then the idea is to get you folks to be. I understand at least the camera's on me right now, from what I understand, um, and it's not on you. So you have this wonderful opportunity to speak your mind and uh, tell me what your thoughts are on this, whether or not any of you, for the last time, do you really have any reservations or anything you would like to comment about, about participating in this process? Anyone? No one? 
Okay, thank you. I'm going to move on to a little bit of um, a different subject. And then one of the things I, I, I need to talk to you folks about is that um, Mr. Daybell's here today because he's pled not guilty to the charges. And I'm going to ask to ask you, ask you questions that may um, uh, concern whether he's guilty or not. And I don't want you to read from my questions that I believe Mr. Daybell is guilty or anybody else believe Mr. Daybell is guilty. The fact is we still have to delve into these questions and talk about these things because it's important that we try to get in this very little time that we're going to spend together, get an idea of what your thoughts are. What do you folks are thinking? What, how do you feel about a variety of things? So please don't read into my questions or assume I'm, I'm asking you something because I believe one way or the other. Once again, all I'm trying to do is to just get an idea of the person you are. Right now, there's I'm not speaking, and it's being broadcast everywhere, and people are getting an impression. I don't know if I want to read some of the impressions they're going to talk about me or say about me, but they're getting an impression. And, and by the same token, I'm going to ask you questions to also get an impression, get an idea of what's, what you think about. And that's what's important. It's important that I uh, do that because uh, it's the way we are able to determine uh, whether we think you're a good fit, whether the prosecutor thinks you're a good fit, and, and that's that's part of the overall process of doing this jury wide year. Um, jury number 56, you were raising, you were nodding your head. Is there something you would like to offer in regards to that? No, just agree. You're agreeing. With the process. With, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to go into a couple of different areas, and please don't, um, again, don't read into this uh, one way or the other. But just, again, I think what we're trying to do is be able to build a relationship between myself and all of you folks so we can be open and honest and free about what our thoughts are without worrying about what people might think. Because quite frankly, um, I don't care what any of these people think. I could care less, and they're going to, and it, it, that may hurt some of their feelings. Um, and I, but I do want to know what you folks think. It's important. And the state wants to know what you folks think. And it's important because all of us agree that, that in the end, the state's entitled to a fair and unbiased uh, jury. Would everybody agree with that? You could raise your, your things, your, no, not your hands, just your numbers. I'm sorry, folks. I, I just want to thank you. Thank you. And, you, and would all of you agree that Mr. Daybell is entitled to a fair, unbiased jury? Okay, thank you. And on that note, um, I'd like to start out by asking you folks, is there anybody right now who thinks that Mr. Daybell is guilty or is probably guilty? Okay. And that's juror number 48, was it not? Now, juror number 48, uh, is that going to impact your ability to um, make a determination as to, um, in the end, whether or not Mr. Daybell is guilty going into this process with the idea that you believe or possibly believe that Mr. Daybell is guilty? No. Okay. You're going to be able to be unbiased. Yes. Okay. And let's talk about that because that leads into the next area uh, that I'd like to talk to you folks a little bit about, about bias. Um, is there anybody who doesn't understand what the word bias means? No hands. Okay. What about the words impartial? Does everybody know what the words impartial means? Yes? No? Kind of. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, juror number 41, when you say kind of, what is your 30? I'm sorry, you're right. 11, 21, 31, 41's next. <laughs> no, I'm not sure what impartial is. The first one you said was um, bias. Bias. Okay. Uh, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to think in my mind the difference between the two. Okay. So bias. What, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? What do you think? Um, depending on what I see, 
if I uh, trust in that okay. or I don't trust in what I see. Okay. Is that kind of what okay. I'm looking for? All right. Juror number 219. Thank you. What are your thoughts on when you hear the words impartial? That I would be neutral until basically there's sufficient information to make up my mind one way or the other. Okay. Okay. Is there anybody who disagrees with that? That was you must be a teacher or something. That's a great explanation. No, sir. Okay. Is there anybody who disagrees with that? That you must remain neutral. Does everybody agree with that? You must remain neutral. Okay, thank you. So we're going to go back to this issue of bias in people's, and you're going to hear from a lot of witnesses. Does everybody agree that there are witnesses that can be influenced? And, and sort of coerced into saying things that are not necessarily true or false. Everybody, would you raise your hands to see if that's something everybody agrees with or if you don't agree with it? Or your cards, either way. I didn't see at the very back there. Now, um, looks like 296. Okay, oh, I'm sorry, I missed it. I'm sorry. Um, just being influenced or coerced. Do you think that just applies to citizens? Anybody think that it just applies to citizens? Raise your hand if you think it just applies to citizens. Okay. What about law enforcement? Anybody agrees that law enforcement could be swayed? Maybe they could be influenced to go and testify a certain way to, uh, uh, to support one side or the other? Anyone? No one thinks that's possible? Can you just law enforcement. Do you think the issue of being biased or being influenced, do you think that just applies to ordinary citizens? Does anybody believe that it can also could also apply to people who are in law enforcement? Now, I don't want to pick you out, and I, I and please forgive me, number 27, but my recollection when I read the profiles of this was last week is that your father's a police officer. Retired. Retired police officer. That's right. Um, okay. Is that concept something that just the fact that I bring it up is that somehow offending you or, or causing you concerns that I'm going to see stuff like that? No, I absolutely believe there are good cops and bad cops. Okay. And in that instance, when we're talking about officers, that uh, police officers are no different than um, um, every ordinary citizens, right? Correct. And they're susceptible to the same influences, the same manipulations that other people are susceptible to, right? Yes, correct. And when you're talking about a criminal case, and you're talking about a law enforcement officer, what do you see as the role in that case? The same as all of us, um, seeking the truth and believing the truth without a bias. Okay. What if they have an agenda in advance of, of the... Uh, the investigation of cases. Does that cause you concern? If the police officer has an agenda, yes, that would, that would have a bias. Then. Okay. And as far as a role in a case, would you agree with me that a police officer's role in a case is to investigate the facts and report the facts? Absolutely. Is there anybody who disagrees with that? Nobody disagrees with that? What about a police officer or an agency that um, decides to um, aid in supporting one side or the other and pushing their own agenda? Is that problematic for anybody? Raise your hand if you think that's problematic. Or raise your cards. I, I'm sorry, Judge, I guess brought cards. So nobody disagrees with that. So when you hear evidence of that, is there anybody who, who causes pause for concern as to uh, how they evaluate the bias of that particular police officer? In other words, if you hear that a police officer has an agenda, that he's um, pursuing 
a uh, situation where they're trying to develop the fact that someone is guilty rather than investigating the case. In other words, they found their target. Okay, and I, I don't want to. I don't want to get into. Do we approach? Yes. Okay, oh, I'm sorry for popping on the screen earlier. I was like, oh, <laughs> knee jerk reaction, right? Hey, courtroom daddy. Yeah, that looks like um, on the left hand side. Oh, hello. Oh, no, that's not Lauren. Oh, okay. No, Lauren's way over there by juror number 18. Like, she's not even on the screen. Like, half of her. And that's Tom, juror number 18, Tom Evans. Look at doopity doo there. Doopity doo da. There's nothing directly in front of him. The court clerk or whatever, she's actually like a little over to the right of him. It's not like directly across. So that's interesting. The way uh, Lori's table was positioned, it's the same table, but it was just turned towards the jurors. Um, so it's like L shape, you know, like it'd be, I don't know how to describe it. <laughs> it'd be turned the other damn way, um, which was weird, I thought. And um, same courtroom, though. Same courtroom, Daddy. Oh, right. Let's do what Nate's doing. Let's stand up. Woohoo! Yes. Stretch. Oh, my God. Oh. Chad, we hate your books, dude. We hate your books. Well, and we never mind. I'll, I'll be quiet. <laughs> so I've been talking to you folks a little bit about bias. Mr. Pryor, I apologize for the interruption. We did have a note here. We're having a request. Uh, these jurors have actually been here for quite some time. Uh, request for a restroom break. We're going to permit that at this time. So we'll take about a 15, 20 minute recess and time for the jurors to use restrooms if they need. Uh, we'll come back on the record once that mid morning break is concluded. Please rise for the jurors. All right, please. <laughs> You can leave them there on the chairs. Yeah. Yeah, I did too. Language. <laughs> I tuned him out too. Oh, man. Y'all think it's a tactic? You think he's planting a seed uh, as far as like law enforcement, demonizing law enforcement? Like, uh, you know, what's interesting though is. Um, Oh, hello. I'm I'm invisible. I was trying to not be on camera. <laughs> I was gonna smoke. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's interesting because the author of the infamous Reddit email or <clears throat> the zombie email, whatever you want to call it, um, the checklist in which Nate Eaton interviewed Melanie Gibb, right? And on there, it said that, uh, you know, to, was it on there? It was on there. No, that was from Ian that the, the detectives were rated dark. Hermesio. And uh, who was the other one? Hmm. They were zombies. I don't remember. Do you all remember? Hermesio and... Uh, So were two of the apostles, uh, Ballard and Renland. Interesting, right? The two that invested in Tim Ballard's movie. I'm just saying. <laughs> but I mean, and I'm going to say allegedly on that. But who actually wrote the letter? You know, uh, it was Melanie Gibb and David Warwick. So do they think that the detectives are? No, it wasn't in that letter. Just the uh, just the apostles were. I'm getting them confused. And Oprah, yeah, and Oprah, <laughs> you you get a dark rating. You get a dark rating. You get a dark rating. Was Tom Harris in there? Mm -hmm. I'm asking uh, legitimately because I want to know. <laughs> oh hell, Lil Brand says Tim Ballard is maybe going Catholic. I hear allegedly. He needs to just go dark, <laughs> like the rest of his soul. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change who he is, right? <laughs> P 
put a cardboard of prior to he needs punch to <laughs> right oh gosh y'all I, I mean i have some bingo things like i've i've you know in my canva app i've done some and i don't really know how to do it how do you do this you know what i mean like nobody's here and so how do you know and do you even go by it or is it just something to kind of keep you engaged because i mean i can hand those out all day every day <laughs> i guess in their book none of us in the chat are gonna make 144 <laughs> well, i'm good <laughs> hard 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 pass <laughs> I don't want to be like Julie Rowe had said a long time ago. She's like, there's 144,000 dark and there's 144,000 light. And I was like, yeah. And I found a paper on that too from Val Brinkerhoff. He owns Digital Legend, I think. I think. Hmm. <laughs> uh, Lamisa says, Crush, I remember years and years back, the first hearing. Prior was extremely rude to Hermesio and the other man. He was aggressive and testy while he was on the stand. Oh, Steve Daniels. <laughs> and then, oh yeah, that stood out to me big time. Oh, the Steve Daniels one, for sure. I don't remember. Yeah, he did snark at uh, Ray Hermesio. Um, but they both held their ground, especially uh, Steve Daniels. Yeah, I thought he was you know, eye candy. <laughs> I was like, all right. <laughs> but I mean, he was very firm and he was, he reiterated over and over and over again in my pet cemetery, in my pet cemetery, the one that I designated. I mean, he was just like, he drilled it in after that. I was like, go ahead. <laughs> I like that. I feel bad for the FBI agent who had to read all of James and Elena and the storm grabbing by the storm and that's what he called his wayness <laughs> yeah tc they do if chad gets death penalty does idaho go firing squad or lethal injection right okay so that kind of makes me wonder about like thomas creech since they passed the whole good point um since they passed the whole firing squad why didn't they do that to thomas creech instead of not finding a vein it makes me wonder <laughs> Interesting. And I wonder if it's like a grandfathered in kind of thing, you know, like because Creech was in there before. Well, Chad was in there before. So, so was Koberger. So I don't know how that works. Interesting. That'd be a good question for John Thomas. I'm kidding. Crush. Did he, oh, God. Yeah. Sorry. I was going to say. I heard that they have to build a facility to do the firing squad. No, you that don't. They you can't. Do. Bow, bow, bow. Well, okay. according to their laws, they have to build a facility, and they don't even have that. The ladies from the uh, true crime squad that live in Idaho okay. are just, yeah. they're just, they hate that Idaho I know. is such a convoluted. Especially Christy. Is it Christy? No. Christy and Katie. I don't know which I get which. mixed up. I get them mixed up, but but they uh, they said the that, they, she, she, that that is just you know uh, something for them to say that sounds horrific without having a building to do it in, you know. So wow. I hope that you Oops. know. With all that said, the death penalty in Idaho is not really the death penalty. It's very broken. allegedly. It's very broken. It's uh, it's. It's, it's not very, uh, I mean, it's like whenever your parents threaten you with uh, a punishment, like, if you don't do this, I'm going to take my belt, you know, to your butt or whatever. And then they never do. It's kind of like that. <laughs> That's the kind of feeling I get with the death penalty. It's like, oh, here, we're going to threaten you with it, but we're never going to carry through with it. So, woo, <laughs> you know, I mean, at least carry through on, on what you um uh what is it elected into law or whatever i don't know what i don't understand it really why they can't figure that out because i mean people are dying all over the place with fentanyl why can't they <laughs> all right you know here, lick this <laughs> here Just have some mop water <laughs> yeah. oh god right oh ruby oh ruby do 
I just, oh my God. I just. Seems and like and I this don't... got me thinking too, if, if Mormons are, you know, such avid uh, journal writers, where's all the damn journals in the Cox family? Where's it? Do they not write journals? I'm sure they I do. I mean, everybody else, everybody else from back to dang jo Joseph Smith writing mm -hmm. journals yep. and saying it's part of their, you know, religious that's what they thing. Do. That's what kind of took this to the blogging space. And, and that's how we kind of got the, the Mormon mommy vloggers, I think, um, you know, because that's just one of the things that they, you know, encouraged to do in that. I really think good. I had a diary at one time, which I did yeah. not write in it every day or whatever, yeah. but I, I don't know whatever happened to that thing, but uh, I'm guessing journaling <laughs> is not a bad thing, but <laughs> look, little brand says Lori's mom doesn't even swallow her food. You want her to keep a journal. <laughs> right. <laughs> Great point. <laughs> yeah. Plenty of uh, Rombo says plenty of fentanyl in law enforcement custody. <laughs> right. Oh my goodness. A uh, fentanyl breakfast sort of spud. Oh my gosh. Oh. Yeah. Ravina. Yeah. Deneen says, thank you for answering my question. Chad will probably rot away forever, which is better. Exactly. I just think it's like, go spend time in your room and think about it. <laughs> you know, go think about not ever tasting your wife's food ever again. Not ever getting to touch Hori ever again. Never getting to harm another child or adult or any unsuspecting potential victim um, that you're going to prey upon. Um, mm -mm. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, ooh, Solo Dove says, but they carry their phones everywhere. <laughs> All 700 of them. <laughs> and registered their email to them. <laughs> you know gotta get those personal ad suggestions and stuff <laughs> i bet chad did keep a uh, journal i mean i'm thinking they have about journals. they they did have their that's going to be presented in here too and like zalema's journal became part of this too but they tore out the pages of it about the belief system y'all remember that okay um, yeah i remember that i wonder if they give them back <laughs> You know, Larry told me on the second day of Lori's trial last last year, he was like, he wants that. He wants Alex Cox's guns. <laughs> I'm just like, why? <laughs> you know, and I'm just like, huh? Yeah, I mean, it just is. I, I remember asking him why, but I don't remember what he said. He was like, I don't know, just to have them. I think that's what he said. He's an avid gun collector, too, so. Yeah. I don't know. He's got his reasons. <laughs> I don't question. Or, you know, I don't judge. And, you know, I was remembering something that I heard uh, Rex and Uncle. Uh, it was the Uncle Rex and, and Adam said that they would believe that, like, a that Alex was too bumbling to have committed the murders by himself because the murders that we know of that he tried to commit by himself he failed to do so, so did he or did that happen on purpose i'm telling you it's kind of that parts said, theory that i'm thinking about tammy i think he did it maybe just to scare her to get her spirit to separate i don't know it's some spiritual shit and i talked to a lady last but it seemed time. like it didn't scare her Really? It did. I mean, but it that's <laughs> kind of what I mean, think about the Halloween mask of the monkey and, and what they're doing with all that shit to these kids, to the kids, to their victims. It's like they're scaring them, stripping them of everything. They're look at Ruby Frankie's children, the whole just stripping it all away and just, I mean, turning into a damn demon mom. And she, she actually friends. drugged, she actually drugged those kids. I mean, she even said in her JK. journal that she drugged those kids that she uh would put them out or this that and the other thing i don't know how I mean, that's they think that's a thing to do jj had ghb in his system uh, i don't think that's normal <laughs> we don't know what was in tylee's now i can I, see I you know, okay. <laughs> i pray i pray don't, that they, you're going 
Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, I can see you like going no soda or, you know, something with caffeine in it, you know, mm -hmm. trying to get them to go to bed at night mm -hmm. by not, you know, giving them stuff yeah, no. to, to keep <laughs> them riled up. But <laughs> that would take effort. You know, that's a pacifier. I think the now, I mean, the way I look back at it now, it's like, wow. And I mean, she was, Lori told the babysitter to give him, here's his sleeping medicine, but yet it wasn't his prescription medicine so what was it was it melatonin was it what was it i want to know i didn't learn that in this trial her trial i mean i hope to god that both those kids were were i hope they were all drugged up <laughs> which is pathetic you know oh god they need to tell what they know <sighs> bothers me they need to tell what they know I'm they seeing Summer put on a show to save herself. Summer, you need to tell what you know. Right? Stop stop doing the whole circuit thing. That pisses me off. Oh, my God. <clears throat> I mean, she's not there. She, she said, you want me to shoot him or you want me to kill him myself? Uh, sit down, <laughs> first off. You know, uh-uh. I know and that. Melanie and Melanie Gibb. And that, that's Melanie. one of these things in this religion where it's just like, okay, forgive and forget. No, ma'am. Not on my watch. And I mean, it's like, yeah, you want me to uh, to hear all that and just, you know, put it away from me. And Melanie Gibb is just, she's like, oh, I can't believe people are so interested in whether I'm married or divorced. Girl, we don't care whether you're married or divorced. Yeah. We don't. We right. want to know what you know. That's all. I don't follow know. me. <laughs> we don't yeah. follow you either, Hooker. We don't care. We don't care we what right you do. You. We yeah. want to know what you knew. They won't tell, I'm sure, because they will hold that closure to keep you in limbo. Mm -hmm. It's control. It's all, And this is all about control. Money, well, power, it's going to keep them in limbo, off. too. They can't live with all that crap in their head and carry on normal lives. Yeah, they can. They are perfectly fine with being psychopaths. <laughs> they are okay. Well, they, they micro compartmentalize. They will. I'm fixing to say it. They'll fuck up again then. <laughs> oh, Donna. <laughs> you go, girl. <laughs> Is your mom watching? <laughs> I hope <I'm> sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ravina. Exactly. Bullshit. And not that hasn't been addressed yet in Arizona. So she better enjoy it while she can. And I mean, I wouldn't be rewarding the bad behavior if you know what I mean. That's just me. That'd be like Alex being here and me being like, okay, you know, uh, uh, you want to go to crime Club or whatever? I, no. What the hell? And I don't also, another thing I've noticed with, you know, the other family members as far as Grunkle, Rex and uh, Adam is just. They, they tend to he's, like distance Alex, like he's just not this horrible murderer, you know. And I'm just like, wait, no. I mean, you're saying all the things he he would do. Oh, he's an honest murderer, I guess, and shit like that. And I'm just like, that does no, uh, that doesn't give him a pass. He's not cool. He's not less culpable. Uh, let's not try and memorialize him while we're at it. You know what I mean? Like that's the vibe I get and it, kind of like a think, apologist, you know, I think they are putting forth that. If that they once, make him better than it makes if they them. were good, they mm. were good and they got to be bad by being demon possessed or whatever happened to them. Yeah. And they, you know, but other than that, they're okay. Jay. Yeah, I'm just saying, I don't think Alex, I know everybody says Lori was so good before this happened. I just think Lori was so good at hiding yeah. what she was before this. Right on. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine? I can't imagine. But like, what was I going to say? Um, oh, hell. Oh, I'll think about it. <laughs> I know. I'm not as scatterbrained as I was last night. Jeez. Um. It was about Alex, though. Hmm. Oh, if they make Alex the not so bad person, then it kind of lets them get a little face, if you know what I mean. You know what I mean? Like public perception. 
yeah. if they can make it uh, acceptable for John Q. Public, you know, then it kind of legitimizes their own association, I think, to to the perpetrators, you know. I, that's just me, but I don't know. It's weird. That's a weird angle, a weird situation. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, well, just interesting. something fixed to happen. Just yep. a little. View. Oh. All right, great. Here, now go back, John. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> Okay, we're back on the record, Mr. Pryor. You can continue with your board hours and we'll just reach over. You may. Before I uh, get into a different topic, um, do any of you folks know each other? Nobody knows each other? Um, and again, remind me of uh, in terms of media viewing, how many of you have seen any talk whether it's the internet, TV, anything about that? Could you raise your cards if you've seen any? Okay, thank you. One of the um, instructions that the courts want to give you is that. Um, uh, talks about what a conspiracy is. And the state talked a little bit about that. The prosecuting attorney, I think, but please forgive me, I believe it was Ms. Blake, talked to you folks a little bit about that. And um, one of the things in order to have a conspiracy per the court's instructions, and this is what the judge is going to give you as rules, okay, is that there needs to be an agreement. There needs to be an agreement. Is there anybody who is there anybody who doesn't understand what an agreement is? Okay. Juror number 219. Sorry. What do you, what do you, how do you define what an agreement is? It's hard to uh, define without it. Using the word agreement, basically you're um, understanding the same thing. Uh, and an individual that you are working with on. Okay. And your number 11, um, we haven't picked on you, but I apologize. We haven't picked on you. Okay, so that's, that's okay. But what do you think an agreement is? How would you define an agreement? I would define an agreement as two or more parties formally agreeing to something or seeing like one another and formally, you know, planning something together. Is there anybody who disagrees with that? How about hands of showing me anybody who agrees? 
leaves, hands or cards, whatever is your whatever you feel. So if I understand it, 394, let's see. Did you put your card up or hand up? I'm sorry. Okay. So you think that there needs to be a formal arrangement. How is that arrangement set up? Is it is it in words to each other saying, we agree that this is what we're going to do? Is that how that you reach a formal agreement? I think it varies based on the situation. I think it can be formal, it can be verbal, nonverbal, just depends on the situation. Okay. But there has to be some, I don't want to use fancy words, so I, I, I tend to speak very simply. Um, it has to be some kind of a statement or some something that says, yeah, we're all in on this, right? Jury number uh, 27, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> I'm the one who struggles with technology. Right. <laughs> uh, yes, I would agree with that. Um, I think based on what you're coming to agreement of, there might be different protocol. Okay. Um, but I believe your word is your word. Regardless of what that protocol is. Okay. So if you're coming to an agreement, then you are in agreement. That's your, your okay. word. That's your, that's your contract. Okay. And, and we're going to work our way down to turn number 31. And she's smiling. She looks like she's ready to tell her opinion. So I'll give you this chance. No. <laughs> it's a nervous smile. Oh, I'm sorry. If you're too nervous, we can no, pass I the mic on. In fact, folks, if, if it gets to the point where you're too nervous and you just don't want to say anything, this is like a game. Just pass it on to the next person. You know? No, I'm I'm okay. Talk. It's the okay. thing that I don't. Um, an agreement. Um, I I think too as as verbal, but sometimes it's a written agreement. Okay. Um, not necessarily. Uh, I agree to that or agree because even though you say it doesn't mean it's for sure. Right. Or if it's written down, a signature, or something that I feel like you can't get out of that agreement now. So if people are just talking about topics, that doesn't necessarily mean it's an agreement, does it? No. There, there has to be some, and I'm going to use a fancy word because I, I surprised you, I went to law school. And they, the one thing they do to us is they try to put fancy words in our mouth. So I'm going to use this fancy word and then I'm going to ask you, maybe explaining what I think are simpler words. They say you have to manifest a desire to, to to agree, would that be fair? Yes. Okay. Yes. Pass it on to, to our friend uh, number forty-one. What do you think? That an agreement. What constitutes an agreement? Would you turn that on? I'm sorry. I, aside from that being technologically advanced, I can't hear very well either. Okay. So, well, everything we've all said, what we agree with, we keep going. Okay. So you generally agree that there has to at least has to be some sort of arrangement or understanding between all of the parties that this is what we are doing. Does it have to be really clear, or can it be? Well, I'm not sure. Yeah, was... We we approach. Uh, well, in the interest of time, this way, is there objection the state has? Your Honor, the state's position would be he's misstating the law and what the. Uh... At least the if you would be in this case, of course, we don't have the specific instruction from this court, but I think he's confusing the elements of this particular crime. At this point, um, Mr. Pryor, I am concerned that we're delving into court instruction here and outside the scope of what Rule 24B permits on juror qualification. And so uh, I would ask that we move on from definitions of what an agreement may be in the case. The jury will be instructed on that issue. And Judge, can I respond to that objection just to get a clear record? Yes. And Judge, I'm, uh, the state took some time to talk to the jurors about, uh, uh, you know, speaking honestly and straightforward and all of that. And I think, quite frankly, I'm allowed to go into at least what they're understanding because these folks are going to be providing jury instructions. And those jury instructions, uh, at least from my perspective, I can ask them how they would understand and interpret that. So I would, uh, all due respect to the court, I disagree with. All right, well, I stand by the ruling. The instructions will clearly delineate the elements of any crimes charged in the case the evidence may show. And I think this is going beyond the scope of uh, proper or dire. So if we move on to another topic, just prior. 
Is there anyone here who can promise me that they will review the entire evidence before they make a decision? Please raise your cards. Up. Is there anybody here who thinks that they just need to look at the prosecutor's evidence and if they've already figured out what they feel on that, uh, that they, they don't, it's really not necessary to listen to my evidence. Anybody agree with that? Okay. All right. I think that's all I might have at this point. I think that's all I have. Thank you, Robert. folks. Thank you very much for your time. All right. Thank you, Mr. Fire. Uh, we'll move on at this point. We are going to have some individual questioning of jurors. I did want to return back around with a question or two of my own, going back to uh, juror 296. We've talked a little bit about hardship. Um, you've raised a couple of different things. I'm sorry, uh, sir, 394, apologies. There's a, uh, you've got an important trip planned the very first week of June, is that correct? All right, you've also made some concerns about your work situation. On the June trip, um, I guess on each of those points, number one, I don't know that we'll have an opportunity to go back and, for example, check with employers, find out what that answer is. We'll kind of need to know today whether you're in or out potentially as a juror. So we, we really need to go on the information we've got now. The second point I guess I'd make is uh, if this case is going longer than anticipated and we're getting up to June, do you believe that would become a severe distraction for you if you started thinking you were not going to be able to attend this vacation or do you think you could possibly set that aside? Yeah, I wouldn't consider vacation hardship. Um, I would really focus on the case. So. Okay, I just wanted to be clear on that. Um, so I appreciate your response on that. With that in mind then, uh, at this point, we are going to conduct some individual voir dire and We've got a process. Uh, we, you're the first group we're doing this with, so we thought it through. But the process will be to have jurors remain one at a time, and so you'll cycle in and out of the room while we have one juror remain for this individual section of our questioning. Uh, at this point, then we'll go ahead and start with um, probably the lowest numbers starting first. So. Juror 27 will remain for some more individual voir dire. The additional remaining jury in the panel will be excused for a moment while I talk to them and we'll go in that order. Mm -hmm. All right, please. <laughs> Yep. I apologize. It's 11. I saw the empty seat there and thought one of them excused. Me. Thank you. Please be seated. All right, juror number 11, we do have, um, I believe, a response in here. You've got some knowledge of this case previously. Um, I don't know that you raised any concern as it relates to possible hardships. So 
Uh, at this time, I just ask for council, beginning with the state and the defense, to make any inquiries you think are necessary in order to uh, go into the issue of potential bias from pretrial exposure. Uh, who's going to be doing that for the state? I will be on this particular juror with juror number 11. Okay, thank you. So, Ms. Blake, if you'd like to uh, confine the response or your poor dire to that topic of uh, potential bias, and then I'll allow the defense, and then we'll move on to questions on uh, death penalty responses after that, and I'll have my own question. And Your Honor, with in regards to juror number 11, the state's only real questions are going to be um, regarding hardship. We just wanted to clarify a few things. And I will indicate there was no hardship listed, just with some of the responses, we just wanted to verify a few things. Okay, you can go ahead and inquire on whatever topic. Then. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, juror number 11, it's my understanding you have a brand new baby, three months old. Yes, I do. And then you also work. And I know that you indicated no hardship. I just wanted to clarify with you, are, do you work nights? Work early mornings. Okay, so coming here by 8, to get started at 8.30 or maybe even sometimes a little before 8, would that create any kind of a hardship for you? Not immediately, though. And when you say not immediately, just so I'm clear with you, and I apologize to put you on the spot here, um, in not immediately, would you be good for a full 10 weeks or for the expected um, duration of the trial? Yes, I, I can it. And do you think your employer will work with you on that? I have talked with my employer about it, and the transition will be a little difficult, but we could work out a compromise. And it sounds like they're willing to work with you then from your conversations? Correct. And then um, with that uh, three-month-old at home, do you have any concerns if you were to be sequestered for a period of time? It would be difficult being away from family, especially with a young child at home like that, but if it is required as a domestic duty, I would be able to make it work. I just wanted to verify that with you because I know sometimes people don't mark a hardship down because um, they try to compare themselves to other people's situations. So I just wanted to make sure that that was going to work for you. And then just to clarify with you, my um, notes from the questionnaire that you filled out was that you really didn't have any prior knowledge of this case. Is that correct? Correct. I just heard about it in Brewer. That's uh, all the questions that the state has. Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Pryor, you can inquire on board. I know there was a bit of a mention of some pre case knowledge, as well as uh, those hardship issues. If you'd like to inquire on those two topics, then we'll move on to questions as it relates to uh, the death penalty. I, I don't say that you do some media. Did you hear about this by way of media or not? I came across it just looking through the news, but I never delved any deeper than glancing at it. Okay, and, and please forgive me. I don't mean to go into personal affairs. Would it be a financial hardship for you to support your family being off for two weeks? It would be difficult. I'm still communicating with my employer about their policies with jury pay, but um. If it was unpaid, yes, it would be a financial hardship. And that's really what I want to get into is that, uh, you know, we all have an obligation to the members of the and serve. And I'm sorry. Is that better? No. We all have an obligation to serve, but if it gets to the point where you um, feel like this is going to be a terrible financial hardship. You're going to have to struggle financially. At that point, this is not supposed to be something that imposes a significant burden on you. And what I'm understanding is that if your employer, I know your employer, I know you work, we don't need to get into that, but if that employer doesn't pay you for more than a week, this is going to be a significant financial burden on you, isn't it? Yes, it would. 
and it's going to be difficult to, for you to make your uh, your expenses and your needs to provide for your family. Correct. So we're sort of banking on the fact that if, if your employer doesn't give us the right answer, um, you're going to be in a difficult situation. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree. It does bank on what my employer does say. Okay, and at this point, um, I don't need you to be um, noble. None of us should be noble. I, I, I feel like if someone had asked me to take 10 weeks away, yeah, I think I could do it. Um, if it's going to be a situation where you're going to have to, after 10 weeks, you're going to have to play catch up, and you're going to have collectors and things like that. That's not being noble. I, I mean, I think at this point, if you really feel that this is going to be a financial hardship, if the employer doesn't give you the correct answer, um, I would consider that a hardship. Would you agree with that? I would agree. Judge, I'm going to vote for cause. I, 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 you know, I think this young man is being honorable, but the reality is that he doesn't know what his employer is going to say. And quite frankly, it's going to be a financial hardship. And now's the time to resolve this rather than waiting until we get into the next round. Um, response from the state on the challenge for cause. Your Honor, with that additional explanation and information, the state has no objection. All right. Well, um, <clears throat> turn number 11, the court will agree with council agreeing as well. Uh, your attitude is very much appreciated by the court and your willingness to serve. Um, congratulations on your new family. I hope things continue to go well for you at work. And at this point, just given the length of this trial and your situation, uh, it is a concern that you may face an undue financial hardship. So you will be excused and the court will support the strike for cause on a hardship basis for jury number 11. So that will conclude your jury service today. Thank you for coming. Yeah. All right, and Mr. Vail, if you'd bring in juror number two seven next. Yes, sir. All right, thank you for returning here to courtroom juror 27. We're going to conduct an additional individual voir dire with you concerning issues of either bias or hardship, both of which were mentioned in the questionnaire. Um, although the hardship was checked as a no, and you potentially have a vacation starting June 15th, it looks like. Uh, the question of Prior case knowledge is something I think we need to explore a little more outside of the presence of other jurors. So I'll begin again with the state if you'd like to conduct any additional voir dire uh, as it relates to pretrial publicity or bias. You can do that and then I'll allow the defense. And just to start, um, Juror 27, have you ever lived in Florida? Okay. Yeah. And so this. May seem like a, a strange question, but just to double check, have you ever been charged with a crime in Florida? No, I have not. Okay. Okay. Um, in your questionnaire, you mentioned that you've seen some headlines. Correct. Uh, but you didn't uh, really read, uh, if I read this accurately, you just looked at the headlines and didn't really research the case. No, I never clicked on the headlines to read any details. Okay. Oh, so you, you knew that something was going on, but you didn't know the details. Correct. Uh, sometimes headlines can be, for lack of a better word, loaded with a lot of 
information maybe designed to make you want to read it. Uh, was there anything in those headlines uh, that may have biased you towards this defendant? Uh, no, sir. I don't think I could make a judgment based on the Okay. And so, uh, whatever you did see in those headlines, you can commit to this court uh, and to this defendant and to people of I that you can set aside whatever you saw in those headlines and give this defendant a blank slate for this trial. Yeah, absolutely. Your Honor, I don't have any other questions on um, media exposure. I, will we, did the court want us to go into the death penalty section at all right now? Or I'll do an inquiry on that starting and then allow you questions as well. Um, the, I guess the only question I had while we got you here is the vacation starting June 15th. Uh, we're scheduled to be done at that time, but if this were running long, would that uh, start causing you some great concern if you were potentially going to miss that? No, there is a vacation on the 24th that would cause me concern, but the one on the 15th is flexible. It could be moved. Okay, that's the only question I had on that. Um, Ms. Pryor, if you'd like to inquire as it relates to any bias, you can do that, and then we'll move on to questions regarding the death penalty. And, and then the, the concern that, as much like a number of the other folks, there are four kids at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, forgive me, I can't remember the ages of those kids. Are those younger kids? Uh, my children, my oldest is 12, and then I have 10, and then I have twins who are eight. Okay, and are you the one primarily responsible for taking care of those kids? Uh, you could say that um, my husband works from home, so he is around always. So, so there is some flexibility there. There is some flexibility, yes. Um, I homeschool my kids part-time, and they go to a program part-time, but my husband's always home, and he's very involved in the homeschool process. So he could take over at least for 10 weeks. I saw that in the file. I couldn't remember exactly the age of the children. I saw that there was a homeschool issue. I don't recall seeing it. I was going to take that over. That's something you folks can work through. Yeah, I mean, it would take some logistics and um, compromise, but okay. it's definitely doable. Okay. All right. Now, Judge, I don't think I have anything else. Then. All right. Thank you. Uh, so, juror number 27, the next topic we're going to discuss as it relates to capital punishment, which is a factor in this case. The first question I guess I'll begin with is, do you recall answering, and you do have a copy of the questionnaire there, but these questions uh, on part five of our questionnaire called attitudes regarding the death penalty. Do you remember answering those questions? Yes, I do. And to your Best recollection are all of your answers in the questionnaire still true and accurate about how you feel about that today? Yes. Okay. So in this case, uh, juror number 27, it may be necessary for you to make a determination in regard to the imposition of the death penalty or some other penalty. Um, in this case, looking through your questionnaire, uh, you've indicated that you are in support of the death penalty. Is that still accurate? Sure. I'm going to uh, read another statement to you now. Remember, any penalty you consider should be done as if it is absolute and will be carried out in this case. Your conscientious religious or other objections to the death penalty are not grounds for you to be excused as a juror. Do you understand that? I understand. Okay. And based on your uh, responses, would you be in favor of the death penalty in every case where a murder has been committed, or would you follow 
any instructions given by the court as to whether or not it should be applied? Uh, valid direction from the court. Okay, so you're not saying you believe it should be imposed or you would vote for it in any case? I do not believe that it's the result of any case. All right, um, having considered then the responses in the questionnaire here, the court is going to pass over Board Dyer for any additional questioning from the state at this time, and then I'll allow the defense to Board Dyer on that issue. Yeah, the state doesn't have any further questions. All right, Mr. Pryor, any questions? And Jeff, would the court prefer that I be up at the podium or are we okay for me to sit here? You're fine to remain seated as long as you talk into the mic. <laughs> Thank you. Ma'am, there's there's no wrong answer when it comes to uh, people's feelings about that. Uh, everybody has an opinion, and, and everybody's entitled to their opinion. I agree. Okay. One of the areas that caused me to uh, look at your uh, particular profile, and nothing more, but in your case, you have four relatively young children. You were to hear testimony that related to the death of young children, would that cause you to react in a way that would say um, there are children involved here? It has to be the death. No, honestly, um, age difference. The death of anybody is sad. I don't believe that I would be affected just because of age. Okay, and on the same token, if someone's immediately convicted of uh, Charge such like this. Is that an automatic for you for the death penalty? No, not me personally, no. Do you start at the death penalty and say, well, I'll look at other things, but uh, it's been a murder, so we're starting at the death penalty and then we're going to work backwards? No. Okay. Judge, I have nothing else. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I just have a final question then for your 27. So uh, as we get into that section of the case, uh, are you committed that you would hold the government to its proof in this case if that was the instruction you were provided? Right. All right, thank you. Um, jury number 27, you can go ahead and return to the jury room there with the bailiff, and we will next have juror number 31 brought. All right, juror number 31 is now seated. The court's going to take just a moment to briefly review again the question all. All right, uh, the court has uh, determined individual board dire to be appropriate for this juror number 31. Um, this particular juror has some knowledge of the case, which we'll discuss with you here individually. I'll allow questioning on that. 
There's also a potential personal knowledge of one of the uh, participants in the trial being a staff attorney. And then in terms of hardship, there was nothing there. So uh, I guess let's start with questioning in terms of any potential bias. And after that, we'll move on to questions as it relates to the death penalty and her responses in the questionnaire. So just as an outset, um, you do have a copy of your questionnaire there with you. Are all of the questions that you answered in your responses, including on the section of your attitudes regarding the death penalty, are those answers still true and accurate to the best of your knowledge here today? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, with that in mind, I'll allow the state to inquire first as it relates to any possible bias, then the defense, then we can move on to questions related to the death penalty. Uh, Ms. Blake and Mr. Wood. It's me, Your Honor. It's me. Very sorry. Thank you. Go ahead. Good morning. I want to talk to you uh, briefly about some of the media exposure in this case. Um, you mentioned in your questionnaire that you had seen this case on the news. Yes. Yes. Uh, and you also mentioned at one point uh, there was a question on page 19. Has any of your possible exposure to news reporting caused you to form an opinion uh, about the defendant's guilt or innocence? And you had written uh, that you weren't sure. You just kind of you wrote, I don't know. Uh, can you kind of talk to me a little bit about that? Um, because what I have seen and what when this all started, I saw, you know, up there. Um, but until I actually see the evidence and hear more of background of why or why I didn't, that's when I feel like I will know more than just what I've seen on TV. Okay. Well, that's that kind of leads into my next question, because uh, you had also mentioned that you were hoping that you got to hear the correct story from the poll. And so during this trial, you're going to be instructed by the judge uh, that the state, the prosecution, has the burden of proof. And the defendant does not actually have to testify at all. That's the state's burden of proof. Right. Uh, and so um, is that something that would trouble you? No. Okay. Uh, and would you be able to set aside what you've heard in this case on the media um, and just let the defendant start with this clean slate presumption of innocence uh, and wait until you've heard the evidence to make a decision? Yes. Okay, thank you. And then just briefly, um, in the hardship portion, uh, there was, an, there was a question about being sequestered, and you mentioned that you have concerns. Uh, is that something you'd be comfortable talking a little bit about or elaborating on? What one was that? I believe it was on page 21, and it was a question about being sequestered. And you had written, um, the question was, would any potential sequestration pose an unmanageable hardship for you? Uh, and your answer had been, uh, maybe away from home overnight, I do have concerns. Okay, so yeah, I didn't know. Um, a long time away from home is just a long time from home. Sure. Um, my husband's on disability, but um, we're just so used to doing everything together 24 7, sure. where I just thought, gosh, weeks after weeks after weeks not seeing him, that'd be hard. But I mean, I would do it. That was just kind of my. And does your husband have a disability that requires you to care physically? No, okay. no. I don't believe I have any other questions at this time, Your Honor. All right, thank you, Ms. Beatty. Mr. Pryor? Yeah, I only have a couple of questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I only have a couple of questions. I think we'll be able to do with that. I saw on your uh, questionnaire, I'm talking page seven, the bottom of page seven. Let me know when you're ready. Okay. Under uh, part four, number one, question A. Oh my gosh, that's a mouthful. Uh, it says, do you feel that a defendant should be required to testify? You are yes. Could you elaborate on that a little bit just for me, just so I understand? Um, answering this in last week, um, and then listening to the different things that they really don't need to testify. That I feel like if, if I heard him testify, I don't know if it'd make my, my me make change my mind whether he's guilty or not guilty, 
Um, I'm aware that he probably won't say anything that I learned today. So it probably would not matter at this point. So when you marked it, um, yeah, I marked it, yes. You should be required. What I'm concerned about is not um, what you're hearing today, it's just that when the case is submitted to you and, and it's all over with, are you going to be able to look beyond that opinion of yours and say, well, I originally said, I think he ought to testify because I really want to hear what he has to say. But um, I, I guess that you can understand that could be a concern. Right, right. right. And that's a legitimate concern. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess I'm, I'm just sort of wondering if you'd be able to look beyond that and say, okay, I don't need him to testify. I can evaluate the evidence uh, as it's presented to me without hearing from him. Would that be fair to say? That's fair. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And then lastly, um, under B, right underneath that one, you said, the question was, do you feel that a defendant who does not testify is probably guilty or has something to hide? And you mark yes. So you, I understand you said you could look beyond that. I guess my concern is, is that do you still believe that if he doesn't testify or that if any defendant doesn't testify, Maybe they're hiding something or they must be guilty. I should have put no because reading that now, no. Okay, and I understand yeah. the, the stress of being in these situations. You know, you're you're trying to get this done and you've got a million things on your mind. And maybe you just are you suggesting you just overlook it? Or no, I, I I didn't read it correctly. Okay. So okay. So um and then finally, um Again, um, and I don't want to get on too much into your husband's disability. Would it be would it be fair to say that he's the um, your his emotional support in terms of being home with him, and that uh, there would be some sort of loss of emotional support for you not to be in with him for working about ten weeks almost every day of the week, except for Saturday and Sunday. Is that going to be a hardship? I guess I. I really want you to be focused on this case. I really want you to uh, take the time to read everything and be clear about what you're uh, reviewing. Mm -hmm. And, and what, I, what I'm really concerned about when I hear about family members who have to struggle with disabilities, it's a terrible thing to have to deal with. I, I just want to make sure that you're going to be able to focus and you're not going to be overly concerned about your husband and, and, and because this is going to be a 10-week job for you. Right. And it's, it's it's a significant job. Right. We're, here on, a, we're here on a very serious situation. I guess I um, I want to make sure that, that you're going to be okay because ultimately uh, it really needs to be whether or not you're okay. It doesn't need to be whether I'm okay or these four prosecutors over here are okay. It really comes down to whether you're going to be okay. And I just want to make sure that you're okay. I'm okay. okay. Yeah. Judge, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. At this point, then, um, Juror 31, I'd like to just turn to the topic raised in part five of this questionnaire and its titled Attitudes Regarding the Death Penalty. Um, I'll walk through a couple of your answers with you here. You did say that uh, you support or oppose the death penalty. You said oppose. And then do you feel your views on the death penalty would prevent or substantially impair your ability to view the facts impartially? You said no. Um, and the next question, would your views on the death penalty prevent or substantially impair your ability to return a guilty verdict of first degree murder, even if the state had proven its case beyond a reasonable doubt? You also said no. So uh, in this case, it may well be necessary for you to make a determination in regard to the imposition of the death penalty or some other penalty. So looking at your responses there, um, I'll first uh, let you know that any penalty you consider should be done as if it is absolute and will be carried out in this case. Your conscientious, religious, or other objections to the death penalty are not grounds for you to be excused as a juror you understand that statement? Right, yes, I do. Okay, so um, going back to your answer then, uh, having thought about it, although you may be opposed 
to the death penalty, you've also indicated it would not prevent you from either rendering a verdict if the state proved its case beyond a reasonable doubt. Do you still feel that way? Yes. All right, and you've also said it would not substantially impair your ability to view the facts impartially. Do you still stand by that answer? Yes. Okay, so even if you have a personal view opposed to the death penalty, do you believe you would be able to set aside your own view here and follow the law and instructions given to you by the court in this case if you were instructed that you had to consider that penalty? Yes, sir. Okay, that will conclude the court's line of questioning as it relates to her responses on the death penalty topic. Uh, the state may inquire on that issue at this time. Yeah. All right, does the defense have any questions for the juror on that? No, Your Honor, I appreciate your inquiry. Okay, that will conclude then uh, the individual board dire of juror number 31. You can return to the uh, jury room there and you'll have the bailiffs next bring in juror number 41. All right, uh, juror number four, one has returned for individual or dire with the court and counsel. Um, there's a couple of topics I'd like to begin with, a uh, topic of hardship, uh, which the juror mentioned of potential vacation plans May 30th, and also then some information about the case, so potentially bias based on pretrial publicity. Uh, the state would like to inquire on those topics at this time. We'll move forward there and then see if we need to get into additional topics after that. Do I hear me over again? Yes. I just want to clarify. Do so you have your question? So I'm not sure your question. I'm sorry. Um, I've lost my voice. I'll try to stay close. So, ma'am, I'm just going to direct you to your question where it could help us in this process. Uh, I might invite you to turn to page 20 of your question. Uh, question. You have yes. noticed, you noticed uh, a potential hardship in planned vacation that starts on May 30th. You just explain a little bit about that. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. We can't. Do you have the microphone with you? <laughs> Apologies. We've got to pick it up on the record so we can go back later and read what you said. Thank you. Yes, if you'd explain again about your trip, please. Yeah, that's a week long trip. So, with respect to that trip that you noted as a potential hardship, um, if you were selected to be a juror on this case, do you feel like the potential to miss that trip after your jurisdiction is supposed to? into that planned time, 
is that going to be a problem for you, or is this a trip to you? We arrange these things. Yeah, and it's already had to pay for it because we have a deal and the family was taking the time off to pay for it. Okay. And you, you've actually paid out expenses for the trip already? Yeah. Is that going to get too personal? It's a large sum of money that you have to pay for. <clears throat> Excuse me. I next want to call your attention to the section of your question. I think you'll find that on page seven. It deals with your knowledge of the law. Whenever you're there. Yes. So I would just like to ask you some questions. Um, uh, I'm not sure answers you given on page seven. I'm actually going to go down to the bottom of the page under part four, uh, question D. <clears throat> and in that section, you were asked a question Do you believe that a person on trial who does not take the witness stand and deny the crime is probably guilty? And I believe you answered that. Yes, is that, is that right? Sorry, I'm sorry, I can't hear. Yes, yeah, so question. Exactly. Could you explain a little bit more about what you meant by your answer? Yeah, you can just ask in a different way. Why do you think someone is necessarily guilty just because they don't want to take this? Everyone else. We talked about that earlier. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Okay. If you could just talk, I'm sorry. And I know it's difficult. Uh, and if you need a water. Uh, no, it's okay. Um, just speak right into the mic. Right? On your response, let me just um, briefly cancel. Let me switch over and let Mr. Pryor maybe ask a couple of follow up questions on these responses. Um, on the general attitudes and knowledge of the law mm -hmm. and her uh, belief that maybe somebody ought to be uh, testifying in order to explain her innocence. So, Mr. Pryor, if you'd like to question her on that topic, I think we could maybe cut some chase here on this. Do I understand it's to which it's not judge? Yeah, so um, she's indicated she feels a defendant should be required to testify um, is probably guilty if they don't testify and um, if they don't take the witness stand is probably guilty also and just to confirm and again it's fine these are everybody absolutely has the right to their opinions and that is the way you feel as you sit here today is that correct well you talked about that earlier well, and um, I guess the question is, do do you still hold that belief that really you think someone should be required to testify in order for you to consider their innocence? All right, well, I, I kind of broke things up here. Mr. Wixon, did you have anything further? And then I'll allow Mr. Pryor some additional water die. I just want to vet out that particular issue. Thank you, Josh. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, uh, while, we're, while we're in this topic area, um, there were just a couple more questions that I'd like to ask in this section. You, it's really maybe different questions getting at the same thing. But if you were instructed by the judge that a defendant does not, um, under our constitution, have to take the stand and testify, and he can invoke his right to remain silent. 
Um, are you committed today that if if you chose to do that, that you wouldn't hold that against you? Yes. Right. I'd like to go ahead and draw your attention down to page eight, please. <clears throat> I'm going to call your attention to question number two. And I believe it would be C. <clears throat> On that question, you want to ask Do you feel that the burden of proof should be greater than proof beyond a reasonable doubt, such as proof beyond and any, any possible doubt or proof to an absolute certainty? And frankly, I think you've got both boxes checked. Which box did you intend to check? <laughs> Fair enough. You can be. You take a moment, sir. Yes, that should be proved. That's your argument. No. Okay, just as soon as we put the answer to that. Is that your understanding? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And in your mind, is would that be something different than proof to an absolute certainty? So, if the judge gives you an instruction, I understand it, it can be a, a difficult concept. If the judge gives you instruction as to what reasonable doubt is, um, and, and inherent in that instruction, there may be some room. To not absolutely know someone's guilty, but beyond any doubt that you reasonably believe is true. If he gives you that kind of instruction, is that something that you need to follow? Yes. So you just need one last follow-up on that. So you don't you don't require absolute unequivocal proof before you can consider whether or not someone is guilty or not. That's very good. You understand that question. <laughs> yes, yes. Do you have any other questions? Ma'am, I, I know that there were some, some health related matters in your question. Can you just tell the court now are there any health conditions that you have that you think will impact your ability to serve on the jury? Not really, no. I have bronchial abscesses. I'm sorry, can you hear that? I'm sorry. Bronchiectasis, but it's just, it's just a coughing and a throat, because like, you can go for that, you know, breathing, just fine, but, so, even then, it's, it's nothing, it's nothing that would stop me from being here. That, that wouldn't interfere with your day-to-day -day service on the jury? No. Is that something that's fairly treatable, do you take treatment for? It's fine. Honor, at this time, um, we would just ask the court to see her strike the jury for cause based upon her hardship with her trip. She's indicated that she already has this trip. Um, they are the the night they're taking for the trial, that she's paid what she has a, a, a fair chunk of money towards the trip. And so we wouldn't want her to miss her trip, lose her money, or be stuck sitting on the jury resenting the fact that she lost her trip. And so we're asking the court to see her strike the cause based on that. All right, Mr. Pryor, before you get into board, are then uh, response to the state's motion to strike for cause based on I express hardship? Judge, do I have the medical commission not to stand up? Yeah, you can remain seated to talk into the mic there. Judge, I agree with this. I agree with the state, Judge. I think at this point, uh, I don't want her to miss a family uh, vacation, and I think she ought to be afforded that opportunity. 
All right. Well, the state has made its uh, motion strike based on cause. So, adjourn number four one. Courts considered your responses. I will permit you to be excused based on a hardship given that you've already uh, paid for this planned trip, which is very likely to overlap with our trial schedule. So, we very much appreciate you coming in for your service today. Please drop your questionnaire off with the bailiff, and we will move on to our next juror. Thank you. I believe Juror 4 8 will come in next. All right, juror number 48, welcome back to the courtroom. We're going to conduct some additional individual voir dire with you at this time. <clears throat> um, I'm going to have some questions related to your questionnaire responses, and I'll start there, uh, noting that we are in the process of obtaining jurors who are impartial without any uh, knowledge of the case, which would impact your ability to be fair and fully consider only the evidence here presented at trial. So in response to your questionnaire on page 15, um, the question was, uh, well, you've indicated you followed the cases in the media. There's a question, has that caused you to already form an opinion regarding the guilt or innocence of Chad Guy Daybell in this case, your answer was yes. If he didn't participate, then he did nothing to prevent what happened. And so I guess beginning there, I'd just like to inquire, do you believe you've already formed some type of opinion potentially regarding the guilt of the defendant here? Yes. And would your opinion be different than uh, presumed innocent at this point? Uh, presumed is the word where I get hung up. And I guess what I'm wondering is, uh, would you think that you're going to require some evidence to maybe overcome the opinion you've already made? Yes. And is the opinion you've made one that you believe the defendant maybe or is guilty? You're asking if that's my opinion? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's my opinion. All right. Um, briefly, then, I I think there's a, a bias here very concerning that the state would like to ask me follow-up questions. I'll begin there and then see if the defense wishes to as well. Thank you, Your Honor. I do have a few follow-up questions. Okay. Um, juror 48, uh, you filled out this questionnaire last week. Right. Is that right? Yes. And I know there's a lot of questions on it. It's, it's a lengthy questionnaire. And some of the questions you may have noticed kind of uh, restate or at rest for some of the same information. Um, I noticed when you filled this out, you indicated that you have served on a jury before. Yes. And do you recall that experience? Yes. And it was a little bit different because it was a civil case. Correct. Do you feel that you were able to carry out your duties in that, on that yes. jury? And on this questionnaire, I also notice um, there's a section, and, and you might recall it, and I think they gave you your questionnaire, and I believe it's page 11. It had a one to five rating system, and one was strongly agree, two was agree, and there's quite a few of them, but I notice on there that when it said, I would review all the evidence before I make a decision in this case, you'd indicated a two for agree, and I would listen to all the evidence before I make a decision. You also have done a two for agree. 
would that still be accurate today that you feel you would listen and review all the evidence before making a final decision? Yes. I, I'm, I should state I'm naturally very curious and analytical to a fault. So. No, that is fair. And I appreciate that information. Um, and then we've gotten down to the section that the judge was going over with you on the media. And you did indicate that you have seen some media on this and you've talked to some people from out of state. Um, but I also noted when the question came up of, do you have any knowledge of Chad Daybell that would keep you from acting impartially? You'd indicated no. On knowledge of, do you have any knowledge of Chad Daybell that would cause you to give either greater or lesser weight to any statement? You'd also indicated no. Um, would those still be accurate today? Still accurate. And then I think where the judge had talked about was there was a question if you'd formed an opinion of guilt or innocence, and your response was yes, if he didn't participate, then he did nothing to prevent what happened. Um, but then it went on to ask you, would you be able to put out of your mind what you have read or heard and act impartial? And you indicated that you could put it out of your mind. And I know the judge just asked you today if you've got this presumption of guilt, but we also had talked about earlier in board dire the, the recipe and being given instructions. If you were given an instruction to put out of your mind anything you'd heard before and only weigh the evidence and information presented in this trial, in this case, do you feel that you would be able to do that? Yes, I could. Your Honor, given that, the state um, would ask to have him remain on. Okay. Um, let me ask. The defense at this point, for Dyer, Mr. Pryor, on the issue of bias. And so again, I think I, when I spoke to all of you, I told you there's nobody by the law. We're all absolutely entitled. You would agree, right? Agreed. And as an analytical person, um, based on the information you have at the present time, you're going into the situation with some concerns about this case, correct? I wouldn't use the word concern. Sorry. No, that's okay. What word would you use? Did you turn on your microphone, Ms. Pryor? I did, Judge. Thank you again, technologically, I yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, I, you know, as I stated, um, I read every day. I do have an opinion. Um, I did try to be as honest as, and to the point as I can be. So no, I'm not concerned. Just Neutral is the best word other than I do have opinion. Okay. And as part of that opinion, um, the questionnaire, and I'm, I'm looking at uh, page 19, and it's about the middle of the questionnaire, and it says under item D, has any of you possible exposure to news reporting, dramatized depictions, or other publicity around the case form an opinion about Chad Daigle's guilt or innocence? And you said yes. And then you responded, I believe that Chad Daybell is a weak character. Yes. So when the judge inquired of you that whether or not you formed an opinion, um, and the prosecutor touched on this a little bit, um, you answered the judge's questions, and I have absolute belief you're being completely honest. And at this point, Judge, I have the belief that uh, not only is he a weak character, but I, I, I tend to believe that he may be guilty. But I'll go and I'll review all the evidence before I make that final determination. Is that fair? Fair. And is it fair to say that before you make that final determination, right now, you say, listen, I'm leaning towards the fact that I probably believe that he's guilty. But before, again, I make that final determination, um, I'm going to give both sides a chance. But at this point, I, I, he's a weak character, and I think he's probably guilty. Would that be a fair statement? Almost. Okay, please clarify that for me then. Well, I would have to hear the instructions from the court. Okay. To find guilt and the charges. Okay, but at this point, your your position is, is the weak character and guilty, but I'm going to listen to the instructions and I'm going to look at all the evidence. Would that be fair? Yes. Thank you, Judge. I have nothing else. I'm going to move for pause, Judge. All right. Uh, Consider the Strike for cause request made by the defense as to juror number 48, uh, juror number 48. This is precisely the reason we have this individual section of questioning so we can discuss this, uh, frankly, with you without the other jurors' presence there. Uh, the court having considered the responses here and concern there's been a 
improper shifting of the burden that's supported to the defendant on a presumption of innocence based on pretrial publicity in this case. With this particular juror, for that reason, I am going to grant the motion to strike. So juror number four, eight, that will conclude your jury service. And we appreciate you coming in today and taking your time as well as last week. You can be excused with the thanks of the court. Please leave your questionnaire with the bailiff and we'll have our next juror brought in for questioning. All right, I believe next up will be juror 56. All right, thank you for returning. This is juror number five, six. At this time, we're going to conduct individual for dire, beginning with the issue of uh, potential bias. There wasn't really expressed anything in here relating to hardship. So let's start there. Uh, let me just ask your number 56. You've been provided a copy of the questionnaire you completed last week. To your uh, Best of your recollection, are all of your responses in there still accurate and true today? Yes. Okay. I'll let the state inquire first as it relates to any potential bias here, and then we'll move on to the defense. Um, this is going for the state this time. I will, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Wood. Thank you, Juror 56. Thank you for being here. Um, I noticed on page seven of your questioning, you have a bachelor's degree in religion. Yeah. Um, so this case does have some religious elements involved. In, are you, if, if the defendant has religious beliefs different than you, is that going to sway your opinion in any way? No. You, and you can you can commit to that that you're not going to judge him based on religious beliefs. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, think I'm... I can commit to that. Mm -hmm. Um, it looked like in your questionnaire you have some some news from I think you say Idaho News apps and CNN. Uh, how how much news have you seen in regards to this case? That's hard to quantify. Um, I have seen um, like articles here and there from the case. I don't watch the news um, and I don't get on news apps regularly. Um, so I recall um, seeing something about it pretty early on. I recall seeing something about um, the arrest in Hawaii. Um, I recall seeing something about um, the search for their children's bodies, um, but I I make it a point to avoid the news, and so it's not something that I do on a regular basis. And then I certainly didn't follow I don't follow any cases intentionally. And so it's fair to say, in this case, you have not actively followed actively followed the news in the case, correct? Um, I did want to speak with you about one of your responses on page 19. Um, it's in response to question 10 to F. And the question is, if you formed any personal opinions whatsoever based on information from any source of Chad Bebo's guilt or any innocence of anything. And you said, I do recall a sense of 
quote, he probably did it, unquote. Um, tell us about that. How, how deep of a conviction is that? It's certainly not a deep conviction. I do, that was my brutal honesty. I do recall that. Um, I don't recall what it was that brought that sense. Um, I think that was just a, a probably happened and then moved on. Um, that's certainly something that I can actively set aside um, practicing neutrality. So, yeah, I did notice in Tan E, uh, when it asks if you're able to put something out, put what you do know about the case out of your mind and render an impartial verdict, verdict based solely upon the evidence in the courtroom, you said yes. And you say, I believe so. So, we, we talked earlier about blind that way. Like, it is, can you commit completely that you will set aside anything you've known about this case uh, and render that impartial verdict? Yes, I, I believe I can. I believe it would be a good way to practice of, um, you know, bringing yourself to kind of recommitting that every day to um, keeping your focus on the evidence before you and um, I think that um, bias is something that is easy to say you don't have, but it's like rarely the case that somebody doesn't have some sort of bias. And so I see it um, professionally as well as something that I intentionally practice on a daily basis as an intentionality. And you you do understand that um, but this defendant doesn't have to prove anything to you, correct? Correct. And that it's completely the burden of the state to prove his guilt. Uh, no further questions, Your Honor. All right. Uh, on that topic, then, Mr. Pryor. Thank you. And, ma'am, you mentioned your occupation. That's correct. And you work with the uh, a program of young children and have probably issues, and you interview them to make assessments. That's correct. Um, and well, can I clarify that? Oh, absolutely. Partially. Yes. It's correct that I interview um, young children. Um, however, it's not my job to, to form an assessment of any sort. I simply report what was um, disclosed to me. In, in more of a law enforcement capacity. It's not necessarily law enforcement, but in terms of what law enforcement should be doing rather than taking a position, you're just reporting facts. Would that be fair? Right, and for medical purposes. So. Um, and obviously, one of the concerns that came up to me, my listening, and again, there's, I think I spoke to you folks before and said there's no wrong answer, there's no right answer. There isn't. We're just all trying to, and it's a horrible thing to have to go through this. But um, one of the concerns I have is that two of the victims are, are children. And um, when I read your profile, I, I assumed that you would suggest to seem very analytical and when I realized you're a forensic interviewer I realized so oh, that's why it's very analytical. Um, one of the concerns I have is that um, I'm not always able to discipline myself to stay focused on the task at hand. And when you say it's going to be a struggle or it's going to have to be something I'm going to have to work on every day to not allow that bias to creep in what that's kind of telling me, and then if I'm being honest with myself, I, I agree with you. It's a, it's a struggle. And when you have bias or you feel like you've already made a decision, it, it can be difficult when you're going into a matter saying, listen, yes, I believe this is what happened here. I believe this is what's going on. And that's really what you said, if we're being fair, correct? Sorry. <laughs> Okay. What what part were you saying that well, I about said? forming an opinion? You probably did it. You 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 formed the opinion, and you said yes. I have formed an opinion. And that's fair, correct? I wouldn't call that forming an opinion. I, it was a kind of a fleeting thought at the time that I recall having when when I first saw the news. Okay. But it's not something that I 
formulated. It's not something I've pondered or thought about okay. or, or you know followed. And, and that's why we're talking about this because I, I want to make sure that at the present time you haven't formed an opinion about whether there's guilt or innocence here, correct? No, I certainly have not. And it is extremely important to me personally and to in my profession to re remain neutral and to do have evidence before you. So when I say that it's a daily practice, it's not because it's a struggle, it's because it's a proactive practice of neutrality. Um, so it's it's because neutrality is so important that I come to it every day and you know before every interview and consider you know the potentials on both sides. Okay. And I and you know I really appreciate you taking the time to explain that because it, it, it sort of explains your answers gives me the opportunity to hear from you when you're saying, listen, this is really what I mean by this, because you can imagine you get a piece of paper and blanks that you're crossing off. And I imagine you've been through the same thing and say, wait a minute, this doesn't really explain how I feel about it. But here today, I, I think I have a better understanding of anything. I want to thank you. I appreciate you taking the time to educate me. Judge, that's all I have. Thank you. Bro. All right. Thank you. Uh, next issue I'll get into with uh, juror number 56 here then is going to be on the section of your questionnaire you filled out on page 12 called the attitudes regarding the death penalty. Uh, juror 56, do you recall filling out those responses in the questionnaire? I do. Okay. And are those still true and accurate to the best of your knowledge? They are. Uh, I did want to just... Um, Take a look at a couple of responses again. We're just trying to ascertain for sure your opinions here. On a question, do you support or oppose the death penalty? Do you check the box support? I notice on the general attitudes part, which gave you some multiple choice, pick the one you like best. Um, the, you said you were generally opposed to the death penalty. So, um, in answering that question, would you would you say you support or oppose, or is it a more complicated answer than that for you? I do think it's more complicated. Um, I didn't, I kind of noticed that this on uh, number six, that the answers were sort of organized in a spectrum. Um, and I just felt that the one above, I generally favor the death penalty, um, was not accurate at that gave me the sense of, oh, in a lot of cases, I would favor the death penalty, and that's certainly not the case. Um, and that's why I chose D over C. All right, well, I'm, I am going to advise you that um, it may be necessary for you to make a determination in regard to the imposition of the death penalty or some other penalty in this case. So um, with that in mind, if you are generally opposed to it. Going back to your response, part B, and again, this is somebody else's statement, not yours, but you agreed with this, um, as you mentioned on the spectrum answer. I am generally opposed to the death penalty, but I believe I can put aside my feelings against the death penalty and impose it if it is called for by the facts law and instructions in the case. So these Still think that best represents your position on the death penalty? I think it does. Um, I guess the way I'm reading it, um, I should just clarify when I was thinking, I generally favor the death penalty. I was thinking about that broadly in a lot of different cases. Um, if I were to think about it more narrowly, um, just because I, I don't, I'm not well versed in the law around the death penalty. I don't know when it's even a possibility in a case. I assume that it's only on the table in more extreme cases. Um, so I think that's why I, I wasn't sure how to answer. Um, if, if the death penalty were on the table in, in a great variety of cases, then I would continue to be opposed to it in general. But if it's used sparingly and for more extreme crimes, then um, then I I would be in support. Okay. 
the, the question I will have then is this, if I were to instruct you in this case, that you are to consider the death penalty, will you be able to follow my instructions and consider the penalty of death? Sorry. All right, so are you representing here that you would be able to set aside your own views and follow that law and instruction if it were provided to you in this case? Yes. Okay, that will conclude the court's more dire portion of that for this juror. I'll allow the state any follow-up questions. Thank you, Your Honor. The state doesn't have any follow-up questions. All right, from the defense. And ma'am, um, you mentioned um, use sparingly. Could you clarify that a little bit? What do you mean by use sparingly? Uh, I think I wrote it right um, in the previous questions that I don't I don't know data on it, but I'm aware that Idaho hasn't executed in a very long time. Um, so I would consider that. Okay. okay, and when you made the comment that uh, extreme cases, does that mean that in a situation where, and, and um, nothing I say isn't to imply that Mr. Daybell's guilty, right? We're talking about this because we have to. Uh, but uh, if the death penalty is one of the options in a murder case like this, does that mean if you find Mr. Daybell guilty, does that immediately mean you go to the death penalty and that will be your vote? Does that mean how you support it or is it different? No, I just meant that um, I, I certainly, those are two very separate decisions. Um, I just meant in extreme cases such as um, uh, in regard to the crime itself, obviously I wouldn't support the death penalty for a burglary case. Um, but does it mean that your vote would automatically be the death penalty if someone was convicted of murder? No, those are very different decisions. Right. And when you say extreme cases, uh, you know, you've heard the name uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. I have. A serial killer. That's an extreme case, right? I, I would, when I say extreme, I, I'm referring to murder. Okay. So murder in general is an extreme case. Yes. And again, and, and that is your vote on no, it. Sorry, let me clarify. I, okay. Murder happens in so many different ways and so many different, you know, circumstances that I, I'm not saying that in all murder cases, I think the death penalty would be appropriate. Okay. But I am saying that it, I would support it being considered. That's what I'm, when that's where I was trying to get you at, is I was trying to clarify your position a little bit. Again, I want to repeat, there's no right or wrong answer. I'm just trying to understand. And again, in this context, you've, you've clarified a number of your positions. You said, well, this is why I clarified that. And that's why we do this. The court is kind enough to allow us to go through this because we're trying to clarify it. If I understand your position, and please correct me, is that um, just because there's a murder doesn't automatically mean it's going to be the death penalty. If there's a murder, I'm going to look at the facts I'm going to look at whatever evidence and make a determination based on what the court tells me are my options in that case. Would that be fair? Yes. So, and please forgive me, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. That sounds like a very neutral position. Would it be fair that you're very neutral on the death penalty? I, I think so. I think that's why I struggled in picking between C and D on number six. Okay, and that's what I was trying to clarify. I, I was just trying to understand it, and, and uh, I appreciate that you're going through this. I really do, and, and thank you for all of your answers. Judge, that's all I have. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Uh, juror 5-6, then, that concludes the board dire portion individually. You can go ahead and I'll have the bailiff escort you back to the jury room, and we will call up our next for individual questioning here at number 121. At some point, council will talk about scheduling, but I do want to get through this group of individual for Dyer uh, with the next, and then we'll discuss where, where we stand because we've got another big up to come in here in 15 minutes, and I presume everybody probably needs some lunch.
All right, thank you for returning juror number 121. This is the time we're going to conduct some individual voir dire examination, uh, beginning with the issue of bias. We've also got a request you had on here regarding a potential uh, hardship, but let's start with the questions of bias. I'll have a few questions and then I'll allow the state and the defense. Uh, in particular, it appears you've been exposed to some pretrial publicity on this case. You may have some opinion at this point regarding the guilt or innocence of the defendant, in this case, Mr. Daybell. So um, just to begin, are the responses you put in your questionnaire still true and accurate? Yes. Okay. I know uh, you answered one question uh, about whether you formed an opinion and you said, quote, it seemed like he was guilty from that info. And then on another page, uh, you also said, I did think that he was guilty. Um, I'd like to just go into those topics with you if I could. Is that still the way you feel today? Yes. Okay, as you sit here today, we instruct every juror in every case that a defendant is presumed innocent and only to be tried on the facts of the case. Uh, am I correct in understanding that you, based on information you already know, uh, maybe do not believe the defendant is innocent as he sits here today? Well, I don't know. I feel like more what I was saying on the questionnaire was that obviously I never thought that I would be on this jury, so I was more, you know, reading an article as, and then just being like, oh, dang. Um, but I do, I feel like through our conversation today, I do understand that you would have to be in the portion. Okay. I will allow the state to conduct some more dire on that issue of bias then, and then we'll allow the defense as well. So we will be doing this one for the state. That would be me, Your Honor. Okay, Ms. Beatty, go ahead. Thank you. Hi. So you had mentioned in your questionnaire that you had read articles that detailed the alleged crimes in this case, and you were aware of when uh, the bodies of the two children were found, and that at some time you learned about uh, Tamara Daybell as well. And uh, as the judge mentioned, uh, you concluded from reading those articles that he seemed guilty at the time. Um, and I think you also indicated on your questionnaire that you think that you could set that aside. I think so, yeah. Are you sure? Yes, I okay. think that I understand the responsibility. Okay. Do you think that you would be able to, uh, because our system requires that all of our jurors go into this trial believing that the defendant, as he sits here today, is innocent until we, the prosecutors, meet our burden of proof? Um, can you commit to setting that aside or are you kind of on the fence like, oh, I'll try or I'll do my best? Um, are, are you able to get some certainty that you can set that aside? I, I feel like it's hard because I, I like I think I could if it was given the situation where I had to do this. I, I do think that I could be there. OK, um, I also just want to ask you briefly about uh, one other thing that we referenced on your questionnaire, which was a golf tournament that you're helping plan for work. Yeah. And that was on May 3rd. Yes. Uh, is that something that uh, somebody else at your work could take over those responsibilities for you or that you would be able to do uh, after court um, on that schedule outlined in the questionnaire where we recess at 3.30 every day? Yeah, I'm like the fundraising person for my job. Um, so it's not like I have a department. So like I would be the one planning this. I think I could do the planning, but it would be very difficult for the day to not have me there. Um, that being said, I, I think that I could probably rearrange to find some. And when you say the day of, is that on a weekend or is that on a Monday? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, I don't have any other questions at this time. Thank you. All right. Um, on the topics then of bias or hardship, Mr. Pryor, you can inquire. Before it burns afternoon now, isn't it? Um, you're the marketing director, is that right? Yes. Significant job. Um, what caused me some hesitation? And then, again, there's no wrong answer. I think I spoke too much about that earlier. So there's no I'm wrong sorry, answer. I'm, having I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? I'm sorry. There's no wrong answer. Um, I, I'm a little concerned about 
um, you being distracted um, when a week before May 3rd, a week after May 3rd, uh, on May 3rd, which is a Friday, uh, and that your focus is going to be you know, other things, and you could understand the magnitude. Uh, you put that on your, your questionnaire because it's a significant event. And would you agree with me that this would be a hardship for you to uh, have to be here and go through this process? Uh, and you may not be able to push that out of your head. It might be problematic. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. So in your mind, it's going to be a hardship for you to uh, to serve knowing these activities that you're primarily responsible for. Yes. And this isn't a, um, I'm very familiar with your organization. Um, I won't get into that, but um, there, it's not like heavily staffed. No, I'm the only person that does my job. So I would have to be like looking after it. So. Right, and that's going to be a distraction in itself. Is that fair? Sure, yeah. And then again, there there is no wrong answer. Everybody has a right to the opinion. I have an opinion. These um, four prosecutors apparently have an opinion. Uh, and you have an opinion. And um, when you said, I did think he was guilty, it's going to be a task for you to say, listen, you know where I'm going. It's, it's going to be a task for you to say, I've got to look beyond that. And I've got to remind myself regularly that he's not guilty and try to make a concerted effort in your own mind to look at the evidence impartially and without bias. It's not going to be just, you're not starting the slate with a, you know, that you're starting to sleep with a mindset that listen, I, I unfortunately I think he's guilty, and then I have to talk about this. We uh, we have to talk about this because it's it's part of the process. I don't think Mr. Daybell's guilty, and Mr. Daybell's here saying he's not. Um, but in your mind, you're going to have to make an effort to look beyond your personal feelings and focus on um, trying to be unbiased, trying to be impartial. Would that be fair? Yes. Okay. Judge, I'm going to move uh, for cause. And again, this is nothing personal or anything else. I just think that she has a hardship that she's going to focus, need to focus on, and and that uh, her opinion, although it's important, it, it just doesn't uh, uh, fit in this particular situation. Response from the state on the request to strike. Your Honor, we have no objection to excusing this juror. All right, uh, jury number one, two, one, mainly on an issue of, I think, some preconceived bias here. And again, uh, nothing personal. We all are entitled to follow the news and think what we think about it. But in this particular case, it would be best to have jurors without that exposure if possible, which is why we've got some more people through here as well. Uh, I am going to grant the motion for striking juror 121 for cause. That concludes your service. Thank you for coming in and please leave your questionnaire with Kayla. We'll next talk to juror 146.
All right, your juror 146, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, in this case, uh, on juror 146, looking at the questionnaire, there was some indication of case knowledge there. So I think you need to explore whether there's any frequency bias in the case by this juror. Uh, I don't see any listing of a hardship. So the state would like to inquire on bias. We can start there. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. <clears throat> And I just have a few questions for you today, so I know my voice. Um, I understood what the court just said that the use of the state of the hardships, but I did have one quick question because you didn't know to know it wouldn't be a hardship to be on the jury, but you put in the sense I do have five kids. What did you mean by that? I mean, I have five kids. I think I was more referring to the sequestering part if that ever had to happen, but I was just like to be able to check on my kids. Now, at the end of the day, that's something that happens. Okay, so your kids are of sufficient age that you could potentially serve for 10 weeks, so it wouldn't be an mm -hmm. Oh, I uh, try not to talk at the same time as each other so we get a clear record. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Um, and then I, I noticed, I believe in your questionnaire, <clears throat> I'm going to ask if you had information about the case. I think you noticed maybe some information from Facebook. Am I recalling that? Yeah, I've just seen things on Facebook over the last couple of years. Without getting into all the details of what you've learned about the case, how much information did you say the gauge that you have? A little bit of information? Do you feel like you don't fit? How much information do you feel like you've collected? I don't know very much. Just, just in passing, it's not like I've researched. So there's there would be no reason to think that whatever you've learned um, would impact your ability to be a marshal to listen to the evidence in the case. Absolutely. And then one last question on this topic. Um, if I recall correctly from your questionnaire, you work as a daycare worker. Mm -hmm. Do you own the daycare? Yeah. And uh, you don't feel like there's anything about your day to day work with children? Understanding the allegations of children who were killed here, that's not going to do anything to cause you to be uh, impartial. No. I'm sorry, a little less partial. No. You don't run on these kinds of questions. I don't have any other questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Rickson. Mr. Pryor. And Mr. Wixon brought that up. Um, it still always amazes me that someone could have five children and maintain even any kind of sane household. Uh, and then we know that uh, in your situation, uh, you have an entire scale of uh, children. Uh, my recollection is it's a, a, a four-year-old, a seven-year-old, a 13-year-old, a 16-year-old, and the last one's a 17 year old. Two kids in high school, one in middle school, one in grade school, and one getting ready to start school. And then you are a, um, you're running a daycare as well, and your husband's a landscaper. Um, please forgive me. I, I don't even know how you can stay awake, let alone anything else. I, I, that seems like an awful lot to me. It is a lot, but I, it's what I do. Are you, do you are, and what the concern is, is that I'm worried that you're, you may not be able to focus, you may not be able to, to spend the time, and that you're going to be worried about your children, and I'd be worried about my children too if I was in that situation. If I was worried about my children, I wouldn't be right now, and I would have said in the beginning, it's not something I'm comfortable doing. Okay, and that's why we're talking about this. I, I don't want to. There's no wrong answer. I just want to make sure how, um, because you, you, when I saw what you, you go through, I'm, I'm, frankly, I'm, I'm amazed that you're able to do all of that. 
one of the concerns, and Mr. Wixom brought this up, is that the uh, uh, you said that every night, if you had to be sequestered, you would need to be able to get on your phone and talk to your children to make sure that they're okay every night. Not necessarily talk to them, just, hey, everyone's home, everyone's good, hey, love you, bye. So it would be a situation where you just need to have some confirmation that let's say you were uh, sequestered for two weeks, or three weeks. Is that going to cause a hardship? Yeah. So you would be able to focus on this. Yeah. Okay, and ma'am, I thank you. I appreciate the answers. And please, please understand I have to ask this because I want to make sure that you're going to be able to, to focus on this. And this, I think, was a legitimate question. I, I think feel it was. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate your answers. All right. The next topic, uh, the court is going to address then here, juror 146. There was a section in your questionnaire, I'm sure you recall it, called Attitudes Regarding the Death Penalty. Do you remember working through that portion of the questionnaire and answering? Yes. Are the answers that you provided in that questionnaire still true and accurate today? Yes. All right. Um, one thing. Uh, I noted, well, I'll, I'll pass on that. It, it looks like you vacillated a little bit on do you support or oppose the death penalty. You said support, and then you also kind of checked the post and said depends on the crime. So um, there was another response you had, and it was uh, one that was on a list of choices, but it said, I generally favor the death penalty, but I would face a decision to impose it on the facts law and instructions in the case. Is that still the way you feel today? It is. Okay. Um, the court does need to advise you that it may be necessary for you to make a determination in this case in regard to the imposition of the death penalty or some other penalty. So with that comment you just made, uh, and you've indicated you would, in fact, follow the instructions provided by this court if that were required in this case. Is that correct? That is correct. Do you feel like you would um, always be in favor of the death penalty in every case where a murder was committed? Yeah. All right. So um, regardless of your current personal beliefs on the topic, is it correct for me to say that with your views on the death penalty, you would be willing to follow the court's instructions in this case, even if it involves an instruction that you consider that as a possible penalty here? Yes. All right, that concludes the court's line of questioning on that section. Was the state going to inquire? You know, I do just have a couple of questions. Okay. Yeah, do you have your question now? I do, yeah. Might be helpful. Why you might teach to page 12 questionnaire? I just didn't call your attention to the answer that you wrote down for paragraph one, question A. How do you feel about the death penalty? You made a couple of comments in explaining it, and I understood what you just explained to the judge. In the comments, you said that you feel like it's fair when it's appropriate, but there could be other ways to punish the offender. Could you just explain a little bit more about what you were trying to convey there? I was trying to convey that maybe if, the, if, if whoever was in the accused at the time had a mental instability or a mental problem, that they would benefit from being in a psychiatric hospital instead of being put to death or just put in jail for the rest of their life. Okay. So, <clears throat> is it still fair to say that you'd be willing to listen to whatever instructions the court gave you, consider whatever facts were put in front of you, and then simply apply the law to the facts and if those kinds of issues were to ever come up in the case? And that if, if under the facts in the law, not if some other alternative like that was an option, you you follow what the judge tells you would be the options for deciding what to do with death penalty. I would follow the law. You know, I don't think I have more questions. Sure, right. I don't have any questions. Thank you. 
Okay, thanks for coming in and answering additional questions in this section. Uh, I'll have you return to the jury room with the table, please, and then we will next call it juror 186. All right, juror number 186, thank you for returning for additional individual voir dire. Um, in reviewing the questionnaire, I don't really believe we had issues of bias to further discuss. And does the state have any voir dire and is it related to bias on this juror or hardship? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, from the defense? No, Your Honor. Okay. So, uh, juror number 186, there is one additional topic then the court will cover with you and that's regarding responses you had on section five of this questionnaire which is entitled attitudes regarding the death penalty and that's on page 12. do you recall thinking about those questions and answering those last week yes and is that still the way you feel about that topic yes all right, uh, I am going to advise you that it may be necessary for you to make a determination in this case in regard to the imposition of the death penalty or some other penalty. So you've indicated in here that generally you would support the death penalty. Is that still the way you feel today? That I support the death penalty? Yes. Yes. All right, on page 13 out of a list of choices, you circled C, which reads, I generally favor the death penalty, but I would base a decision to impose it on the facts, law, and instructions in the case. Do you still feel that way about uh, this topic? Yes. Okay. Uh, finally then, the question I would have is, um, do you believe that you would be in favor of the death penalty in every case where a murder has been committed. If they're guilty, yes. Okay. If you were not instructed uh, and it was a case that didn't include that, would you follow the law? Yes. All right. So going back to that part C, if that were something you had to consider in this case, would you commit to following any instructions the court gave you on that topic? Absolutely. And if that included a potential that the death penalty was not to be imposed, we would consider that as well. Absolutely. All right, that will conclude the court's line of questioning on that topic. Anything from the state? No questions from the state, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Pryor, and questions for Jury 186. Just to briefly, Judge. Um, and again, sir, I think I don't know what you're saying. There's no wrong answer. It really is effective. I, I I guess I got the impression that uh, I don't know why I got that number one questionnaire that um, if there was a murder and someone was convicted, you would automatically go out to death. No, I was not that if they're being tried for murder and it's a death penalty. Yes, I support it. Okay, yes is what I mean by that. Okay, so if if and, and I'm, this is in no way to imply that Mr. Daybell's guilty of anything. Correct. We have to ask these questions. Correct. I can appreciate that. Right? Yep. Um, if, in fact, there was a guilty verdict, 
um, are you predisposed based on your position to say, listen, I am um, I am predisposed or I believe that if there is a murder, uh, that it needs to be the death penalty, but I would be open to considering other options. But my initial instinct is if there is a murder here, um, it has to be the death penalty unless you convince me otherwise, or that I see something that gives me pause not to impose the death penalty. Would that be fair, sir? Yes. Okay. So in other words, at this point, your position is, and again, I want to re reiterate, no, nobody's answer is wrong. Correct. I mean, we run the gamut on this jury pool. I'm just trying to clarify, and you can appreciate that, right? Correct. Okay. So your position is simply that if uh, a person has been, uh, so I sit on the jury, if a person is found guilty of murder, my default position right off the bat is that I'm going to impose the death penalty. Unless, unless somebody gives me a reason not to impose the death penalty. I guess if they're being charged for murder and death penalty is, you know, if the state's seeking death penalty, then that's what I'm looking, that's what we're going for, right? Right. And that's what you're gonna do. So I'm going to take the take all the facts of the case into consideration before I decide anything. Okay, but before you decide anything, you're initially going to say, listen, I'm, I'm in favor of the death penalty, I'm going to vote for the death penalty, but you've got to show me something, either the prosecuting attorney or the defense attorney's got to show me something to not change my mind about imposition of the death penalty. Is that correct? Yes. Judge, uh, in all respect to you, sir, I'm going to move for cause. A uh, response from the state. Your Honor, may I ask some questions? Any of you would like to? You may. Thank you, Your Honor. Juror 186, um, I think on your questionnaire you marked C um, that you would potentially impose death, but you would consider other punishments. Correct. Is that still correct today? Yes. And we talked before about the recipe and following the court's instructions. Are you committed to following instructions given by the court? And would you weigh all evidence before making any decision as to guilt or any penalty? Yes. So your default really would be always to go to death. Would that be correct? Correct. Your default would be to follow the court's instruction and weigh the evidence. Yes. You'd be willing to impose death, but not default to that. Yes. Your Honor, I would object to the motion to strike for cause. All right, uh, the courts considered the responses here and the motion to strike. The issue the court's looking at is whether or not there's been presented an opinion that, uh, in this case, this juror's views on the death penalty would prevent or substantially impair his ability as a juror to perform his duty in accordance with the court's instructions and the oath. I do find that he's answered that he would follow the court's instructions such that uh, the Motion to strike is overruled. And so, juror number 186, that will include this section of the individual for Dyer. And I'll have you return to the jury room and we'll call up our next juror. Thank you. This will be juror number 219.
All right, welcome back to number, juror, uh, number 219. This is the individual board dire of this juror. The courts reviewed the questionnaire. There is some uh, indication potentially of some pretrial publicity, knowledge or information of the case. And there is not any indication of a hardship concern. So if the state would like to inquire on bias, we can begin there and then I'll hear from the defense. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Juror 219, in your questionnaire, it did say on page 18, uh, you've seen brief television coverage. That's correct. Um, is this coverage that you sought out or uh, that you just happened to see while you were watching TV? The library. Um, and have you intentionally followed this case in any way? No, I have not. And I noticed you didn't say you read about it online. Is that accurate? That's correct. Um, based on the, the amount of coverage you did see, um, it's, you claim you have not formed any opinion about the defendant's guilt or innocence, correct? That's correct. And is that still true today? That's correct. Uh, Your Honor, the state has no further questions about bias. All right, Mr. Pryor. Um, All right, thank you. Um, the topic then the court will discuss next, juror number 219. In your questionnaire, there was a section in there, part five, that was on page 12 where we started, but it was regarding your uh, attitudes about the death penalty. Do you remember reading through those questions and answering those questions? Yes, I do. Okay, and the responses you made to those questions, are those still true and accurate today? Yes, they are. All right, well, the court uh, will advise you here that it may be necessary for you to make a determination in regard to the imposition of the death penalty or some other penalty in this case. So with that in mind, you answered that uh, when asked if you support or oppose the death penalty, you indicated you support it. Is that correct? That's correct. And the next uh, question I would look at was when you were given a range of choices to select from that best describe your feelings about it, you answered one that was 6C, which says, quote, I generally favor the death penalty, but I would face a decision to impose it on the facts, law, and instructions in the case. Is that still the way you feel today? That's correct. Okay. And then finally, let me just inquire then, would you be in favor of the imposition of the death penalty as a punishment in every case where a murder has been committed? I believe that I would, I, I think the cases are individual and the decision to impose the death penalty would depend on the individual case. Okay, so if in this particular case, certain instructions were given, either that you had to consider it or were not to consider it, would you follow those instructions regardless? Yes, sir. Okay, so despite any personal view you may have, you would commit to following the court's instructions as they would relate to that portion of this case if that were to occur? Yes. All right, that will conclude the court's four dire on that topic with juror 219 and four dire from the state. Not at this time, Your Honor. From the defense. Yes, juror number 219. Microphone, please, Mr. Pryor. Thank you. Juror number 219. Uh, when I had all of you folks there, I talked about uh, there's no right or wrong answer. I repeat that almost every other word that comes in. And there is no right or wrong answer. It's everybody's individual person beliefs, right? Yes. And when the judge asked you um, in every murder case, 
would you impose the death penalty? Your answer was no, every case is individually different. That's correct. Is there a line on the types of cases where you say, you know, there is no uh, situation? I mean, um, for example, if we were in a, um, a war and there was a mass genocide and the soldiers decided to wipe a number of Americans out, that's obviously a very extreme case. Do you agree? I would agree that that's an extreme case. I believe what you're trying to get at is, you know, there's black and white and there's a whole lot of gray. Okay, that's really what I'm trying to get at. And there, when, it, when you're talking about the death penalty, whether to or not to impose it, it's that gray area there, correct? Yes. And when you look at your questionnaire, um, you mark number C. Did you contemplate possibly marking number D when you were going to mark that? I'm sorry, could you read that for me? Well, under number C on page 13, do you have your questionnaire with you? Yes, I do. Okay, and you circled number C. Did you circle that? I'm getting there. That's okay. We're, we're And your question is whether I considered. Did you consider C or D, or were you a pretty strong B? I would say pretty strong C. Okay. And again, is there a line that's drawn in terms of what is an automatic that prompts you to say, you know what, um, there's no discussion here, it's going to be the end. You know, before you make a decision, is there a, is there a line in the, uh, the sand that says, these are the cases that I absolutely have to impose the I don't have that line in mind. Okay. Are there cases that involve children that could potentially cause you to want to impose the death penalty? As I said before, there's a whole lot of gray. Okay. And that and that's and I appreciate it. Again, there's no right or wrong answer. Based on your questionnaire, I was just trying to clear up where your position was. Okay. Thank you. Yes. And thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Judge, I mean, else, thank you. All right, thank you. Your 219, that'll conclude the individual board dire. Uh, you'll return to the jury room, please, with the bailiff, and we will next bring in jury 321. Judge, I have 296. I'm sorry. All right, thank you. I was out of order there. It's 296. All right, welcome back for individual board dire juror number 296. Uh, I'll just allow the state to proceed and then the defense. There was some knowledge this juror had of this case potentially from media coverage. And she did address some concerns about uh, school classes, but I think those have been talked through. However, if you wish to inquire again, you may. So if the state is going to conduct this for our That would be me, Your Honor. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Hi. 
<laughs> so I want to just briefly um, follow back up on uh, your class schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, you had indicated on your questionnaire that you have the Monday, Wednesday class and that you would be able to take those classes online. Are you so you're sure that you'd be able to do that? Or I am not sure, but I believe I could because they are classes that are off. So they're hybrid. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what would happen if you were to learn that you weren't able to? to take those classes online? Would there be other accommodations that you could make to your schooling or? Uh, I believe I could withdraw from it. Okay. And would that cause you a hardship to have to withdraw from that course? No. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> I wanna talk briefly about media exposure in this case. So on your questionnaire, uh, you had mentioned that you had uh, seen the news, um, you'd seen some stuff on social media, Instagram, um, as well as some podcasts. Uh, which podcast did you listen to? Um, I don't think it was podcast. I think um, it was YouTube, but I've watched um, a couple different, like um, Danny Lee's. That's the only one that comes to mind that I watch, but I haven't watched or seen any of that probably in like a year. Okay. So, maybe okay. even longer. All right. I actually kind of forgot what's okay. going on. Okay. Uh, you had indicated that you have not uh, formed an opinion um, on uh, Mr. Gabel's guilt, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you did mention one thing, which is that you realize something could be affected. You understand that there's another, there could be more to this than what's in the, in the media. Yes. And you had indicated that you were unaware of Chad and his um, representatives or representations and views. Correct. Um, so one thing that you're going to be instructed during this trial is that uh, the state has the entire burden of proof and Mr. Gabo doesn't have to testify at all. Uh, is that something that would bother you? No. Okay. Are you comfortable with the fact that Mr. Gabo is entitled to a presumption of innocence until the state meets its burden of proof? Yes. Okay. Uh, and would you be able to set aside uh, what you have heard and, and read about in the media and uh, and start this case with a clean slate and listen to the evidence as it's presented and follow the court's instructions. Yes, I believe so. Thank you so much, ma'am. I have no further questions. All right, thank you. Ms. Beatty, Mr. Pryor. And you uh, can notice the remark on your questionnaire. Uh, microphone, Mr. Pryor. Thank you. It's good. It's been a lot hard lesson, I think. And I want to return, return you to uh, page 12 of your questionnaire if you would. Let me, are you there? Yes. And in the middle of the page, it, it, it has a comment that says, how do you feel about the death penalty? Do you see that? Mm -hmm. And then would you mind reading your response? I'm either for or against the death penalty. Okay, is that where, what your position is? Yes. Okay, so uh, when you marked on your questionnaire that you favor the death penalty, uh, with an explanation, you're, you're and I don't want to put words in it. Again, there's no right or wrong answer. We know that, right? There's no right or wrong yes. answer. Um, are you neutral on the death penalty or are you really in favor of the death penalty? Can you clarify for me? Um, I would say I'm neutral. I think it's a circumstantial situation. And, okay. Um, I can't say that I fully believe in the death penalty, but I also don't not believe in the death penalty. Okay, so and Mr. Pryor, on this point, uh, the court's going to go through a litany on the death penalty part of the questionnaire in a moment. If we could set that aside, and I don't know if you have any questions about bias or hardship before we go to that topic. Okay, and I apologize, Jim, I'm judging, jumping the gun. I don't have anything in terms of bias, Jeff. So I'll defer to you. Okay, thank you. So um, back to the topic then that Mr. Pryor was just addressing with you. You did complete and fill out a section of your questionnaire called attitudes regarding the death penalty. Do you recall that? Yes. And are the answers you listed in there still true and accurate today? Yes. All right. I am going to advise you that it may be necessary for you to make a determination in regard to the imposition of the death penalty or some other penalty in this case. And that's why we are delving into these questions at this time. You did. Uh, make that explanation just now on the record. So you are uh, what we call neutral on that. This part C you answered again on page 13. 
you had a list of choices about it and what you thought best represented how you feel. You said, I generally favor the death penalty, but would base a decision to impose it on the facts, law, and instructions in the case. Is that still what you think is your view of the death penalty today? For these statements, yes. Okay. If you uh, were required to consider that, do you believe that uh, the death penalty should be, would you be in favor of it in every case where a murder has been committed? Okay, so would you be willing to follow any instructions the court gave you in this case, including if that were an instruction that involved considering the death penalty as a punishment or another punishment? Yes. Okay, so would you be able to um, set aside any views you have uh, on the issue and follow the court's instructions, whether it was to consider that or not, the death penalty? Yes. Yeah. All right, that concludes the court's more dire question with this juror on that topic. Does the state have any questions on that? No, thank you, Your Honor. All right, and Ms. Pryor, you can return to your questioning on that as well. And Judge, I think she answered my questions. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, that'll conclude your individual board dire. You can be excused back to the jury room and should be getting more information shortly. And then we will have our next juror return here for individual 321. Will we inquire whether we're treating jurors for 21? Yes. Judge, in this one, I need to ask questions. I think it's staying on the record all the time. Questions from the commissioner. You know, the questions related to his responses on page 9, 7, and 8. And they're of a personal nature. I didn't know if these were of such a personal nature. Why don't you? I'm going to get into Sorry. All right. Uh, welcome back, Chair Number Three Twenty One. This is the time for some individual board dire questioning of this juror. Uh, juror number 321, I'll note we are, um, these proceedings, you're not being shown that you would have your responses heard on a broadcast of this. There are some uh, personal topics brought up in the questionnaire, and the prosecutor was questioning whether or not he would prefer to discuss those not in public, and I can stop the broadcast and excuse the public for that section. Um, generally, if you do you have a copy of your questionnaire there? Yes, I do. All right. The things you discuss on pages uh, seven, eight, and nine, I think particularly on page nine. Is that something you're comfortable discussing here in an open forum, or would you prefer to talk about that more in a private setting? So page nine, Your Honor. Yes. Uh, you could prefer to do it privately. Okay. Let's go ahead and do that then. Um, I, I'm considering we have two left here, maybe going on to 394, if we don't think that'll come up and then having 321 brought back in to conclude we could excuse the public and stop the broadcast to include this group. Any objection to changing the order like that? No objection. No objection. Okay, juror 321, you wouldn't have got to leave any sooner anyway. We're gonna swap you with juror 394 quickly and then we'll have you right back in here hopefully okay. in five minutes or so. Thank you.
All right, Jerry, 394, thank you for returning for individual voir dire. Uh, we had a few topics come up during the group voir dire, including uh, possibly some bias or hardship issues. And I'll just let the state inquire on either of those topics and then we'll move on to the next topic if we're still going. So this is going to be conducting that for the state. I will be, Your Honor. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Blake. I'm looking at your questionnaire. I think they gave you a copy of it. So it's just for your benefit as well. Um, I am on page 14, and it uh, is question two. It asks, what have you heard or what do you know about the defendant, Chad Guy Daybell? And your response was, you overheard some people in the jury summons room mention the case, but no details were given. And before today, you hadn't heard about the defendant. Is that accurate? Yeah. yeah. Really, no information is given. It's just and then it's what the procedure was. And that's the first time you'd heard of it? Actually, yes. Yeah. And then you did indicate that you possibly know a witness, but you're not even sure if it's if sure yeah, or just that the name sounds just familiar. The name sounds familiar, but there's really nothing there. Mm -hmm. So nothing about possibly knowing him that would cause you any concern? No. And then I know we've already gone over this with you, so I just want to double check. <clears throat> in the questionnaire on page 20 on the trial link, you had indicated that you have a vacation scheduled from Saturday, June 1st through Sunday, June 16th, and that you believed that would be week number 10. I think we talked a little bit today, and you indicated it's because it would include travel to and from. Is that correct? Yeah, it's actually uh, June 6th through 10th, but we need a couple days before and after to get out of So Get to and from? Yeah. And you were also asked before, so I just want to verify that this is accurate and that I heard you correctly, um, that if you were selected to sit on the jury, you would be able to do that and make the arrangements, and you felt you could do that and not be distracted by this uh, by the trip if you were late getting there or if you missed part of it. Yeah, I mean, if if we had to miss it, we just cancel um, if we got into it. So that'd be fun. Do you feel that if that if you were to run into that, because we're not sure how long the trial will go, but with that being a possibility, if you were to run into that, do you think you would be distracted or potentially hold it against the state or the defendant if you were trying to finish out the trial? No, I, I feel like this is important. So thank you for your. Answers. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. White. Mr. Pryor. I don't need to get into significant detail, but as far as this uh, vacation in Arkansas, and how long of a vacation is it? About two weeks off of work, but the actual time we have to be in Arkansas is about six days. And when you say you have to be in Arkansas, is that something that's a family gathering or it's a personal family? Gathering? It's a family reunion. Okay, yeah. A significant event. Uh, yeah, it's it's significant, but I also this is I've never done anything like this, and I feel like that's important as well. Okay, um, is it going to cause a distraction to you to miss this significant family event? No. Would you rather not go to it and need to do this instead? No. You'd rather go. I, I would rather go to it. Yeah, for sure. Okay. But I also know yeah. that I I mean I'm going to miss it for you as well. Right. So and and. In, for the most part, you're, you're being noble and you're saying, listen, I have to put aside my personal hardship to uh, attend it or to participate in this process, right? Correct. But your preference would be to go to Arkansas. Absolutely. And has that trip been paid for? Has there been money expended? Uh, yes, there is a down payment on the Airbnb, but that can be canceled. And, and you can be refunded that money? Yeah, by a certain date. Okay, is that date passed or is it still? It's still out there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Judge, I have I have nothing else. All right, thank you, counsel. Um, the next topic we'll address here with juror 394 relates to questions you answered 
as to your attitudes regarding the death penalty. Do you recall that section of the questionnaire? I do. And to the best of your recollection, are those true and accurate answers uh, in your questionnaire? Yes. All right, so the court will advise you that it may be necessary for you to make a determination in this case in regard to the imposition of the death penalty or some other penalty. So with that in mind, you indicated first uh, that you do support the death penalty. Is that still the way you feel today? Yes. And when you were given a choice of selections to describe how you felt about it, you circled on page 13, part C, which I understand are not necessarily your words, but what you said most accurately represents your feelings. Uh, you said, quote, I generally favor the death penalty, but I would base a decision to impose it on the facts law and instructions in the case. Uh, is that still an accurate representation of how you feel about that topic? Yes. Okay, uh, one more question then. Would you always be in favor of the death penalty in every case where a murder has been committed? No. Okay, so you would agree. Well, let, let me go ahead. Try that. I mean, I would be in favor if it was uh, the defendant was guilty of, of the crime. I was thinking in some some case where there's some kind of defense to it. Okay, so if you were given instructions as to when and if you would consider it, you would follow those instructions yes. regardless of your yes. views. Okay, and again, to be clear then, you're not saying you would think it's appropriate in every case regardless of instructions, only in cases where you were instructed to consider it? Can you rephrase that? Uh, so you wouldn't presume that it should always be the penalty in any murder case, you would follow directions or instructions as to this particular case. Yes. All right, well, that will concord, conclude the court section of or dire on that topic. Does the state have any questions about that? No questions on that topic, Your Honor, thank you. Mr. Pryor, any questions for this juror? Sir, I, I, again, everybody's answer is correct. Yeah, everybody's entitled to that. You really appreciate that, right? Yes. So when initially I heard you say that if there was a murder involved and there isn't a self-defense issue, or there isn't an insanity or something like that, you would be inclined to vote for the death penalty. Would that be fair? Yes. So aside from any kind of a defense, a legal defense, if it was a murder and a murder was committed, and, and you were given two choices. Uh, uh, murder has been proven, and, and this is not to imply Mr. Daybell's guilt or innocence today. I have to ask these questions. You can appreciate that, right? Yeah, for sure. Okay, thank you. Um, what I'm trying to suggest is that if there was a murder and there had been a conviction, and the, the jury had decided that there was a murder and there was a conviction and there was no defense issue of any kind, and the court gave you an instruction of life or the death penalty, you would be inclined to say, I'm going to vote for the death penalty. Would that be fair? Yes. So before you go into the jury box and decide what the fate would be, would it be fair that your uh, initial, in, uh, initial position and your start position is, listen, putting everything aside with a murder conviction, and I'm required to go back in a separate hearing and consider this, my starting spot is the death penalty, unless you tell me otherwise. Provide me some other reason why I should not impose the death penalty. Would that be fair, sir? My opinion is that it's a just penalty for murder. Okay. Um, so based on that, that would be my starting position. Okay, so you would start with the position that I'm going to impose the death penalty, and that that's it. And I saw that in your, in your questionnaire. And then again, everybody has the right to position. There's no wrong answers here. Uh, but your starting position is uh, the death penalty is a just penalty. The court's going to give me the option of life in prison or the death penalty. But because I personally believe that the death penalty is a just <coughs> punishment for, the, for someone who commits murder, my starting position is the death penalty. And then I will then consider whether or not 
I'm going to um, impose life in prison. That, what I said fair? Um, after rethinking it as you're as you're doing your explanation there, um, I guess I'm not set on that penalty. Um, if the court is suggesting either, right? Um, I'm not going to necessarily push for death penalty. I'm I'm very open to it. But if there's compelling reasons not, then life in prison is an option as well. Okay, but you're are you? I, I guess I got the impression. I don't want to. I don't drag this issue on. I got the impression that initially you said, "Listen, I'm my starting position is going to be the death penalty." But if there are other um, explanations or there's other evidence that um, I hear. I would consider changing my position on the death penalty if I were to hear evidence to give me a reason to do that. That's, would that be fair? That's correct. Um, and so thank you very much. And please forgive me. I'm trying to just clarify everybody's position. You can appreciate this uh, complicated issue. Yes. And Judge, I'm going to move to pause on this issue. All right. Response from the state. And Your Honor, I'm going to ask, to, um, ask some questions to rehabilitate. Go ahead. Thank you, Aaron. Um, you recall when we were in the group setting and we talked about a recipe and following the uh, the court instructions that will be given to the jury. Do you feel that uh, once you're given court instructions that you would be able to follow those and that you would in fact follow them? Yes. And so recognizing right now you haven't been given all the court instructions regarding the imposition of your finding of guilt and or the imposition of the death penalty. Once you were given those instructions, would you follow them? And so when we talk about um, your willingness to impose the death penalty, if you felt that was appropriate. Yes. Would you base that on all of the evidence that's presented in the trial in this matter in both a penalty, or excuse me, both the guilt and penalty phase? Yes. And do you feel that you would keep an open mind and accurately follow the court's instructions in making that decision in determining any penalty if it came to that point? Your Honor, with that information, I'm going to object to the motion to strike. Uh, very well. The court's considered that. Let me just inquire one last time then of this potential juror. Would you be willing to follow the court's instructions on this issue, uh, regardless of any personal view you have, or do you believe your personal view would somehow prevent you from or impair your ability to follow those instructions? I do with all those instructions. All right, the court uh, has considered the responses given by this juror. The court's going to overrule the motion to strike based on responses to that topic. And juror number uh, 394, you'll return to the jury room here briefly and bring your instructions. One other comment? Yes. I did check my employer and that there's no hardship uh, by being at that one. So there's a question before the comment. Okay, well, thank you for checking into that, volunteering that additional information. We'll note that for the note to the council. And then we'll return with juror number 321. Start off to see where we're at. All right, Council, with this juror, if there's any other topics we could hit first before we uh, close the broadcast and excuse the public, take those up. Judge, I want to deal a little bit more into the hardship. Okay. Does the state have any question on hardship or bias? Just a couple of questions at the end of the email. Okay, Juror 321, thank you for returning. Again, we'll have counsel go into questions relating to potential hardship or bias. After that, uh, we'll talk about the other matters off the record here, the privacy of this juror, Mr. Wixon. Thank you, Your Honor. Sir, as I recall, um, during the group, the selection process. It came out that you would uh, 
experience a lot of paid time if you're selected to be on the jury. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. And you, at that point, or at least as of this morning, have not been able to determine how much on paid time. Is that right? That's correct. I since messaged my HR. And I think you said that you were the sole provider for your family. Yes. Um, like my wife and I are currently separated, so she's working, but I'm head of my own household, but still contribute with everything that's going on here. So, so two, two households, two incomes, is that how that works? Correct, yes. Okay. So then as you sit there today, just on that factor alone, do you feel like with the information that you have as you sit there, that serving on this degree for 10 weeks would in fact be a hardship to you? It it would definitely it would definitely be somewhat of a hardship. I can definitely figure out more information from HR to determine how much of a hardship that could be. So, so are you leaving it open that if, if perhaps HR will confirm the, how much they may pay and if was it enough that you could still potentially serve without it being a hardship? Is that what you're saying? Yes, that's true. <clears throat> and I guess to clarify, um, as I've mentioned to other jurors, we're three point one week. We need to make a decision essentially now on this issue. Um, we don't necessarily have the luxury of finding out, and I, I understand it would be a difficult task. Um, but if if the answer comes back that it's more of a financial hardship than than less based on your HR policy, uh, if that were to occur, how would that impact your ability to pay attention and and be engaged in this trial and not be concerned about that the whole time. If I'm a part of this trial, it's not going to affect it at all. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that response. Uh, apologies for the interruptions, Mr. Woodson. If you have further questions, go on. Well, thank you. Um, and then I did just one more thing that had been uh, with you this morning. In your questionnaire, the one thing you didn't know about hardship was. You have several midweek trips planned to go to Oregon to watch your son play ball, right? Do you feel like with the question that occurred in the explanation, are you satisfied now that that won't be a hardship, or are you still concerned that potentially missing his gains or some of them will be a hardship? Um, like I was explaining before, there's always going to be other times to do it, um, so I wouldn't consider it a hard. I guess I guess it's kind of relevant to like my situation. It might be a hardship because I'd love to see my son play, but uh, in terms of being a real hardship on my, my life, no, I can't call it a hardship. Okay. Thank you for that. No, I don't have any more questions on these topics right now. All right, uh, Mr. Pryor. <laughs> and sir, I'm going to start with the baseball. How many children do you have? I have three. How long have you been watching your son play recently? Since I coached him when he was six or seven. And at this point, um, having, I'm somewhat familiar with college sports. And it's a unique opportunity for a young man to play baseball at the college level, is it? It is. And it's not that every member of a high school baseball team gets to play at a college level. It's a unique opportunity. Yes. Um, we don't know whether your son's going to play next year for sure. We think he is, right? Yes. And this is an opportunity. And when I talk about hardship with you, um, I don't want to talk about just that um, your life's going to end or it's going to be an emotion, it's going to be a terrible struggle and that you're not going to be able to overcome this. That's not necessarily the entire definition of hardship in my mind. It's also emotion. It's also um, understanding that you've raised a child from a very young age and you are his coach. And that this is a very unique opportunity. And some of these folks are talking about family reunions and their, their mother's um, birthdays and events where people have to spend time and, and important events in people's lives. And I can see, obviously, that has, this is having an impact on you because you truly want to watch your son play baseball. Is that fair? That's fair. And you want to be there. And, and in terms of, um, it may not be the end of your life. It may not cause you financial ruin. 
and you raise this child and you coach this child and you probably taught this child how to hit a baseball is that fair yes i don't know what position he plays i don't know all the facts but this is an important event would you agree with me to watch your son go out there and watch him play yes it, it's a moment and it's something that you really want to do as much as I can, obviously I'd have to travel there too. But you're you've already committed that you but you're going to. This isn't this isn't just a necessary. Well, if I can, I'll get over there. This is a situation where when you came in to sign up for jury duty, you said, "I'm you're not in your head. I have committed myself. I really want to see my son play baseball, and this is going to be an emotional hardship on me if I'm not permitted to watch my son play baseball." It may not ruin me financially. It may not cause me, you know, to lose my life or some other tremendous uh, situation. But if this is a significant event in my life, my son's life, would you agree with that? Uh, yes. No, in the interest of time, I would just object that this, this topic is being covered. Quite extensively at this point, we've got consistent answers which are already. Well, Judge, I, I have a right to revisit this and talk about those hardship hearings. Gentlemen, you know, I think I should be allowed to elaborate. <laughs> this is a hardship. Well, uh, I understand that, and I know the juror understands the situation and has thought about it. So, Mr. Pryor, let's just get to the point of whether or not this is going to rise to the level of a hardship where he would be unable to serve. And the point is this is. Uh, you would be able to serve, but in your mind, this is going to be an emotional hardship to have to serve, right? Can, can you break down that question for me, please? This is going to be an emotional hardship for you to serve. I'm not sure how to answer that because I deal with stuff all the time and I get through it. So okay. to me, hardship sounds, I understand what you're saying. I'm allowed to answer like this. I don't, I don't understand. I know what a hardship is. Yes, it's going to affect me most. I don't want to be there, but it's not a hardship. Okay. Thank you for your answers. All right. Uh, at this point, then, there are some additional topics the court's going to address. The service requested privacy, which the court will grant. So we're going to stop the live stream of the proceedings, and I'm going to have the public excused from the courtroom for further inquiry on Board Dyer with this particular juror. So if everybody would uh, allow for that for a moment, we'll go ahead and uh, take just a quick break to clear the courtroom and stop the proceeding, and then we'll continue right on with the sure. Well, I guess we're going to take a little break here and wait and let them have their sidebar meeting. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I was like, <laughs> let me turn my hair off. Oh, I couldn't hardly hear. <laughs> I was just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I could hear Judge Boyce, but what was he, what were they saying at the very end there? I'm, I'm not really sure what was going on. They, I think they were going to investigate privately that man's, whatever his uh, hardships were or something, but I'm not real sure. Oh, Lord. All right. <laughs> well, yeah, so we'll just. Uh, I think yeah, we're up to seven. I think we're up to seven, aren't we? Uh, Bun Tuski had shared, but I don't remember. Our, I don't remember already. And I didn't start it like a ding ding. Let's see. God, that was way back. Do you remember Fantasky? If you're still here, oh, let me scoop my microphone. Yeah, I didn't, I've already been rearranging. <laughs> like, I'm about to go cut some blinds. <laughs> so they've just been sitting in a box, and I'm like, yeah, I need to do that. So <laughs> I, I, I hate I was, being confined. Let's see. Um. Okay. Prior mm, asked if there's an emotional hardship. A man says he will get through it. Boy says additional topics will be discussed. 
uh, live stream will proceed and the public will leave the courtroom. So that's what's going on right now. Well, well, alrighty then. All right. Thank you. Yep. He's being dramatic. <laughs> he's being all nice. And it's, we're like, yeah, we know, <laughs> we know the real you. Okay. Fun to ski says eight so far. Thank you. Fun to ski. Oh, okay. Great. Eight. Yeah. Thank you so much. How many, I remember they, uh, fun to see it said how many men and how many women <laughs> oh good uh good attention to or you pay, you pay attention to detail which is good I usually do too but I just can't hear really well I know I wish I know people have, some people have been like you know you can't see very well you can't hear very well and I know it's the same but at least you know I feel like a beggar <laughs> we can't be choosy so it's a whole lot cheaper than traveling up there just to look at them. Mm. God, can you, like I said, can you imagine rolling over and waking up next to that? Oh, I think I'd opt out. But anyways, all right. Well, um, is he uh, never going to let those people have lunch? I don't know. I was like, dang, it's like three freaking, well, it's three o'clock central. Uh, so it's two o'clock there. Spring fever. He morning. must have. He must have drank an insure whenever that body break happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, then I need some insure. Damn it! <laughs> Holy hell! I'm just like I'm cooped up. <laughs> and so and thank all y'all for hanging with us. Yes, yeah, definitely. There's been a steady stream of 500 people in here the whole time. So. I really appreciate y'all. We appreciate y'all and y'all are being respectful and, you know, being, you know, contributing and, and just going back and forth with each other. And I really do appreciate that. So yeah, prior needs a drink prior with a prior, <laughs> right? <clears throat> oh, okay. Thank you, Angela. Five females, Five females, three, okay. Three men and one possible male. And that's the one that they just ended with. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Hi, Nancy Randall. I've been drinking Fields of Greenberry flavored. What is that? Uh, feeling really good. Got sick of just water too. Yeah, I'm not good with just water. Oh my gosh, I gotta put like lemon or something in it. Love you too, JKS mom. Yeah, I'm very thankful. Thank you so much. For sure, Janelle Murphy. <laughs> I know, I've never heard of it either, Ravina. Have they picked anyone yet? Mm. That's the five female. Well, there's eight. I guess that's they're picked, right? Or I don't know. I don't know how this goes. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't watch any of this with with Lori's. I didn't. I was traveling, and I think what they do is they get up to. I don't know whether it's thirty two or forty, whatever. The, I don't know what the number is, and then they. Uh, they allow them to strike. Each one of them gets to strike so many people for no reason at all. So I'm sure he'll be hunting oh, yeah, after yeah. the good, the mamas to strike I remember, them. I remember that now. <laughs> no, they pick in the end, Rombo says. Janelle, he said 18. All right. Y'all, y'all pay attention. <laughs> I'm too ADHD. I'm like, <laughs> I'm everywhere. Uh, Fundusky says they want 40 juries and then they will select 18 out of the 40. And then okay. are they going to do the same like what they did with Lori? How <clears throat> at the very end of the trial, they like juror number 18 actually was opted out. Uh, so he didn't actually, I guess, vote. I don't really know. <laughs> cast his judgment i think <laughs> they will at the at the very last they will cut the alternates uh yeah alternates, that won't yeah. get to deliver deliberate there's that lingo but i'm not <laughs> sure exactly how that's all gonna go if it's the death penalty is included i'm not sure what will happen then but. yeah i think kick rocks no i'm just picking i i mean I, <laughs> juror 18 said that you know he he was just like oh like he it, it bothered him I understand that. Can you imagine? Well, you can tell some of these people really want to do their duty. They yeah. really do. And that's so admirable. That's, good. that's really good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not the one. <laughs> you don't want me there. 
Oh, I'm all over the place, you know, in my head, just in my head alone. <laughs> Some backups. Yeah. What are they doing? I couldn't hear. They're taking a lunch. Finally, it's freaking almost the end of the damn day. <laughs> but I remember them like going through it really quickly last time, too. I mean, Judge Boyce runs his courtroom really well. Um, I think so. I mean, he there wasn't that long for a lunch. Like I didn't eat hardly the whole time I was there. Because, I mean, you got to have, a, I didn't have a vehicle, you know, and I'm just like, it's not that fast for me. I'm not from there. I'm slow. <laughs> so I'm too busy smoking cigarettes. I remember Whitney, um, the victim advocate. Oh, she's awesome. I love Whitney. But, you know, when the first break, she was like, you go and smoke. And I was like, you smoke? <laughs> Cause they're all Mormon. They don't smoke. Right. <laughs> so she brought me up to a balcony. I was like, Hey, Oh yeah. <laughs> but you'd go up there, smoke and like, I like to smoke too. Boom, boom. You know? <laughs> yeah. There wasn't enough time for that. <sighs> so I don't know. I don't like being cooped up. Oh, I'd have to give my daughter my phone and computers to keep me honest from the wondering. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't imagine going home to my spouse and not, uh, -uh. <laughs> we don't, I am a part of my spouse. <laughs> we are one, you know, like I'd have to, I'd have to defrag somewhere. Mm -mm. Can you imagine being just that charged up with all that information? Oh, wow. Actually, yes. Hmm. <laughs> Sue, he would have brought me food, <laughs> right? I mean, the like uh, the day that mom, you know, the first day mom testified, um, they had bought uh, all of us lunch, and so we went into a big boardroom. Hey, <laughs> look at the little bitty thing. Oh wait, Ooh. sit down, <laughs> Chad. Oh, hello. What the hell? Go to lunch. Wow. <laughs> Damn, no lunch for you. All right. We are back on the record on this case. Um, just so I match up and make sure I'm clear with the jerks who are still here, please raise your red cards. All right, thank you. All right, we've concluded for Dyer this particular group of jurors. These are jurors that would. Uh, in the court's mind, be passing on to peremptory strike uh, section of the trial. Let me inquire now, having confirmed who's returned here and to the board dyer. Um, does the state pass this group for cause? Yes, Your Honor. Does the defense pass this group for cause? Yes, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury here, then you have been passed for cause. We'll continue to question additional small groups until we reach the necessary number of jurors we need to exercise peremptory challenges. You'll be instructed to contact the jury commissioner, Randy Rutland, and he will give you further instructions on when you are going to be required to return. While you're waiting for that and in that interim, uh, if anything comes up you need to report to the court, you can do that. And in addition, please take every precaution to follow the admonition given before to not now go and research the case, look into the case, try to find out about the case. Don't talk about the facts or details of this case with anyone other than, of course, you can talk to friends, family, employers, et cetera, about the possibility of your 
service in this case is yours and make those arrangements, but otherwise the court will be requiring you to submit an affirmation under oath when you return that you have not gone and done any kind of additional investigation into the case, which could bias or taint you and cause us to lose the work we've done today. So uh, we very much appreciate your uh, service up to this point. You'll receive further instructions on when you will return for that next st stage of the proceedings. And with that in mind, that will conclude our full diary of this particular group. Um, before they're excused to report back at another time, anything further from the state? No, Your Honor, thank you. From the defense? No, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. All please rise for the jury. Did you come back this way? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, a little later than then, but we're going to take a lunch break at this time. Uh, We'll go off the record. We've got another group lined up. I'd like to very quickly meet with council just to discuss scheduling on our proposals to get restarted. And uh, we'll just do that here in the back hall briefly. Well, he was happy. Judge Boyce, y'all saw him. <laughs> he was all smiles. Oh, I'm sorry. Don, I didn't add you back in. Uh, let's see. Meow, hey. Oh, <laughs> wait. Oh, my gosh. I suck at this. I'm not good on the with the buttons, man. Okay. Now I have the group. Loud. I'm in. I'm back in, I think. Okay. Hashtag <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay. I'm like, why is it not moving? It's just being a little slow. So oh. they're going to come back after their sandwich, I guess. Yeah. I mean, they should. I don't see they why should. Not. They got to discuss scheduling. And well, they didn't say tomorrow. They said. Yeah. Let's see. Don't put off Lunch tomorrow. Break. Maybe today. <laughs> We'll have mom see the latest hearing, <clears throat> see the hearing latest where Pryor tried to get off this case and voice prevented it. Also pointing out a court appointed DP certified new lawyer would take one to two years longer before trial. True. Heck no, Nancy Randall. We're not from Utah. <laughs> <laughs> we are from, I'm from Louisiana. Donna's from Mississippi. And uh, Trace is from Arizona. Uh, detective's daughter is from Idaho, right there in Boise. And then um, uh, uh, Beach Bum is from Georgia. <laughs> and uh, Lil Brands is from Canada. So we're very diverse here. Mostly South, though. <laughs> South side. Where are y'all from? Yeah, Cal uh, Colorado. Awesome. You a Louisiana girl, huh? Allegedly innocent. <laughs> All right. I'm I'm with good people, good company. Um yeah. You always remind me of like how you bring up my Uncle Charles and stuff. Like when you were talking the other day about <clears throat> barbecue, a man, you know, Texas men and their barbecue. <laughs> right. Um, he had a Traeger grill, so he was very proud of his barbecue. <laughs> Oh, I miss my Uncle Charles. I miss all of them, but whew, this sucks. Oh, there's just always so much going on. I don't really think about it. <laughs> and then it'll just hit you and you're just like, wow, you know, you miss them. Yeah, defrag. <laughs> right? We all need to get up and move and do some ergonomics. And, and I remember when right here, Allegedly Innocent had showed how people um because we sit behind computer desks and on our phones all the time how we're going to eventually mold our bodies you know and it was pretty creepy i was like oh that's that's a little scary you know holding a mouse all day um looking down all day i mean i i know for sure i've damaged my back <laughs> my neck and all that from just being on my damn devices 
Yeah, the men barbecue and the women make banana pudding and strawberry shortcake. Louisiana people know how to eat good. Amen. Right? <laughs> yeah, it is weird. I didn't forget it. <laughs> it stuck in my head. <laughs> uh, I think about it a lot. But y'all have every kind of grill. Uh, we have every kind of grill or smoker. That's awesome. Let me know. Call me. <laughs> right? I won't be late for that. Hey, Heidi's mind. Uh, Heidi says, Chris, you need some earbuds. If I was to sit this long, I would sleep. <laughs> I have been doing laundry, working outside, starting uh, started mopping <laughs> and prepping supper. ADHD, right? Like I said, I've already like I already measured the blinds. I've already moved some things. Uh, I helped Jason unload the truck, you know, when he got back. <laughs> I've been moving. I went through my trash and that's what I do. I kind of nervous clean or I don't really know what to call that. I just, I don't know. I got to fidget and move around and, and rearrange stuff. <laughs> uh, like I used, like I always, uh, I went through a phase y'all. I, I swear to God, I'm autistic. <laughs> I'm on the damn spectrum. I swear. And, um, but like, I went through a phase where I had to have like markers and colors and like, not, not like that, but just, I had to like be my pencil colors and things like that to just kind of, uh, ground or reflect or just kind of divert, I guess what was going on in the case and everything. And, uh, anyway, so I would rearrange all my, my pencil colors and stuff. <laughs> Silly. Mm hmm. You colored. <laughs> right. Hey, we need some color sheets. Ooh, that would be cool. <laughs> we can have a coloring contest. What? <laughs> hey, if anybody wants um, any um, bracelets, bracelets, any justice bracelets, send your. Let, let me uh, let me go and put this. In my banners first that way i can just show you my email address um let me see if i already have it in here i don't think so nope all right hold on just a second mm, i can't tell you to send a self-addressed stamped envelope because mm, let's see how we can do this Send an email. We'll go from there. To okay, so there you go. Send an email to crushes zero one two three at gmail dot com if you would like justice bracelets. Um, yeah, I've got tons. Um, I may have to plan a trip to, wait, did I do this wrong? Okay, no. I may have to plan a trip. I talked to mom just now while they were talking and, um, uh, towards the end of April, um, Mom wants me to come up there. So don't really know the date yet, but we're just kind of, I don't know. She just kind of hit me with all this. So anyways, that'll be fun. <laughs> I was going to go May after May 19th, after Ashlyn's graduation. But I guess we're going to go a little sooner. Uh, it's culture there. It would be hard. Good for, good you found your place to be. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm like, what? Okay, well, just send, um, you know, send me an email and um, we'll go from there. Um, uh, I mean, you can, Teresa. It's not expected. Just if you feel compelled to, and, you know, it's more than welcome. It'll help. It'll help me get up to, uh, to Boise and, and back. And I, I don't know, y'all. It's such a weird thing, <clears throat> you know. With the, the whole, 
funding and all that. It's just weird. It's weird territory. And it's very uncomfortable. Um, but, I mean, it is what it is. It, the, the court doesn't pay my to and fro costs. So, hell, they don't even recognize me, you know? <laughs> it sucks. <laughs> Oh, actually, they did. They finally recognized me as a as a victim or whatever, as far as like, you know, letting me know whenever Lori moves from one place to another. Now, I guess I have to do it again for a chat. <laughs> That's weird. So weird. I'm not a victim. But anyways, let me go grab the PayPal link. Do you guys have it? Or actually, I think it's HTTP. Um, but yeah, I really don't know. Let me go grab it. All right. I'm going to at least play some music or something. I can't stand this. <laughs> it's too quiet. Um, let's see. We'll do this. We'll throw that up there. We'll loop it. And um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so weird. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is called Feeding the Ducks <laughs> in honor of Tammy, right? A little intermission. Okay, where's PayPal? Okay, here it is. I love the ducks. Right? I'm so glad the streaming has gone really smooth today. That's one thing I am grateful for. Especially when Vix Tech said it was Mercury, uh, Mercury Retrograde. I was like, oh shit. 224 Mountain Time. Thank, thank you, Detectives Delata. Uh, I just put the PayPal link in there, Teresa, and there it is again because I forgot to tell you. <laughs> Let me go set up a night bot for that. That way I can just let night bot do it. Just a, a night pod for it. Let's see if it works. Oh, thank you, Teresa. 
Thank you so much. Okay, I'll I'll check my emails at the end of the day. At the end of the day, I hate when I, <laughs> my mouth don't work. Sometimes, good beat for the ducks. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good song too. Mercury in retrograde by Sturgill Simpson. Whoa, I'll have to check it out. You guys have the best, <laughs> the best uh, comments. I swear. Do you know that one YouTuber that brings his duck anywhere in the U.S.? No, never heard of him. <laughs> they trace on the case, girl. Thank you. Oh, trace. <laughs> Oh, you are so appreciated. And you're so thoughtful. Thank you. Love you. <laughs> awesome. Oh, you guys are the best. <laughs> I don't know about the YouTuber that brings a duck anywhere. That's crazy. I can't imagine. Ain't nobody ducking around. <laughs> Right? The widow's might gets us through. Here, let me display that. I don't want to do it too long. <laughs> For years to come, you know, I don't want people to be like, oh my god. <laughs> oh, so appreciated and thoughtful. Thank you, Detective Daughter. The name is uh, Seductive. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. That's funny. What a good name. <laughs> I never would have thought of that. Oh my gosh. Seductive. <laughs> oh. 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 I wonder how many people follow Julie Rose still since all her followers were probably into Chad's fantasy. I want I wonder about their kids is all I wonder about. Uh, and their family members. Are they all uh, have any, have any of the family members died of suspicious under suspicious circumstances, you know? And life insurance policies, check them, you know. No, don't don't you dare, Bonnie Shaw. You are fine. We love you, Tall. We do. We just don't like their laws and their lawmen. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I think that I mean there's some good ones in there, but oh my god, you have to weed through a bunch of bad ones. Or corrupt ones, should I say. And um that's where to hit it, you know, like to change things as far as the Mormon aspect, in my opinion, is through Utah. Utah. <laughs> but Utah's beautiful and um, you know there's good people you guys are good people I don't ever want y'all to think that I'm not that close minded <laughs> uh, but we can rag and rave on it you know if we want to <laughs> 2.78 million subscribers subductive is getting it down <laughs> we haven't heard from any of Chad no I love a lot of people in Utah. Nothing is all bad. <laughs> nope. <laughs> no, we aren't the dark light ra uh, raiders, you know. I mean, people like us, you know, we know it's dark or we know it's... Even, even people that I criticize most, you know, I still feel a lot of empathy for those people. I really do. I may sound like I'm just harping, 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 and, and probably because I am, but <laughs> I'm just saying. I don't I don't wish any harm on anybody ever. The ducky ran the New York Marathon as a favorite. Oh my god. Yep, yep, Detective's Daughters from Taylorland. <laughs> I'll get to see you soon, Detective's Daughter. I'm so excited about that. So excited. Ready to go see how skinny you are. <laughs> God, I need to take some of my books home with me, right? 
goodness i have a whole freaking mormon library <laughs> don't let me yeah don't don't turn me loose at di okay it's not healthy <laughs> And books they're heavy you know <laughs> I didn't think that one through <sighs> oh. I guess once this comes back on I'll, I'll probably go in my room and just kind of lay down for a little bit but I'll I'll be right there at my desktop in my room. <laughs> Go digital, exactly. Precious cap. Oh, okay. I was like, what? Yes. Thank you, Trace. Um, let me go and put that in the banner so I can have all that. Um, let's see. Let me put my PayPal right here. I think I already have one. Let me see. I'm just talking out loud. Sorry. <laughs> There, there's that. Here it is. I think it's difficult research. Yeah, it is. There's those. Mm. Oh yeah, I want to go work on that merch. I need to share that design with you, Don. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> Alright, who can make up a whole wrap to this? <laughs> Dang, it shows that we still have 469 in chat. That's awesome. <laughs> I looked at uh, Nate Eaton earlier, uh, East Idaho News. They had 6,000 6, something. I was like, good lord. I don't like being in that big of a chat. <laughs> Everything just zooming by. I can't stand that. <laughs> Head spins. <laughs> Your husband wants to know what music you want to rip off, Crusher. <laughs> Like, rip off of me or rip off? <laughs> um, yeah, there is some freaky dicky stuff in there. Detective's daughter for show. Sure. All right, Lamisa. Don't drop the soap. <laughs> I had to. I mean, you walked right into that one. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Copycat. What does that mean, little brains? Little brands look straight up earlier. You know how you sent me that mercy stuff, the the soaks and everything, and the rubs and all that. Okay, well I never took everything completely out of the box, and so then I found the card. <laughs> straight up, first time. How long ago did you send me all this stuff? That's awesome, by the way. I I've used it today. Um, yeah, I was like, oh my god. <laughs> oh, shame on me. But thank you again. That was very very kind. I've not shared it with my parents, so uh, I guess I'll, I need to. Larry will really, he, he could benefit from it for sure. Thank you, Trace. Mm. Back to you, uh, Lamisa. Yeah, too many people, right? <laughs> It's confusing when the chat's just flying by, and I'm just like, is anybody even listening? <laughs> is anybody even reading the comments, or are they just popping off? <laughs> but if it ever gets too fast in here, just let me know. Um, I, I don't think I've ever done that during a live stream, but it's time to learn, right? That's why we're doing it this week. Um, 
that way we can kind of work out all the kinks and everything that the internet's been doing great i'm not trying to jinx myself <laughs> share with your family you're welcome share the love yes ma'am i appreciate it it works to boy with them restless legs and the restless leg syndrome it really works for that <laughs> love it you know larry used to or he might still but his dad taught him to to rub wd-40 like on your <laughs> on your store on your joints and stuff i mean i've done it <laughs> he got me to do it larry uses like some kind of horse lotion <laughs> because of the damn feed store okay i love that he's country no used i don't think chad is there <laughs> He's that zombie that he projected onto his alleged victims. I'm gonna say alleged because it's legal. <laughs> oh, you do? Uh, oh, yeah, we've talked about that. Um, I'll take a picture of it and send it to you, actually. Um, and I have some of the cards that came with it, Trace. It's called uh, Cloud Nine Naturally Mercy. Soothes in minutes. You put it, like, on the bottom of your foot and on your the back of your leg and stuff, and it really does ease it up fast but they have soaks and I think you can use the lotion on Jason's scars too if he's okay with that yeah cardboard chat <laughs> right zombie chat <laughs> your husband always wants horse shampoo I used to use that a long time ago uh, mane and tail or whatever the hell <laughs> my hair is so weird now because it's like thick but it's it's starting to not be as thick as it used to be <laughs> so i mean i have to say i'm just thankful that my eyebrows have have come back <laughs> and my eyelashes i'm not used to that i had uh it was may it was right before my birthday in 2019 before uncle charles and, and jj and tylee were murdered but i went outside that uh jason had just brought me home a brand new burn a barrel you know for me to burn stuff in and there was just droplets literal drops left in the bottom of a gas can and i freaking waved at the neighbor <laughs> i mean i feel like clark griswold straight up but waved at the neighbor and uh, you know poured a couple drops whatever you know it was just whatever was in the bottom of the damn uh gas can please don't do this at home and I just out lit my uh, my lighter and woo! <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Jason kept trying to like look at me and check me outside. I just kept walking. I went straight to my medication because I didn't want to freak out. <laughs> and I was burnt. Eyebrows, eyelashes, uh, probably singed my hair. It was not cool. Don't do that. Don't do what I do. But they're back <laughs> my uh, my brows are back my eyelashes are back <laughs> yeah i do some stupid stuff <laughs> and i mean I, I was a certified occupational safety specialist for a long time and i'm just like good god don't listen to me <laughs> do as i say not as i do <laughs> thank you stephanie that's so awesome. Thank you. Y'all have any ideas for, um, you know, some more icons or whatever? Also, um, I'm working on some, some little things for the live stream, right? <laughs> the safety man doing the unsafe things, right? <laughs> Straight up. All right, Nancy, you gotta come back, though. Book break. <laughs> yes, thank you, Stephanie. I wish I could offer more, but... Oh, your dog on your profile picture looks just like Ashlyn's, my little girl's. Um, oh, hell, what was his name? Oh, my God. If I wouldn't have put myself on the spot. <laughs> uh, Ranger was his name. Is his name. Yeah, I'm a hyper-ass dog. <laughs> icons the kids okay yeah good idea and tammy yeah 
Um, all of them. <laughs> you know I can't do that. I got to put them all together. But yeah. I use Watkins liniment when I get really bad stress and tension knots. And on joints, it's highly flammable. Oh my God. Removes paint. Oh my God. And varnish. But it works wonders. <laughs> oh, my granddad used it for years. I love old people advice and wives sales and like all the the home remedies and stuff my papa trehan he used to talk about salmon salve like he he swore it could cure cancer probably i'm just saying i'm being facetious but it, you know what i mean that and dr tishner's y'all I, I, we could gargle with it we could um and you could also my grandma would have me um wash her kitchen cabinets with it like you know the every spring cleaning kind of thing you know you wash the damn walls with it oh my good lord but it kills the good you know germs as, as well as the bad ones so dr tishner's is not that great for gargling and stuff salt water is warm salt water cbd cream yeah i use on the shoulder see jason believes by that and it doesn't work too well for me unless it's just in my head <laughs> Yes, TC. He's like a deer in headlights. Yep. Mm-hmm. I know. It's good to see you, Heidi's mind. So glad you're here. <laughs> it's so good to see all, all, uh, all, all your faces that have been here, you know, even on and off. I get it, you know. I know you've got a job and you've been working, so just glad you're here. Happy Easter to everybody that, you know, celebrates that. April Fools, right? KJ, boy, she got me earlier. She got us all. <laughs> She's gonna be a grandma. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> Shame on you, girl. <laughs> um, hey, all. KJ has a notification for a skit later. Hmm. Do you know what time? Or how many hours? Or She's gonna be doing a lot of letting off steam. <laughs> Oh, y'all, just think, she sat at her computer every damn day of the trial, of Lori's trial, and she was keeping up with the tweets, and boy, I mean, she had like 1,200 people, uh, you know, one time, no mods, just killing it, <laughs> like, you go, girl, uh, I'm doing okay, both of you, thank you for checking, I appreciate you, appreciate you for that. Jason should try Dupixin. It only took me two injections to cure my allergies, asthma, and polyps. Huh. What else would that be for? He doesn't have allergies or asthma. I don't, what's the polyps thing? Polyps. Like his throat stuff? Opening up another cannibal pass. <laughs> 6 p.m. your time Pacific. Or Canada. I guess, yeah. Canada? <laughs> okay, so... Well, thank you for sharing that with us. KJ did such a great job. Yes, yeah, she did. No mods. Everybody just in there hitting and getting it. <laughs> yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, poor Mr. Wayne, though, right? <laughs> I feel for him sometimes. I'm like, poor thing. <laughs> it's like playing dress up. I used to do that with my brother, though. <laughs> Oh, and I wonder which, why, you know, why he has the issues he has. It's probably because I, I tormented it. I tormented my brother, you know. Oh, well. It was love. Uh, you were right there with her? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. He is a good sport. <laughs> They're good people, man. They really are. Yes. They're on break right now. <clears throat> They're letting Chad lick a cracker. <laughs> yes. He might move. Uh, he's so enraging, huh? <laughs> Who's mad? Yeah, JoJo says, Mr. Wayne has made me laugh harder than anyone in my life. He's the best sport. <laughs> He's got such a gentle and good heart, though. You know? He is a good sport. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Nate almost. Yeah. 
Nate had a little incident. That's what Donna was telling me. I guess I missed that part of when he shared that in his uh, video. Yes, I do too. I love the music she plays too. KJ. <laughs> Y'all remember when she had the chipmunk in her house? <laughs> Oh my gosh. I had a bird that made a nest, y'all, about a couple weeks ago. I'd open up my back door, you know, just to kind of let some of that fresh air come in. And there was a bird that kept coming in. And I was like, well, you know, I mean, I get it. I was like, oh, and I was like, I, you know, maybe nature's coming in here because I don't go out there. Anyways, it kept going in and out, in and out, in and out. And then I went to go grab a Tide Pod or a Game Pod to put in my washer and I was like, oh, God, there's a nest. <laughs> and it was a big old nest. There were no eggs in it. But, oh, my God, you know? Wow. He'd almost gotten into a little incident. Or he, like, slid on his trip to Boise. Nate did. I believe that's how it went. I don't know. I'm telling you, like, second, third hand here. So, ran off the road. But he's Okay. Again, I don't see eye to eye with Nate, but I definitely don't want anything bad to happen to anybody, you know, especially him. Yeah, <laughs> which wig? <laughs> like Lori did her hair? Yes, 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 yes. Oh my God, how a black bear cross my yard? Oh no, <laughs> old black bear. Oh good, I'm glad to hear that, Heidi. Uh, finally getting diagnosis and insurance approval for much needed therapy from a kindergartner. ASD, ADHD, got some amazing news about my mom's cancer. Good. I'm so glad to hear that. We're so glad to hear that. So glad to hear that. I remember whenever, didn't that come in like last year during this time? That news? I don't, I'm trying to remember. Last year at this time, I had a moderator that went rogue on me and my life was freaking out <laughs> I, silently i really didn't say it out loud because i didn't know what was going on hmm. you detect his daughter <laughs> you don't need no damn membership but i appreciate it <laughs> Yeah, I do too, TC. I just, I would like to understand where he's coming from with the summer thing, especially all the evidence against summer, right? And just the way she didn't show up. If she can, I've heard people, this is not, I didn't come up with this, but she, people are like, if she can go to Crime Con, why the hell couldn't she show up for Kylie? Or JJ, in that matter, for that matter, you know? I mean, just, or Charles, or Tammy, because if she had spoke up, you know, I mean, instead, she's sitting there saying, I'll kill him myself. It's crazy. And it just, I don't give her a pass for that. You know, I can be civil uh, as much as the next person. But, mm-mm. Mm-mm. You keep your enemies close, right? Uh, I understand that, I, I mean, I feel for her as far as, you know, the heart-wrenching phone call. I mean, that's not the only time she's cried or felt that way, I'm sure, because it's not the only time I have I mean it, it just it's a shitty situation but you can't put yourself into the shit and then and then scream and cry whenever the shit gets on you you know what I mean like uh, I'm just saying right <laughs> yep TC exactly right Heidi yep she was an enabler yeah and she was like oh, you want me to kill myself well girl <laughs> go on with that yeah, Ravina Denver says what that family said about Tylee and the FOIA doc. She had no business speaking for her. Nope. Yeah, her outburst with Lori was more about locking her out of the cult. Yeah, that's true. More than caring about anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just because she was caught recorded saying that uh, she said to Lori on the recording doesn't make up for the rest. Nope. She had her place in all this too, right? I'm right there 100% with you, Janelle. <laughs> and so it just bothers me that we're going to reward the behavior and then put that on a platform and give that a voice. That's what bothers me whenever that's not been given by Summer in 
and you know to the victims at all at all um uh, it, it bothers me a great deal i usually don't speak out about family you know i really don't i hate it it's it's too messy i don't like drama uh but that's the one i mean that i was like wow <laughs> that's pretty um that's pretty rude and just um i don't know it's wrong it's wrong and i don't like it yeah that's what breaks my heart about tylee is that nobody around her loved her she was their whipping post and she was so way much more more mature than all of them combined all of them combined yeah me too <laughs> i know yeah i don't blame i totally didn't have really was having to fend for herself you know i don't criticize her at all i don't criticize none of them i mean there it is what it is and so i'm not gonna sit there and 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 criticize what a victim decided especially a, a minor you know hell no nope yep it will just kidding oh jj had your parents entirely it seems like tylee was isolated and Lori didn't work exactly i know I wish I would have known that too. I mean, I, it bothers me too, but I, I really was so removed from the situation. You know, I am not making an excuse, but because I mean, I beat myself up about it too. I wish I'd have been more involved. I wish I'd have been, uh, had more, had more contact with other family members. You know, I didn't appreciate my family until all these things happened. Then I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm still not around them all the time, but I do love them and appreciate them. I don't take them for granted. That is another reason I dislike Melanie Gibbs so much. Her negative speech regarding Tylee. Yes. And the real. And her little, just her little, the little remarks she does make. I mean, but she dotes over um, Alex Cox, which is, it freaking bothers me. <laughs> like, how do you sit there and, oh, you know, he's a cool guy and he's funny and blah, 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 blah. But yet you're going to sit there and talk all kinds of snark about a freaking teenager that you know her mother said that she was a freaking zombie? Get out of here. <laughs> wow. You know, I don't either. I don't understand why they hurt all, any of them. He wasn't even baptized to be infiltrated with, with an evil demon, according to their religious doctrine. Yep. <laughs> yep. Charles cared about her, called her his own child to police. Lori just worked them. Against. Yes, Lori just worked them against each other. That's what a narcissist does. They pit everyone against one another. And that's how Lori, um, you know, that comment Uncle Charles made to me that one day when him, he brought JJ over to meet my mom, Walter Ham when they were in uh, Lake Charles. And I want to say it was 2018. Well, on the way out the door, I don't even know what prompted this, but he was like, Lori, he said, Lori, she just needs to be needed. And I was just, anyways, it took me a while before I remembered that. And I was like, oh yeah, I remember that. And, but that makes sense because she needed to be needed, just like he said. And so she pitted everybody against one another um, because she's messy and because it's all about her. And um, that way she could be needed. And I guess as JJ was getting older too, I mean, that's the baby, right? She's one of those women that think that a baby is going to repair the void in her and her marriage and everything because it's in her. Yeah, that too, Angela. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yes, it's sad. It, it really is tragic all the way around. More than one thing can be true at once at one time we also have a different kind of empathy that does create like multiple different categories and opinions of people and their choices and journey yeah, that is a good statement that is true yeah because i i mean i've had a stepdad y'all before larry that i i couldn't stand him but i, I mean i i love i i still loved him you know i just was like tylee's age i was like 14 15 <laughs> and older and i mean uh he he kind of he um 
infiltrated my territory. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I had hormones too. Hello, hormones, right? They're not always pleasant. <laughs> so anyway. But it's so crazy, like TC, you know, a lot of people are like, well, no, they didn't. They didn't advocate for Tylee. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> it, it just, it comes down to people and they end up turning family members against the victims. Do you know what I mean? Um, it's weird. It's so weird. They tell us what we do and do not think and feel and how we should have reacted not reacted and you're just like okay <sighs> oh yeah it is fancy nancy <laughs> i mean i was a bianch too <laughs> i'm not saying i was nice so i'm just saying <laughs> i often wonder if tylee straight confronted them about killing charles and then uh, saw her as a threat you know and they took her phone away immediately pretty much after Charles's murder. I really think that uh, they did it. I think Lori did it just in case, you know, and just it was part of the whole stripping down process like Ruby Frankie did, you know. I mean, even to where they had two kids in one house imprisoned away from each other, had not seen each other in a month, you know. I mean, it's just that extra wow yeah she wasn't stupid mm -hmm. they are and so that's what pissed me off about people dumbing kids down so much you know they take up they just i don't know they, they think that they're not all that smart and i'm like shit <laughs> they're smart very smart and just like how you'd hear melanie gibb talking about jj and, and david warwick talking about jj so many people came to my channel when i first started it you know it was about I was sharing just some private home videos or whatever and people in the comments were like oh my god he can walk he can talk and I'm like yes you know what the hell just like people are doing with Sebastian and I'm like he's not dumb good lord people are ignorant or ignorant though too and I mean I can be ignorant myself <laughs> but Yes, she was threatening. I think so, too. Youthful, the children are pawn. He's definitely a pawn. Yes. Oh, that's that. We've said that many times. Mm-hmm. Right, TC? Yep. Uh, I believe she loved Charles. I believe Charles loved her. Um, but I think that, you know, you get to a point. And I mean, I I'm come from a tough love kind of family. That's just the way... That's the way the cookie crumbles. And I'm not saying it's been great, but I, I kind of don't know any other way. And so I know like the whole thing with Colby and Uncle Charles, you know, that was just like, hey, dude, it's time to get a job and stop freeloading. I mean, it's that kind of thing. You know what I mean? It wasn't like him being a prick. He's just like, hey, you got to like make the birdie fly, right? If not, they'll just stay there with a clipped wing, you know? Um, it's, it's called teaching a child to, or, you know, even a young adult or young man, a young woman, uh, to have responsibilities and to appreciate them and, and to know what responsibility is. Yeah, I think, I think so too, Janelle. I can see how Lori got rid of JJ to, just to spite your, your mama and Larry because they got Charles's. And I mean, they didn't want it. I mean, it's not like they asked for it, you know, it's crazy ignorant she's stupid <laughs> and just dumb you know that's what it's about for for lori is just that money and, and that status you know money power sex yeah took us they took everything away uh tyler's jeep and everything and i'm like i'm wondering if like david and and melanie drove it while they were there yeah i'm wondering well no i think david drove his truck up there but still you know what I mean? Like, did Zalema drive it when she was there? Did Melanie Plowski drive it when she was there? I mean, they just saw Tylee's big honking Jeep uh, out, parked outside of uh, the apartment complex. And yet, but yet she's with her friends or, you know, either with friends and or 
she's uh, at BYU campus, well, then she would have her damn Jeep, too. God, they're, they're so dumb. Really. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel them. Oh, okay, back on. Let me... Uh... Okay, we're broadcasting at this time as well. We're already on the record. All right. Ms. Blake, if the state has a motion, you can argue that at this time. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the state had previously asked to be heard regarding two objections that came up during the last um, panel. The state wanted to be heard prior to bringing in the next group, anticipating that we may hear the same things. Um, the two issues are that Mr. Pryor, Counsel for Defense, mentioned multiple times the four prosecutors. I do think that that is objectionable. I think it's outside the scope of the purpose of Vore Dyer. I think it's also um, pandering to the jury essentially and serves no purpose as far as the Vore Dyer process itself goes. So we would ask that he um, be prohibited from repeatedly referring to the four prosecutors and then himself as a lone defense counsel. In addition, uh, the other objection dealt with, uh, I think it only happened one time that I can think of but Mr. Pryor made the comment that he believed his client was not guilty. Again, I think that's inappropriate to comment on that, to comment on what his personal beliefs are with regard to that, and also would be outside of the scope of board dire and serve no purpose um, for the board dire proceedings. Okay, thank you, Ms. Blake. <clears throat> Two different motions there. Mr. Pryor, if you'd like to respond first to the state's objection when you're referring to the four prosecutors. Sorry. Judge, if you have some suggested language for me in terms of how I'm supposed to refer to them, I'll be glad to take that language because I don't see the prejudice in referring to four prosecutors on the other side of the table. Um, if the court feels that's prejudicial, then you can, you know, if you want to tell me exactly how I'm supposed to refer to those folks, I'll, I'll be glad to do that. But I, I see that's a little, um, I feel like the prosecutor is picking on an issue. If they feel there's prejudice there, then the judge instruct me how you want me to uh, address those folks. And, uh, as far as the other issue is concerned, Judge, I'll temper my uh, response and ensure that uh, I advise uh, them in a, a less than definitive manner in terms of the other issue. All right. Well, in terms of the first motion, um, I'm not going to prohibit some mention or reference to four prosecutors. That's who's at the table. The jurors are going to see that anyway. If it is being referred to uh, unnecessarily or in a way that's irrelevant to procedures or selecting jurors in the board our process, then the court will consider that under advisement. But I'm not going to prohibit a reference to what they're already seeing. Um, uh, it was said, it was repeatedly made, um, perhaps in a way to try to garner sympathy. It looks like it's rising to that level. I'll reconsider it and may either re-raise the objection, Ms. Blake, or I may speak up and uh, advise counsel that we consider that to refrain from that reference. But in general terms, it's not going to be prohibited. In terms of the uh, statement that was probably what would be framed as uh, vouching, then Mr. Pryor would be correct that that's an improper kind of statement to vouch for your client personally or make a unqualified statement such as that, you've indicated you'll refrain from that so the state would uh, grab the objection on that and instruct that there not be further references where you are vouching for the innocence of your client. So that'll be the court's ruling on both motions. Ms. Blake, do you have any questions on that court ruling? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the defense? No, Judge. Judge, is it permissible for me not to advise if the court preferred that I was? Uh, it's fine if you don't, Mr. Pryor. It probably helps with the audio, actually, if you just go into the microphone and remain seated. So I have no objection to you. I want to make sure I'm not being disrespectful. All right. No taken. Um, one more thing we'll put on the record before we get started with the next group. One of the jurors uh, mistakenly noted a number that's not their number on the questionnaire, and we wanted to advise you of that. So on the seating chart, we've got juror 841. And actually the, let's see. So 465 is the, Questionnaire, that's the number of the questionnaire, is that correct? 
You got a questionnaire with the juror number 465. That is actually going to be red card juror number 841. So when they're in here, they should have a red card 841 that corresponds to the questionnaire with 465. Let me I'll make a point for you. Is the 465 on the five of the questionnaire? Is that the number on the questionnaire, or are they actually making the questions? That is the number on the questionnaire. So the questionnaire reads 465. However, that is actually your 841. You're welcome. All right, Council. Um, took a while on that last group to the extent we can make it any more efficient or move more quickly. I do intend to get through this group today. We've been waiting since this afternoon. So we will proceed first with the court's four dial, then on to council. Uh, if everyone's ready, then we'll go ahead and have this next group of 16 brought in for board dial. So instruct the marshals to have the viewers brought in, please. Sure. <laughs> All right, please. Can we go here, Your Honor? All right, thank you. Please be seated. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for returning. Apologies for the delay this afternoon. I'm going to first, if we would do this, just to give counsel and the court an opportunity to confirm your seating arrangement that corresponds with our chart. If you don't mind, if each of you would please just hold your red card up for a moment and give us a moment to review our charts, then we'll move on from there. <coughs> All right, thank you. Uh, first, counsel, I will remind you, please only refer to jurors by their red card numbers, not by name. As I mentioned previously, we are here to select a total of 12 jurors plus six alternates for trial. So we're going to have uh, a total number of 50 prospective jurors to get to peremptory challenges. The court's going to conduct its own board dire and I'll uh, request the council not repeat questions the court's already asked. We are now broadcasting the proceedings. We are on the record on KCR 22211623, State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Daybell. I'll note Mr. Daybell is present as well as his attorney, Mr. Pryor. The state's here represented by Mr. Wood, Ms. Blake, Ms. Beatty, and Mr. Wixom. First question I'll ask of counsel beginning with the state, is there any objection to the manner in which the jury panel has been recalled and seated today? No, Your Honor, thank you. Any objection from the defense? No, Your Honor, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for returning this afternoon. You've been recalled as prospective jurors in this case. Uh, in this case, I'm Stephen W. Boyce, the district judge of Fremont County, Idaho, and I'm in charge of the courtroom in this trial. Uh, my court clerk to the right is Shannon Holstein, who is keeping minutes of this proceeding and will also be administering oaths to you as jurors. We've got our courtroom marshals here, Mr. Holmes, Beige, and Ravello, who will work with keeping order in the courtroom 
as well as helping you as jurors move about. The court reporter, Mary Fox, is seated down to my left, and she's keeping a stenographic record of everything said in these proceedings. And my staff attorney, Courtney Stallings, is seated to the far right against the wall, and she assists me with legal research and administrative issues that come up throughout the day. Each one of you is qualified to serve as a juror of this court, and you filled out a questionnaire that we have now reviewed. We are going to go through this process in an effort to select 18 jurors, which will compromise 12 trial jurors and six alternates. The clerk at this time now, using the red card number, will please make a roll call of the jurors. That's our audibly when I just remember. Uh, juror 440? Here. Juror 465? Here. Juror 496? Here. Juror 505? Here. Juror 526? Here. Juror 536? Here. Juror 539? Here. Juror 544? Here. Juror 591? Here. Juror 617? Here. Juror 631? Here. Juror 641? Here. Juror 647? Here. Juror 656? Here. Juror 686? Here. Juror 740? Here. All right, thank you. Uh, for jurors that did not appear, the court will indicate an admonishment that they may be subject to fines or jail time under Idaho Code 7610 and Idaho Code 22085. So for those of you who did appear today in this group of 16, thank you for returning. To assist you in understanding and participating in this jury selection process, uh, again, I'll reintroduce you to the parties and the lawyers and summarize briefly what the case is about. When I introduce an individual, please stand and briefly face the jury panel, then we'll take your seat. The case has been brought by the state of Idaho, sometimes referred to as the prosecution. The state's represented at this trial by Fremont County Prosecutor Lindsey Blake, Madison County Prosecutor Rob Wood, specially appointed prosecutor Eva Beatty, and Deputy Prosecutor Rocky Wixon. The defendant is Chad Guy Daybell, and he's represented by his attorney, John Pryor. Yeah. This case is a criminal matter, which means the defendant has been charged by the state of Idaho with a violation of the law. I previously read to you a summary of the charges contained in the amended indictment when you were here last week to complete your questionnaires. With regard to the defendant, the state of Idaho has alleged that he committed the following crimes. Count one, conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grant theft by deception. Count two, first degree murder. Count three, conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grant theft by deception. Count four, first degree murder. Count five, conspiracy to commit first degree murder. Count six, first degree murder. Count seven, insurance fraud. Count nine, insurance fraud. Mr. Daybell has pled not guilty to the charges. Please remember this is simply a description of the charges. It is not evidence. Under our law and system of justice, every defendant is presumed to be innocent. This means two things. First, the state has the burden of proving the defendant guilty. The state has that burden throughout the trial. The defendant is never required to prove his innocence, nor does the defendant ever have to produce any evidence at all. Second, the state must prove the alleged crime beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is not a mere possible or imaginary doubt, it is a doubt based on reason and common sense. It may arise from a careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence or from a lack of evidence. If after considering all the evidence, you have a reasonable doubt about the defendant's guilt, you must find the defendant not guilty. The duty of the jury is to determine the facts and then apply the law set forth in the instructions I'll later give you to those facts. And this way you'll decide the case. In applying the court's instructions to the controlling law, you must follow those instructions regardless of your opinion of what the law is, what the law should be, or what any lawyer may state the law to be. During the course of this trial, including the jury selection process, you are instructed that you are not to discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else, including by use of email, text messaging, social media, or any other form of communication, electronic or otherwise. 
Do not conduct any personal investigation or look up any information from any source, including the internet. Don't form an opinion as to the merits of the case until after the case has been submitted to you for your determination. At this time, then, I am going to request that our clerk administer an oath to the entire jury panel. Ladies and gentlemen, if you please stand and raise your right hands, I'll have the clerk administer this oath. You solemnly swear or affirm that you will truthfully answer such questions as may be asked of you by a court or counsel, touching upon your qualifications to sit as a trial juror in the cause of your own trial. So help you, God. All right, thank you. Please be seated. Our record will reflect that all jurors were placed under oath. The clerk has now paneled 16 prospective jurors for questioning in small group today. Will the state stipulate the jurors have been properly called and paneled? Yes, Your Honor. Will the defense stipulate? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. These jurors were uh, sent home last week after completing the questionnaire and then provided an affirmation that they have not gone and researched or looked into the case between now and then, nor discussed it with anyone. Uh, let me inquire next of our bailiffs. Do we know if a juror affirmation has been completed by this group? Yes, Your Honor, and confirmed. Okay. Thank you for following the court's admonishment of not looking into the case during that intervening time period. In this part of the jury selection, then you're going to be asked questions touching on your qualifications to serve as jurors in this particular case. This part of the case is known as the Vore Dyer examination. Vore Dyer is an ancient Anglo-Norman term dating back hundreds of years to origins of the common law. And in French, it simply means to speak the truth. Vore Dyer examination is for the purpose of determining if your decision in this case would in any way be influenced by opinions which you now hold or by some personal experience or special knowledge which you may have concerning the subject matter to be tried. The object is to obtain 12 persons who will impartially try the issues of this case upon the evidence presented in this courtroom without being influenced by any other factors. Please understand the questioning is not for the purpose of prying into your personal affairs, but only for the purpose of obtaining an impartial jury. Whenever you need to answer a question, please raise your red card number. When you're called upon to speak, identify yourself with that number. And since we're making a stenographic recording of the proceedings, please make audible verbal responses and try to avoid speaking at the same time as anyone else talking to you that way our court reporter be able to keep a clear record. If any answer to a question would be embarrassing or uncomfortable for you to answer publicly, and I will note this proceeding is being live streamed, then please let me know and we're able to discuss those issues with you in a more private setting outside of the public purview. Similarly, if your answer to any question may prejudice other prospective jurors, please let me know and we'll also discuss that issue outside of the presence of your fellow jurors. Additionally, many of you may have knowledge of this case from pretrial media coverage and publicity. Please do not discuss any specific facts or details of this case in front of the other jurors in this pool. We can discuss those matters with you individually as needed. I'll now read to you a special instruction in this case, which is as follows. The defendant, Chad Guy Daybell, has been charged in the amended indictment with certain counts of entering into a conspiracy with Lori Vallo Daybell and or Alex Cox. The crime of conspiracy involves an agreement by two or more persons to commit a crime. You must only consider the evidence against the defendant in this case and should not speculate as to any other case or legal proceedings involving the alleged co-conspirators. You must remember that the defendant has the presumption of innocence, and you must consider his guilt or innocence based solely on the evidence provided in this case. That concludes the court's special instruction. At this time, I would instruct the attorneys for both parties to avoid repeating any questions already asked. The attorneys do have the right, however, to direct follow-up questions to a juror regarding responses they've made to previous questions. The jury should be aware that during and following the Vordire examination, one or more of you may be challenged. 
Each side has challenges called for cause, which means they can ask a juror to be excused for some specific reason. In addition, each side has a certain number of what are called peremptory challenges, meaning they can ask a juror to be excused without giving a reason for that dismissal. If you are excused by either side, please do not feel offended or feel that your honesty or integrity has been questioned because it has not. At this time, then the court will begin with its portion of the board dialogue process, after which the attorneys for both parties will be given an opportunity to make their own inquiries. When you are being, uh, when other jurors are being asked certain questions, please pay attention because you may later be called upon to answer those same questions. Um, the first question I'll ask then relates to your jury questionnaires, which you filled out. Let me just ask the group here. Are the answers given by each of you on the jury information form still true and accurate? If you would say yes, please raise your red card. Okay, everyone responded affirmatively. To the best of your knowledge, are those answers in your questionnaires also still accurate and true at this time? If yes, raise your card. Everyone said yes. Next question the court will get to is the time commitment that may be required if you are serving on this case. As you were told last week, it would be for a period of approximately eight to 10 weeks. Would that time of service create a serious hardship upon you or your family or your business or profession or occupation so as to prevent you from rendering service as a fair and impartial juror in this case? If you think that applies to you, please raise your red card. Okay, we've got two jurors, three jurors, six, four, one, five, four, four, and four, nine, six. Let me take those up individually with you. So starting with juror number four, nine, six. You mentioned in your questionnaire you are out of town for work both in April and May. Could you explain a little further about those circumstances? Uh, yes, I have, a, I have a training going on to essentially it's related to work, so I'm traveling to Arizona to help. All right, would you be able to have anyone else cover or would you be able to reschedule those commitments? Um, what would be the impact on you if you were required to serve as a juror in this case and list? And, and to be clear, these are two separate trips, both planned. Is that correct? If you miss both of them, where would that lead you? I would, I would need to reschedule, which All right, I think it would be appropriate at this point for me to allow counsel to step in and ask additional questions as it relates to the hardship expressed along with the state. Your Honor, the state also had noted those planned trips and had intended to inquire of those today. Given that additional information and the expenses associated with that, the state would make a motion to excuse this juror for cause for hardship. Judge Elson. All right, thank you, Mr. Pryor, Ms. Blake. The court's considered the information provided today, including what we filled out in the questionnaire and your responses. Juror 496, the court will find that you may be excused for cause for purposes of the hardship you would endure if you were required to serve here. So you can be excused. Thank you for reporting. That concludes your jury service. Please drop off your questionnaire with the bailiff as you exit. And then in a moment, we'll take up our next juror that had a concern. All right, let's next talk to juror number 544. 
Uh, we didn't have a whole lot of detail in your questionnaire. So you had a wedding in Atlanta. And can you explain to the court more about when that would be? That would be April 18th to the 20th. And can you indicate whose wedding that would be? It's, it's my nephew. Have you made any free range purchases for that trip at this point? Yes, I have. I actually have um, purchased the airline ticket before I had gotten the uh, uh, summons. They're willing to move the wedding out a couple of months for you? you think? <laughs> Hard to do. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to ask the state at this point if they have any questions about the purported hardship here for this tour. Your Honor, the state also had a note on this one, and we did note there was a wedding in Atlanta. We just were unclear on the dates of that. With that additional information regarding the dates and the purchased uh, airfare, the state would make a motion to excuse this juror for a cause for a hardship. All right, response from the defense. Judge all right, well, uh, juror 544, as I mentioned last year, he will be excused based on your request to not serve at this time for a hardship that would occur if you remain. Thank you for coming in, completing the questionnaires, returning today, and your jury service is completed and you can be excused. Please drop your questionnaire off to the marshal on your way. Thank you. We'll next talk to juror number 641. We've got a vacation in May to visit some elderly grandparents, it looks like. Uh, juror 641, can you provide a little more detail about that? Um, my vacation is scheduled for May 18th. I'll be there until the end of the month. Uh, I've already scheduled time off of work, which will be very hard to move. And the expense of that would total out to about 272 for the points of which I purchased in advance, and then a train ticket to visit a family friend who was recently diagnosed. And that's incorporated in the same trip? Yes, yeah. All right, as to juror 641, does the state have any additional questions? Your Honor, we also had a note here to follow up regarding that vacation in May. Again, just not a lot of information. In addition, I note there was an indication that there was some concern about interruption of school and work. I think given all of that, the state would make a motion to excuse juror 641 for cause for a hardship. All right, response from the defense. Okay, juror 641, uh, you are excused based on your request of a hardship. The court determines that uh, you won't be required to serve for this case. Thank you for reporting, for completing your questionnaire and returning today. Please drop that questionnaire off with the bailiff as you exit. For those jurors remaining, did anyone else have a concern about the length this trial may take? All right, and understandably, it's a difficult circumstance for all of us, anyone. And we do have one more now, 539. All right, your number 539, should be moved. All right, can you please uh, explain a little more about your family situation that you believe uh, indicates a hardship here? I have two vacations planned that are each one week long, um, as May, I think it's team two, 24, 27. And I'm also the primary caretaker for a two-year-old. The May, well, both, and when is the second vacation plan? Um, June 1st through 7th. All right. Are either or both of those already pre-purchased or just planned? Um, the first one is already purchased. And can you provide a little more detail about your um, commitment to child care with a two-year-old? Um, yeah, I'm a stay-at-home mom, so I'm the, I take care of them all day long, so I have to find 
alternate child care for him during the hours that take place. Um, and that's pretty hard to secure child care around here, like cement. There's lots of waiting lists. And in this case, there's a potential of being sequestered for some time, and you would be away from the two-year-old for perhaps a week or even longer. Uh, what would occur if you were required to be sequestered? Um, that would, I mean, it'd be really hard for him, and um, I'm not sure what I would do with that. My my husband is that, um, so he has weird hours. And do you believe that would become a significant distraction for you if you were concerned about that while being sequestered? Yeah, um, just trouble passing. So. All right, let me ask the state if there's any follow up on these requests for excuse for hardship. Uh, similarly, Your Honor, the state had already made notes of those two um, planned trips. Again, we didn't have details if they had been already purchased or not. And we did have the note uh, regarding her young child and that she was a stay-at-home mom to follow up on. Given that additional information provided by her today, the state would make a motion to excuse juror number 539 for cause for hardship. All right, Mr. Pryor, Judge I have a stipulation for the Okay, uh, juror 539, the court's considered the stipulation of the parties as well as your request, which you did request for in your questionnaire based on those reasons already stated on the record you may be excused. Thank you for coming in and serving and filling out your questionnaire. You can drop the copy off with the bailiff on your way out. All right, unless there's any other concerns from the jury pool, we'll move on to another subject at this time. And again, thank you for your willingness to commit uh, that amount of time in serving on this case if you're called. Mm -hmm. The next issue we're going to discuss is pretrial publicity or your knowledge of this case. Uh, the court would note there has been extensive news coverage of the case and other uh, in in a lot of different, uh, published in a lot of different forms. The instruction I read previously and what I want is to not go into any discussion of any facts or details you know about the case at this stage because we'll talk to you individually about that so other jurors don't hear what you already know. But with that in mind, if you do have some prior knowledge of this case, and by knowledge I mean not just heard of the case, but know about it in any detail, would you please raise your red card at this time? <clears throat> That's a good question. Yes. Can you say in, in detail, beyond what, what's been on TV or at the news? Well, well, we'll probably talk to you about that individually. I know it's a generic term that might mean different things to different people. Some people have followed this a lot. Some people have just heard it in passing. Some haven't heard anything about it at all. So um, have you actively followed it at all? Okay, but you have heard about the case somewhat. Okay, we will uh, ask you some further questions about that individually. Anyone else who has any knowledge of the case or? Okay, uh, 505. And seven forty five ninety one. Okay, uh, for you to listed your or raise your card up there on that, we are going to ask you some specific questions individually. The next topic I'll move on to relates to the subject matter of this case. Would the subject matter of this case, which involves charges filed by the state of murder, conspiracy, and insurance fraud, would that subject matter make it impossible or difficult for you to fairly and objectively evaluate the evidence in this case and render a fair and impartial verdict? All right, no jurors answered yes to that. 
I'll next ask some questions that may seem obvious, and we've reviewed your questionnaires, but they're required under Idaho law for me to make sure there's no improper uh, or appearance of improper relationship or connection to this case. So are any of you related by blood or marriage to the defendant, or do you, you know him from any kind of business or social relationship? No affirmative answers. Do any of you have any kind of a relationship such as guardian and ward, master and servant, employer and employee, creditor and debtor, landlord and tenant, boarder or lodger between you and any of the attorneys in this case? Are any of you, and I'll note no affirmative response there, are any of you a party in any civil action against the defendant, Mr. Daybell? No one answered affirmatively. Have any of you ever brought a criminal complaint against the defendant or been accused of some crime by any of the prosecutors that are present here, including Ms. Blake, Mr. Wood, Ms. Beatty, or Mr. Wixom? No one answered affirmatively to that. Do any of you here have any kind of an attorney-client relationship or business dealing with Mr. Pryor or his law firm? No one answered affirmatively to that. Are any of you related by blood or marriage to any of the lawyers or do any of you know any of the lawyers from any professional business or social relationship? All right, no one indicates the knowing of the lawyers. This next question, you could just answer yes or no. If, he, if the answer is yes, we'll talk to you about this individually, but have any of you formed or expressed an unqualified opinion that the defendant is guilty or is not guilty of the offenses in this case? All right, we've got one card, number 591. We responded to that. We'll ask you more about what opinion you may have individually. Anyone else already formed some type of an opinion in reference to the defendant's guilt or innocence? Do any of you have any particular bias or prejudice either for or against Mr. Daybell as you sit here? No one answered affirmatively to that. Are there any of you who would be unwilling to follow my instructions to you as the jury as to the law that you must apply in determining this case? All right, no one said yes. Do any of you have a religious or moral position that would make it impossible for you to sit in judgment of another or to render a fair and impartial verdict? Okay, no one answered affirmatively to that. And then are there any of you that if selected as a juror in this case would be unwilling or unable to render a fair and impartial verdict based upon the evidence presented in this courtroom and the laws instructed by the court? No one answered affirmatively to that. A final kind of catch all question here. Do any of you have any other reason why you cannot give this case your undivided attention and render a fair and impartial verdict. All right, we have one juror raise their card, juror 465. Uh, is that something you wish to discuss here? Do you think that's more appropriate individually? Okay, what would be a reason you believe you couldn't give the case your undivided attention? I work nights and usually wait half an Yeah. And I'll just tell you that with our schedule, um, even though it doesn't look like much in my experience, this will be, it, it would be very difficult, if not impossible for somebody to maintain uh, a night shift and, and do trial in the day. I don't, I don't see that as feasible. So is that something you were considering when it got to the hardship question? Yes. Okay, so you were under the thought maybe you could work in the evenings, do this in the day? Uh, it's more of a, uh... When do you start 
eight thirty. That'd be like uh, you know, three at night. And I guess the question is, would you be able to not do your job while this case is going for ten weeks? Because I kind of think that is what it's going to take for you to have the mental capacity to do this. Be falling asleep during. Okay. Um, let's go back to that question then on um, employment for juror number. I'm sorry, could you hold your card up again? 465. I'm going to let the state inquire at this point if you write about um, employment and a potential hardship here. Your Honor, given the information provided by Juror 465, the state would make a motion to excuse him for a cause based on a hardship. Um, response from the defense. Ms. 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 All right, and just to be clear, you are uh, employed at that job full time and that's your sole source of income? Okay, and if you were required to essentially quit your job for the 10 week time period, would that uh, result in a financial hardship for you? Um, no, sir. It's the capability of saying when you're not completing trial. Okay, I, and I guess there's been a stipulation. I just want to be clear on that. I guess what I'm saying is likely you, you wouldn't be able to work during that time frame. So if you weren't working, in other words, if you had to quit that job to do this trial, where would that leave you? Okay. All right. Well, um, I've considered the responses also, the non-opposition motion from both parties. And I would find that uh, with that in mind, your 465, I think it would be a hardship for you to be required to serve in this case given the time frame and the employment situation. So for that reason, your 465 will be excused based on a hardship. Thank you for serving and filling out your questionnaire. You can drop that questionnaire off at the bailiff as you exit. Like All right, I'm almost concluded with my section of Ward Dyer, but I'll go back and just re-ask that same question since we went through that with that juror, having listened to that. Do any other jurors here have a concern that they would not be able to give this case their undivided attention and render a fair and impartial verdict? All right, that will conclude the court section of Ward Dyer. For this panel, I'll turn this over now for the state. If you'd like to conduct your board dire inquiry, who will be doing that? I will. All right, Mr. Wood. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Rob Wood. I represent Madison County, Idaho. Um, thank you for being here. and. As just as a reminder, uh, when the judge said, if I ask you a question and you feel like you'd rather answer it right, just let us know. We want you to be comfortable. And there's no there's no wrong answers here. How you feel is how you feel. And we need to know that um, so that this defendant and so that the state can have a fair trial. And so but juror 505, when I say brutal. Brutal honesty, what does that mean to you? He's being very direct. Telling it like it is. Yeah. We all commit you'll be brutally honest in, in your response, your responses with us. You'll you'll tell us how you actually feel. Church 647. Do I see some hesitation? Yeah, yeah you okay. kind of tilted your head and looked at me like maybe uh, maybe not. Oh no, I have four kids. Okay, so you can be no, honest. I, I shouldn't say honest. You can be forthright, but that's right. Okay. Um, there, there were a couple of jurors that did list a hardship. I just might just feel that uh, that you didn't raise your hands uh, when we were talking about it earlier. So if it's all right, I'm just going to ask a couple of you about that. Uh, juror six eight six. 
And you know, I apologize. You're not one of the ones I was talking about. Juris 631. I, you're a medical technician, correct? And uh, on your uh, on your questionnaire, it said it may be a hardship for you uh, that equipment at a specific hospital may not be maintained. Is that accurate? Uh, possibly. I was the only technician trained on uh, this specific equipment at the hospital. So oh. I've already spoken with them, and uh, they were calling me in touch. Okay, so you've taken care of that so that if you get there, someone else can. Perfect. Thank you. Juror 653. You would, thank you. You had mentioned on your questionnaire it could be a financial hardship for you to take the time to be on this juror, jury. Is that still accurate? Okay, so you, you've been able to take care of that. Perfect. Thank you. I want to talk to you really quick because the, as the court mentioned, we're going to get into what you've seen on the media individually later. But just really quick, does anybody here believe everything they read online? Nobody? Nobody believes everything they read online? So we're all aware that sometimes there's information out there that's not true. Do you, do you all agree with that? And what about news on the TV? Does anybody here believe everything they hear on the news? And, and to be clear, I'm not saying that in any way to diminish the news, just sometimes facts change, right? And, and we might think one thing one day and then we learn another fact another day. Has, has everybody seen that in their, their lives? And so this is so important. Can you all commit to this court, to the state, to this defendant that what you have seen, you'll put that aside. And you'll only rely on what you learn in this court. The, the court talked briefly about the nature of this case uh, and asked if the nature of this case would preclude anyone from feeling like they, they could serve on this jury. And just to get into the, to follow up on that, um, this, this is a case that involves uh, the death of two minor, the deaths of two minor children and, and a mother. And you, there are going to, there's going to be some evidence, some, some autopsy photos uh, that is absolutely difficult to look at. Um, is there anybody here who feels like looking at that type of material will render them unable, unable to render a part impartial verdict that it would sway them one way or another? 591, thank you for being honest. T tell me how you feel about that. I may get emotional <laughs> if I do, but I'm a retired school teacher and I've spent my whole life trying to keep kids safe. And that, and you know, really everybody's safe, but beyond that, I have a very vivid imagination or I'm a very visual person, it's really more correct. So no matter what you say, I picture it already. So I'm already living in movies, you know, with, and uh, so because of that, I don't watch anything violent. I don't watch action movies or anything because they stay with me and uh, create a lot of anxiety. So, and you know, people say, well, stop picturing it. Well, it, it it's there. It just happens. And it, it has my whole life. And, uh, it, it does cause me, I, I've already lost about a week of sleep over this. Well, and I noticed you, you mentioned that in your questionnaire, uh, the, what you said, the vivid kind of reliving of these things. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair characterization? Yes. I don't want to put words in I, it, I have dreams, but loop. And uh, <laughs> I, I had counseling and things like that, and I can get a hold of them, but when it comes to violence, um, it's just, that's 
like a, I don't want to say it's a character flaw because it doesn't feel like a flaw to me. It feels like it's a, a warning. And I, I'm also very intuitive, which um, I'm not saying that I would be able to intuit everything, but um, I don't know. It's like I have a different sense about me, and it it's, uh, causes a lot of anxiety. And I noticed you mentioned that as well in your questionnaire. So, where this comes down, uh, is this, or are you concerned that uh, this vivid looping of information, of graphic information, and, and anxiety, do you feel like that would make it uh, difficult for you to render an impartial verdict? Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for your honesty. I appreciate that. Uh, judge, at this time, I would ask that uh, juror 591 be excused for cause. Response from the defense. Judge, can I just inquire? Yes, you may. Ma'am, I'm, I'm John Pryor. I'm representing Mr. Dave Bell today. And I want to make it clear I'm, I am required to ask you questions. And I don't want you to believe that any of these questions uh, suggest that Mr. Dave Bell is guilty or anything like that. But if there's just questions we have to ask, uh, would that be okay with you? Uh, there are going to be very graphic pictures here, and um, they're going to be disturbing to everybody. And they're going to be very, very emotional. And one of the concerns we have is that when you look at those pictures, will you immediately assign those pictures to Mr. Daybell and assume that he's guilty because of the nature and the graphic nature of those pictures? Or would you be able to, to look at those pictures and say, it's evidence? I can maybe keep it to evidence, but what my concern is, is my how I'm going to continue to function during and this is going to cause you some emotional distress. Yes. With your association with children, having someone who's worked very hard to protect children your entire life, I can imagine. Mm -hmm. If you see those, it would be very difficult because the court instructed you that you know you're supposed to look at these and not judge them or be inflamed or or you know, overwhelmed by those, you're supposed to look at them for what they are and continue to look at all the evidence. That's going to be a difficult task for you. you say that's the case? Yes. Judge, I'll stipulate. Yes. All right. Um, Juror 591, just, I guess, a final bit of inquiry from me. Uh, I guess what I'm hearing is you think you may get upset to the point where you're not able to pull things back together and think clearly after that? Okay. And I, um, I wish it wasn't true, but I mean, it is, so. Sure, um, different people react different ways. That's why we go through this process. Um, thank you for your candor to the court in these questionings. I do agree that for this juror with this particular trial, uh, she should be excused uh, based on that nature of the evidence that will be presented here. Um, and so for juror 591, the court is going to grant the motion to strike for cause. And we appreciate your taking the time to fill out your questionnaire and return today. Your jury service is concluded with the thanks of the court. You can drop your questionnaire with the bailiff. Thank you, I appreciate it. You're welcome. You can continue with this. Thank you, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to speak to you just really briefly about the law. The, the court asked earlier if everyone would be willing to follow the instructions as given by this court. I believe every, everybody answered affirmatively, correct? 
Um, anybody here have a law or a rule they don't like? People are either grinning or holding up there. We all probably have something, some rule or law we don't like. Um, but it's important for, for both sides to receive a fair trial that we can all agree on what the law is in this court and that it is what the, the court gives to us. Is there anybody who um, feels like there may be some type of situation where they would just go with their gut rather than what the court gives? Right. Sure, 505. Well, and, and, and I ask because you mentioned briefly something about that in your questionnaire. And I'm, I'm not calling you out for it, and there's no wrong answer. You can answer that however you want. It comes from my background as a mind. If you ask me to be wrong, they would be wrong. Sure. I don't know if it's okay. That's why. Okay, that clarifies that. So um, that you can commit to. What the judge gives you as the law, you will follow that law for this case. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Your Honor, I'm going to turn the, my remaining time over to Ms. White. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for being here this afternoon. I know it's getting later afternoon and you were all here last week. So we appreciate you hanging in there with us for this process. As you've already heard a couple of times, um, we all take this very serious. We want to ensure that we select a jury that can be fair and impartial to both the state and the defendant, Chad Daybell. So that's why we go through this process. So I don't know about all of you, but I have a two-year-old that when he wakes up in the morning, if I ask him, what do you want for breakfast? It's usually cheesy eggs. And there's a very specific recipe that I'm supposed to use to make his cheesy eggs. It's eggs, milk, cheese, salt and pepper, and usually, you know, some extra cheese in there. He doesn't like me to vary that recipe. So I saw some people kind of smile and nod along. Do any of you have that experience either with children or someone else that you work with and whether it's a recipe they like you to make a certain way or something they like done a certain way? Can everyone relate to that? And your 686, I see you shaking your head. Um, what's your experience with that? Um, I've had several siblings and did several people that had children and it's very much the same. If a kid wants, you know, peanut butter and jelly a certain way, you make it that way without, you know, any variation. And in your experience, were you use, usually willing to go along with, with how they wanted it made? Most of the time, yeah. And were there times that you thought, man, if they just add this or if they just do it this way, it'd probably be a lot better? Yeah. And Juror 740, did you shake your head yes as well? And what's your experience with that? Uh, just to work in processes. People are set in their way. And are there times when you go along with what their ways are if it's their call to make? Yes. And so um, I know I use kids as the example, but as you're here today, and uh, Mr. Wood touched on it a little bit already, but the judge is going to give you some jury instructions. And he's going to give you verdict forms that outline what the elements are of each count. And sometimes it's easy to say, well, it would make more sense if it was this, or why don't they add this, or why don't they take this away? But could all of you commit that this is the recipe, this is the instruction that you would have to follow? Does anyone have concerns with that? Does anyone have concerns that if you thought some part of it didn't make sense, that you'd have a hard time following that? I don't see anyone shaking their head yes on that. Does anyone here have concerns? You're going to hear from a lot of witnesses in this case. Does anyone have concerns if you hear from someone that holds different religious views than you do, whether or not you would be able to give their testimony the appropriate weight and credibility you think it was due? Does that cause anyone concerns? And 
I know. So I'm someone that while it would be smart and easy to just check the weather app in the morning, I don't. And so I'm the person that leaves home without an umbrella and then there's a rainstorm or I dress in shorts and there's a snowstorm. So I don't know, have any of you, um, if you had gone to work or if you showed up today and as you got here, the sky was starting to turn a little overcast, it's turning a little gray and you came in here and all the windows get shut and the blinds are shut while you're in here. And you go outside and you notice water on your car, you notice water all over the pavement, water on the grass, water everywhere. Would you be able to determine what had happened? And juror 653, I see you nodding and saying, yeah. And what would you determine had happened? And juror 647, would you be able to determine? Technically, I would see them in the rain, but I think that I didn't know. But if everything was wet mm -hmm. all around. Yes. And so even though you didn't see the rain, you didn't actually see the rain clouds, you would be able to pull all of that information together to, to reach a conclusion. And so you um, may hear the term circumstantial evidence. So you may see different types of evidence in this case. Does anyone have concerns if you're only shown certain types of evidence in weighing that and giving it the weight it's due? Would anyone have concerns if you weren't shown a specific type of evidence that you thought you should see? So does anyone here watch uh, CSI? No, we don't have the CSI people. Oh, I see um, maybe a nod. Is that your... 526. Or the criminal mind. So if you weren't showing a certain type of evidence that they might show in a TV drama or something you've watched, would that cause you concern with weighing the evidence that you are shown? You feel that you could take whatever evidence is given you and give it the weight it's due and draw that conclusion? And the judge in this case, actually, let me back up. The judge has read off the charges in this case. So we have some counts of conspiracy to commit murder, and we have some charges of first degree murder. Would anyone, if you're given the instruction, so we talked about that recipe, if you're given an instruction from the judge, and one of the elements is not that we have to show what the cause of death was. So the state has the burden, but if one of the elements is not to actually show what caused the death, so instead that we had to show uh, or prove that the defendant engaged in conduct that caused the death, but we didn't have to prove the actual cause of death. Does that cause anyone concerns? Would you be able to hold the state to the burden of showing, uh, of meeting that element that a murder had occurred, but not add an additional element that isn't in the instruction? Anyone have concerns with that? And you heard the judge give an instruction earlier today regarding conspiracy, and that is conspiracy are a couple of the charges here um, that you're going to be looking at today. Does anyone here have concerns? Because you, um, if you hear evidence regarding actions of other co-conspirators, does anyone have concerns in following the court's instruction that the conspiracy would be an agreement between certain parties to commit a criminal offense, and then one of those parties doing an act in furtherance of it. Knowing that, would anyone have concerns holding one person accountable for the actions of another co-conspirator? So if the state met the burden that all the parties had formed an agreement and only one person did an act in furtherance, if you're given an instruction that says just one person has to do that act, does anyone have concerns if holding one of the other parties accountable that didn't do that act in furtherance? So, um, and again, the court will be the one to give you the final instructions, but if you're given an instruction that with the conspiracy, it requires 
two or more persons to enter into some form of an agreement to commit a criminal act, and then that one of those persons commit some kind of an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. If person A didn't commit that overt act, but they were part of the agreement, would you have a hard time holding them accountable, even though it was person B that committed that overt act? And thank you for telling me you didn't understand. I should have said that. If anyone ever has any questions, please let me know. So with that additional explanation, would anyone have concerns holding person A accountable along with person B? See people shaking their heads no. Let me have just a moment. That's all the questions the state has right now. All right, thank you, Ms. Blake. Mm -hmm. Mr. Pryor, you can conduct for Dyer with the group. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is John Pryor. I'm here today representing Mr. Daybell. Um, I want to start off by uh, telling you a little story. And many years ago, when I told it to the other folks before you, um, I was a juror in a jury trial. And the uh, lawyer in that jury trial asked, uh, is there anybody who just doesn't want to be here? And um, I smiled, and eventually I put up my hand and said, yeah, I don't want to be here. And it wasn't anything of a significant trial. It was just one of these things that I had so much going on as a student, a lot of other obligations that I just didn't feel like I could focus or do the job that was necessary. So I'm going to submit that to all of you. And then, folks, it's really important, more important than anything else. We just need to be truthful with each other. And there's no wrong or right answer. There really isn't. If, if, if you don't want to participate in something, the best thing to do is say, you know, I just don't want to do this. Because like anything else, uh, when I have um, chores around my house to do, and it's time to take the garbage out. And I don't like taking the garbage out. And I'm going to do everything I can to avoid taking the garbage out. And if it's something that you just don't feel like you want to do, you know, you would generally not put the effort into it, but you would put in something that you enjoy doing or something that you feel okay about. So again, is there anybody here who, and please be honest, because it's really what it's all about. There's no wrong, there's no right answer. It's what answer is in here, and that goes to each of you. I'm not going to judge. These folks are not going to judge, and at this point, the judge isn't going to judge. It's a play on words, I think. So, again, is there anybody here who just doesn't want to be here today, who just doesn't want to be involved in this? And please be honest with me. Okay. Is there anybody here who um, believes that because Chad has been charged with this offense, that he's guilty right now? Is there anyone who can um, affirmatively tell me that they're going to listen to the entire evidence in this case? I mean, all of the evidence. That means after the state of Idaho is prosecuted to put on their case, and after Chad and I have an opportunity to put on our case, that you're going to wait before you make a decision in this case. Can everybody promise me that? Put the cards up there and promise me that, please. Thank you. And I'll try not to give you to exercise this too much. Okay, I'll try to be patient with all of you as far as that's concerned. Um, is there anybody here who feels that they can't sit for long periods of time, that they're going to have a difficulty in, in sitting through this, whether it's medical issues, whether it's because uh, you, you tend to twitch or you tend to not be able to sit for long periods of time or you don't have the patience? Okay, and then I'm concerned, that, and again, there's no wrong answer because uh, same thing, if you watched occasionally, I'm not moving around because I, I don't like to sit. It makes me uncomfortable, particularly in these chairs that the state of Idaho has decided to provide for me. 
So why don't you elaborate a little bit on the fact about your uh, situation? I don't want to go into detail. It's just not medical. Well, if it's something that's private, I don't want to. Oral medical, it's um, to break, things like that. I'm just... Okay, is this something that's going to cause you some pain? Uh, just discomfort. Okay, is, it, is that discomfort something that's going to cause you to be distracted and not be able to focus as much as you really should in something as serious as this? Uh, usually no. Okay, it's just something you wanted to bring to my attention. Yeah. Is there any possibility whatsoever that this is going to be a distraction in any way for you? Uh, not a distraction for me. Okay. 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 You're comfortable that you think you might be able to sit through this? Um, yeah. And if there's any doubt, again, you know, uh, there's no wrong answer. But if there's any doubt about that, please let us know. Okay. Is there anybody here who knows me? Other than these folks who are in the uh, courtroom behind me, anybody in this courtroom right now from the, these stands forward? No. Now, Ms. Blake touched on a little bit about the course instructions. She talked about what Conspiracy was, and then there's been some detail about the fact that there has to be an agreement. Then, um, uh, juror uh, 536, you, you need a little bit of a clarification. And is there anybody who can't follow the court's instruction? Yes. One of the court's instructions, and it's going to be in, the, in regards to a conspiracy, is that the prosecuting attorney is going to have to prove. That there's an agreement, and that this agreement has to be among the parties who are accused to be in this conspiracy. Okay. Is there anybody here who doesn't understand what that agreement is? Juror number 526, what do you understand it? If you don't know, that's okay. We'll just we can yeah, pass the yes, yes. Okay. 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 positive affirmation. Positive. They have the same um opinion. Okay. And juror number 536, you were shaking your head. I saw that and she said the words, and I, I want to make sure I say say what you said, which was I think it was positive affirmation. And juror 536, what do you think? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. And then juror, I'm going to reach to the back and juror number 686. How do you? Yes, I see. How do you feel about this idea of agreement? What do you, how do you define it? Two or more parties come to a similar plan, agree on the details of the plan or whatever the idea is. Um, and you know, but having trouble defining an agreement, um, but both parties have a similar thought and uh, have stated that they have each other. So do they have to be, does it have to be stated? Uh, for an agreement? Um, for a direct agreement, yes. For an implied agreement, if everything else around hashes, then yes. But that, you know, that can be argued either way. It can be argued either way. So if you don't have the people making a positive affirmation, we have some questions about that. I'm not entirely sure yeah. how to answer that. And, and that's okay. And it, it could be a confusing issue. Yeah. Okay. And, and juror number 653, how do you feel about it? 
I didn't see there's there's multiple aspects. Okay. Um, And I'm going to move on to um, juror number 647. Is it an agreement if someone is tricked into it or fooled into it? Um, no, because they weren't given all the information or the proper information. So, in order to have an agreement, everybody needs to know what's going on. Know the terms. Yeah. Juror number 631, what do you think about what uh, 647 just said? I agree. Okay. Is that it? <laughs> Straight to the point, right? And juror number 617. I think that if uh, you don't have all the information and then you're, you're, you're tricked into it, it's not an agreement. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, how do you folks? Well, I think I'm going to pass on that judgment. You know, at this point, I think I can pass it. But I, I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you very much, folks. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Council. You know, Mr. Ward. just asked a couple of questions. Uh, in the group setting here? Yeah, we, we believe there is something that we should have. That uh, some law has perhaps been. Maybe this is why. Yeah, we can approach.
Okay, at this time we've concluded the attorneys for our questioning. The court's going to now move on to a phase of individual questioning for jurors on certain topics. And so we will start with our lowest number, 440, I believe. Is that you? And we'll have the other jurors excused to the jury room while we discuss individual topics with the jurors. So if you're not here at 440, please follow the bailiff out to the jury room. We'll call you back in when we get to you. All right, please. Thank you. Please be seated. <laughs> All right, uh, juror number four four zero. We've got some indication in your questionnaire regarding both topics of potential, um, what we call bias. Don't take it personally. It's a question of whether or not you formed any type of an opinion based on pretrial coverage and the other issue of the potential, uh, there was some concern of hardship raised in the questionnaire also that I would permit the attorneys to ask about. So um, with this, Juror counsel, if we can begin now, we'll move on to the other topic of the death penalty opinions and views once we get through bias or hardship concerns. Uh, if the state's prepared, you can proceed with individual board dire for juror number 440. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, juror number 440, um, just I want to clarify a few things in your questionnaire to see if they're accurate, if they are going to cause any concern, or if they're not. Um, so just starting with the hardship section, um, looking at your questionnaire, and I think they've given you a copy of it for your benefit if you need it, but I'm just down on page 20. And with trial length, it had indicated um, that your stepson's high school graduation in Wisconsin is on May 24th. I wasn't sure um, from that, is that something you're planning on attending? If I could. And graduation from the military, you said he's just going to be joining. So it's not going to be a super quick graduation. Okay, just making sure. Um, so with regard to that, if you were selected to serve on the jury, that wouldn't end up causing you any concern. Knowing that that graduation was going on and you were here, would you be thinking about it? Would it create any concerns for your ability to focus on the case of the matter at hand? Thank you. And then just on the other one, and I think this was with in regards to sequestration, you just indicated that you have school age children that depend on you for care. If you were to be sequestered for any amount of time in this case, would that cause you concern or hardship? Um, I would say not too much. They're pretty good. I'm not around. I have family that lives in And so you think if you were to be sequestered, you'd be able to figure out the child care? Thank you. I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't missing anything additional there. So thank you for that. And then just looking with regard to bias, and I'm looking at page 19, there's just the question, it's F actually, um, if you formed a personal opinion regarding Chad Daybell's guilt or innocence, you'd indicated yes. And then you wrote, I do have an opinion, though, it has been based only by what the media has reported, which is not always accurate. Um, what exactly did that mean with regard to your opinion? 
Um, I know that not uh, media is not supposed to have all of the facts and what they do have to be like not accurate. Um, so just knowing that you know I've seen the news reports and um, that has caused me to be more reasoned, but I feel like you know whatever the facts are presented that could change how it and when you say that could change how you feel about it, would you be willing to share how you feel about it right now? Um, based on what I have seen, that is saying this, that is and knowing that the court, um, we talked about the recipe and following the court's instructions, um, knowing that the court will give you some instructions, do you feel that you would be able to follow a court instruction to set aside anything that you've seen in the media and base any verdict only on what's presented in the courtroom in the trial in this matter. I don't have any further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Wright. Mr. Pryor. Yeah. Is that better? Okay. In terms of the, the trip to Wisconsin, are you driving or are you flying? Um, we would fly. If, I, if my husband knows, he's going to fly. Uh, but we haven't made any type of trip. Okay. And it's a desire, and it's a desire for both of you to go, though. Okay. Is he going? Yeah, he did. Like, all of us okay. So there really hasn't been a determination as to whether you're all going or not. But you just have a desire to go. Is it going to cause you any anguish or um, cause you to lack uh, the ability to focus on this uh, at a time when this graduation is going on and you may be here as a juror in this case? Okay. Well, thank you for your honesty. I really appreciate it. Um, Judge, if I could just have a moment, please. Yes. You, um, you made a comment that you formed an opinion. And you said, however, the media has a, um, may not always represent things as they actually are. I think there could be some slant to the way the media reports things. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. Uh, but at this point, you have an opinion about this case, correct? And may I ask you what that opinion is? Okay. Now, are you going to maintain that opinion and say, well, I think he's guilty, and that's what your opinion is right now, correct? And But if you see other evidence that suggests otherwise, you're open to changing your opinion. But at the present time, as you stand before us right now, uh, you believe that Mr. Daybill is guilty, and that's the opinion you're going to go forward with unless evidence is shown to, to suggest to you something different. Would that be fair? Yeah. Okay, Judge, um, I'm going to move for cause, if I could, please. All right. Um... Courts considered the responses here. Uh, based on those responses, juror number 440, I'm going to uh, sustain the challenge for cause for bias. Um, again, nothing personal. We're trying to find jurors that don't have a preconceived notion of guilt or innocence. Uh, just because you do, nothing wrong with that. You follow the news as many people have. And in this particular case, we're attempting to find jurors where the defendant's not improperly working against an assumption or bias someone may have. So for that reason, juror number 440, I am going to excuse and uphold the defense challenge. Thank you very much for filling out your questionnaire for your honest answers today. Thank you for taking the time to come back in and please drop your questionnaire off with the bail as you exit.
All right, what's next to have your 505 return? All right, your 505 has returned for individual for the questioning. Um, and just briefly reviewing the questionnaire again. You do have some uh, prior connection or knowledge of one of the potential witnesses in this case, great FPQM, an additional. Concern may be some coverage you followed in the news. And so I'll let the state follow up on any additional go dire individuals for this year. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Juror 505, you mentioned you, you have met Greg Hampton here. What was the, uh, the nature of your, your meeting with him? Uh, so I'm, uh, I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. Okay. And was there anything about that interaction that would cause you to give him a greater or lesser weight as a witness? So you could, you could take him as a witness with a clean slate and just weigh it, whatever he says, all the other evidence. Yeah. You mentioned that you had seen me. You think the dateline? I saw a special. My wife watched the dateline. So I picked up that. Okay. Yeah. It was one of the specials. And I, I noticed that you, that you thought it was that, but you weren't sure exactly that, that's what it was. Do you recall when you saw this special? Okay. And uh, do you recall that not? You need to say at all that the content of that special, what it was about? Um, no, just the basic business that's been on the news for the last few calls. And was there anything in that special uh, that, that led you to lean either way as to the potential guilt or innocence of this defendant? Uh, no, I don't remember it, to be honest with you. But, uh, <laughs> okay, so you, you remember seeing it, but you don't really recall the content so much. And and you you feel like you can whatever you did see, uh, it didn't cause you to form an opinion, correct? And you feel like you could uh, you could put that out of your mind and render an impartial verdict. Um. I did notice it said in your uh, in your questionnaire you've had some training in forensic accounting. Yeah, I'm a certified fraud examiner. Okay. I used to be a employee ACFE chapter seven. Okay. Um. So that without going into detail, there there will be some evidence in this case that deals with accounting of funds at some level. Mm -hmm. Um. Having that expertise you have, um, are you going to, do you think you might be kind of critiquing that accounting either way? You know, it would be hard for me to turn that off. You know, I would say, but, um, I, it's, a, it's another professional's strength and power. Okay. And so would, would you be able to look at that evidence um, 
in, in the light that it's shown and, and weigh it against all the other evidence. Um, yeah. Okay. So you, I, neither of this, this defendant or the state has to worry that um, you'll get hyper focused on on one portion of the case. So, and I, and I always say that because I kind of do that sometimes with, you know, like, um, so. Um, I have nothing else about bias. All right, thank you, Mr. Lloyd. Mr. Pryor. No, nothing, Judge, thank you. All right, thank you, counsel. Um, the next matter the court will discuss with this juror then will be as it relates to your questionnaire starting page 12. We have a section in here called attitudes regarding the death penalty. Juror number 505, do you recall reading through those questions in filling out the answers for those questions in that section. Um, yes. And you still concur with or agree with the answers you provided in the questionnaire? Can I them down real quick? Yeah, go ahead and review them. And that goes on for about two pages to the end of 13. I think, mean, yeah. Very well. Um, as we mentioned earlier in the proceedings, in this case, it may be necessary for you to make a determination in regard to the imposition of the death penalty or some other penalty. And remember that any penalty you consider should be considered as if it is absolute and will be carried out in this case. So with that in mind, knowing this is not a hypothetical set of questions, but questions about this case, you've indicated um, on your questionnaire, I'll note, um, there's a line that says, do you support or oppose the death penalty? There was not a response or check there. Is that something you intentionally passed over because you thought it was yes or no, or did you just forget to answer? I had a tough time answering the line. Um, didn't. Okay, so you considered it, you didn't have a yes or no? Yeah. Very well. Um, you next indicated you would, um, it says, do you feel your views on the death penalty would prevent or substantially impair your ability to view the facts impartially? You said no. You still agree with, although you have mixed feelings about it, that you would be able to view the facts impartially. Yeah. The box you circled or letter on page 13 that you circled on that bottom set of choices for what most accurately represents the way you feel. You selected choice C, which says, I generally favor the death penalty, but I would base a decision to impose it on the facts, law, and instructions in this case. Um, do you believe that is an accurate statement of how you feel about the topic? The closest one out of those choices. Okay. Um, one final question then for the court. Do you believe that uh, you'd be in favor of the death penalty in every case where a murder has been committed? Um, yeah. Okay. Regardless of your personal thoughts then, uh, in this case, is there anything that would substantially impair your ability as a juror to perform your duty in accordance with the court's instruction, even if that meant considering the death penalty? All right, thank you for your responses. That concludes the court's inquiry on that topic. From the state, any questions on board are? The state doesn't have any questions regarding this issue. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pryor, any questions for the defense? And sir, you mentioned that um, under item number six on page 13. Well, let me know when you're there, sir. I'll be there. Okay. You circled number C. And if I'm not mistaken, you said, well, that was the closest to the way I feel. Would it be? I think that I mean, is support or not, I would mean, be more towards support. Would it be fair to say that you're neutral? Yeah, probably. Closest. And, if, and if there was a choice between C and D that said, I am neutral <laughs> on the death penalty, would that be a fair assessment that you'd be neutral on the death penalty? That was an option. You circled. You would have circled that one. Okay. Thank you, and thank you for your time, sir. Just I have nothing. Okay. 
Juror 505, that concludes your individual board dire. I'll have you return to the jury room with the bailiff to wait for further instructions as we get to the other jurors this afternoon. So next to have juror 526. All right, welcome back to number 526 for individual board I uh, The court does not see much in the way of any prior case exposure or knowledge. There is some mention of hardship that may be addressed if the state would like to inquire as to that, but we'll move on to our next topic after hardships addressed. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Ma'am, hi. Uh, you indicated that you offered dog boarding in your home. Is that something that you do uh, for income? Yes. And so if you were selected as a juror in this case, would a 10-week trial uh, cause you financial hardship? No. 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 There is do you have any uh, pre existing uh, arrangements or contracts to provide that service with anybody um, that you would have to cancel or anything of that nature that would provide you hardship? Would be hardship. If I was chosen, then I would let the families know that has helped me um, that something. And I'm no longer available. Just that kind of thing. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I'll try. It's okay. <laughs> you also indicated uh, that you have a little boy who has a birthday on June 1st. Is that correct? Yes. Is that going to be a local celebration or would it be something? Out? It's supposed to be at my house. Uh, would there be something about? Throwing that party or having that celebration that would create a hardship for you that would um, make it make you unable to serve on this jury. No. Okay. Thank you very much. I have no other questions at this time. No questions. All right. Thank you. The next topic then for juror five two six we're going to discuss is as it relates to the responses you provided in your questionnaire about attitudes regarding the death penalty. So that's a section within the questionnaire starting on page 12. Do you recall reading those questions and providing answers to those questions? Yes. And are the responses you provided when you filled this out last week still accurate in the way you feel today? Yes. Okay. Um, in the first uh, response, how do you feel about the death penalty? You said, I do not believe in it. Later, on the second page 13 there were some choices there and you said what most accurately represents the way you feel would be choice d quote i am generally opposed to the death penalty but i believe i can put aside my feelings against the death penalty and impose it if it is called for by the facts law and instructions in the case so i'd like to ask if that is still the way you feel about that topic as you sit here today? Yes, yes it is. Okay. And understand um, here in this case, we're not just dealing with hypothetical questions now. Uh, I would advise you in this case that um, it may well be necessary for you to make a determination in this case if you serve on the jury in regard to the imposition of the death penalty or some other penalty. 
Um, and remember, any penalty you consider should be done as if it is absolute and will be carried out in the case. So with response to that, um, you did state that although you may feel opposed to it, you would still follow the facts, law, and instructions in the case, and if required, would be willing to follow those instructions on the death penalty. Is that the way you feel as you sit here today, knowing you may serve as a juror in this case? Yes. Kind of like what you were saying earlier, the recipe that you're given. Um, it does. It is the. So, although it's something you may not be in favor of or like or agree with, if that's the law and the court tells you that is the law, you would be willing to follow an instruction in this case to follow that law? Yes. All right. Uh, that would conclude the court's for dire as to this particular juror. Um, counsel for the state, if you'd like any follow up, I'll allow that as well as the defense. I don't have any questions. I'm on it. Thank you. All right. No questions. questions. All right. That will conclude our individual board for juror 426. Thank you for coming back and your answers. The bailiff will tell you what happens next, and we'll have juror 536 brought in. All right, Jared 536, thank you for returning for some individual questioning here. Reviewing your uh, responses, let me first ask, are all the responses to the best of your recollection still accurate that you provided in this questionnaire? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's been some indication of previous knowledge of the case and perhaps an opinion expressed by this juror regarding guilt or innocence. I don't see much in the way of a concern for potential hardship. So for the state, if you'd like to inquire as it relates to any potential bias, I'll begin there and then I'll move to the defense. Thank you. <clears throat> so ma'am, do you have the other question now? I might reference you this page just to make this a bit easier. I might call your attention to page 15. <clears throat> Excuse me. My first question uh, at the bottom of page 15, you did make an indication that you learned some things about this case from local news. And you, you mentioned perhaps a or some other special. Right? Maybe, yeah, I watch a lot of the show. Okay, okay. So then I would, I would just draw your attention back to the next question. It says, I have an opinion that he was involved. That's right. Seeing Chad and Dave Bell. Can you explain that more? What did you mean by your opinion that he was involved? What do you believe is specific? If we could mute the on table mic while we use the handheld, I think. Yes, sir. Okay, thanks. You're right now, so perhaps. Sorry, ma'am, did you get that question? Um, yeah, so when when it was first in the news with the kids missing, yeah, it just seemed like a really long time went by and 
seem like there were claims of no knowledge at all, you know, or that they were with someone else or. So it just seemed like there was a lot of time that passed where there was no voluntary knowledge of what was what might have happened. So I, without wanting to put words in your mouth, I, I don't. Um, is it accurate to say that you're not sure exactly what you mean if he's involved or just that there was involvement? Is that a safe way to say it? Yeah. Now, you understand that, as Mr. Gabriel says here today, to help the state completes our job, and proves he's guilty, he's got the benefit of our presumption of innocence. You understand that? Yes. Okay. When you make the comment in the questionnaire about you believe he's involved, do you think that's going to impact you and your ability to presume his innocence until you believe he's been proven to be guilty? Now, I know that I need to go by the evidence that we are given. You're prepared to do that? Yes. Okay. Our next level of your attention that, excuse me, to page 19. On page 19, the very last handwritten uh, response that you made, <clears throat> it says, I can't think of any specifics to point specific involvement or specific actions. And that was in response to a question about an opinion. Did you have any other opinion about Mr. Gabriel or this case besides that you believe he was involved in some way? No. <clears throat> You, on the bias portion, I don't have any more questions, Mr. Chair, but I may have some others. Thank you, Mr. Pryor. Juror number 536. You made the comment, you made the comment that um, you um, think he was involved. Was that based on the facts that you had heard some time ago? And said, you know, looking at this thing, it seems like he has some involvement in this. And would that be fair? Or is that how you feel at the present time? Um, well, I guess both. Then okay. Okay, so going into forward, if you were to be cho chosen to stay on the juror, is your mindset that he's guilty right now and I'm going to have to prove that he's innocent? No. Okay, and that's really what I'm trying to get at is um, at the present time you have information based on what some of these folks in the media have provided to you, right? Right. And you recognize that that may not have anything to do with the term. Right. And you may recognize that uh, when media outlets and all of these TV shows that talk about this stuff, they have a tendency to sensationalize them. Yes. It's what sells. I mean, newspapers uh, take all sorts of liberties. TV shows take all sorts of liberties because they have to do that gotcha thing. Right. You recognize that. Yes. And at this point, you don't have any uh, bias or, or you haven't made a decision that Mr. Daybell is guilty at this point. Is that fair? Correct. So you would be agreeable to looking at all the evidence. That includes what the state of Idaho does and those prosecutors. And what I put on before you actually make your determination of what you're going to do. Absolutely. And you will guarantee to all of us that that's the process you're going to go through. And I appreciate you walking through this. And, it's, and you understand how important that is, correct? Yes. And, I, and I'm not trying to talk down or be uh, condescending in any way. I'm just trying to make sure that I, step by step, that we both recognize that it's really important that you, you look at all the evidence. And hear what everybody has to say before you say, This is how I feel about this case. And, and would you be agreeable to that? Yes. Okay, Judge, that's all I have. Thank you very much, Your Honor. All right, thank you.
All right, juror number 536. The next topic I'd like to cover with you, and I'll have some questions and statements, and after that, I'll allow counsel to inquire as well. This relates to attitudes or questions regarding the death penalty, and that's what begins on page 12 of the questionnaire. Do you recall reading those questions and considering and thinking about your thoughts on the death penalty? Yes. Are the responses that you provided still the way you feel and accurate today? Yeah. Okay. Um, as I stated early in the proceedings, it may be necessary for you to make a determination in regard to the imposition of the death penalty or some other penalty in this case. So remember also any penalty we're considering or discussing here in this case should be done as if it is absolute and will be carried out in the case. So with that in mind, you've made responses that um, on part B you say, do you support or oppose it? You indicated you oppose it, is that correct? Yeah. And when given just that yes or no answer, okay. You next indicated in the next two questions, that would not impair your ability to view the facts impartially. Do you still agree with that? I do. And you still agree with that would not impair in your ability to return a guilty ver verdict if the state had proven its case beyond a reasonable doubt? Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you look over to page 13, when you were given your choices, on um, pre-written summaries of what you think most accurately represents the way you feel. You selected choice B, which reads, I'm generally opposed to the death penalty, but I believe I can put aside my feelings against the death penalty and impose it if it is called for by the facts law and instructions in the case. Do you still think that would accurately represent your feelings about the death penalty? Yes. Okay. So knowing here you may potentially serve in a case where that is something you would have to consider as a juror, let me ask you uh, to confirm, would you be willing to follow the court's instructions on the law, even if you may have some opposition to the death penalty and follow any instructions given to you, even if it required you to consider that in this case? Yes. All right, that will conclude the court's questions as it relates to that particular topic. Moving on to the state, then any questions from the state on that? Yes, just a couple, Judge. <clears throat> Ma'am, um, I don't recall the court specifically asked this question, but on page 12 from your questionnaire, the first question about the death penalty, you ask, how do you feel about it in response? Was that fiscally, it seems like it tends to waste money with bills. Um, can you first explain your perspective on that? What do you mean by that? Um, it just seems like there's a lot of money wasted. Um, and it, with the appeals and everything, it just goes on and on. So, you know, life, life in prison is a lot of times what they usually end up serving anyway, but there's just a lot of money spent there. So is it accurate to say that with that statement, do you feel like a death penalty imposition wastes money because of the appellate process? The written, is that what you were trying to say or not? I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah, that's what I mean. So then if that's a feeling that you have, and again, we are just asking you to be really honest. Um, would that feeling have any influence on you when you are listening to the facts of the case and then after the verdict and you're asked to consider the death penalty? Well, that feeling that that imposition of the death penalty is largely can be a waste of money, would that influence your willingness to decide to impose it or not? No, because it's the law here. Okay. 
Your Honor, if I may, I had missed one bias statement. May I go back to that topic? It was just one statement. Go ahead. Thank you. Ma'am, I do want to go back to the issue of potential bias. On page 15 of your questionnaire, <clears throat> there's a question number five. It says, could you, your knowledge of Chad cause you to give either greater or lesser weight to these statements by me? You said yes. Then in your explanation, you wrote, since it seems like he's been untruthful, I would not necessarily believe all statements. In what way have you come to believe that he's been untruthful? What do you mean by that? Well, I guess, first of all, I want to say that I don't necessarily believe everything anyone says. Um, so, yeah, to have the amount of time, like I said before, that it was in the news, you know, where are the kids? And I'm, I'm assuming that there was some untruth, <laughs> untruthfulness going on during that time. But yeah, I don't know for a fact. Okay. I'm... Well, thank you. I, I'll just leave it with the, the last question. And so that, that feeling that, that or assumption that he was in some way untruthful, is that something that you can set aside and still give him the presumption of innocence until we can prove yeah. that he's guilty? Yeah, but I, I won't necessarily believe every statement that he makes just because he says the words. So is it fair to say that you maybe have a, a bias as to his his credibility if he were to take the stand and testify is that what you're saying? And I'll remind you the judge will likely instruct you that you don't have to believe all of anybody's testimony or None of anybody's testimony. It's entirely up to each juror to decide what portion of any witness's testimony they choose to believe. So with, with that understanding, do you feel like this assumption that he's been untruthful is going to cause you to be unwilling or unable to presume that he's innocent? No, I will look at the evidence and that would support either way. Innocence or Thank you. I don't have any more questions, ma'am. All right. Thank you. Mr. Pryor, uh, either on any follow up to that bias topic, I'll commit, as well as any questions you have regarding the court's questions on the government. Okay. And, and ma'am, part of your job, you understand, is to, is to not just look at Mr. Daybell as, a, as anything he may have said, but you're also going to be looking at every single witness. You're going to be looking at police officers. You're going to be looking at witnesses, you're going to be looking at experts. Part of the process is to determine who you believe and what you believe. You agree with that, right? Yeah. And part of that is, is statements made by Mr. Daybell or anybody else. You, part of your job is to evaluate and say, listen, I believe this, I don't believe this. And, and, and if you're being a, doing the job of a juror, as you, you know, seem to be suggesting you will, that that analysis will go on throughout the trial and you making a determination who who what where when you believe Would that be fair yes and then lastly um your comment about um, death penalty and this is at the bottom of number 12. and this is going to promise this going to be my last question mm -hmm. okay i promise yeah. um you said do you feel the death penalty is used in the check too often Okay. Yeah. And then you wrote in there between the fiscal reasoning above, mistakes also happen. So this isn't saying that you are um, going to vote automatically against the death penalty, but in general, you're leaning that, you know what, I've got to be fair and, and look at both sides before I really make a, a fair assessment of this. Would that be a fair statement? Um, yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. And thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Course. Nothing else, Judge. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Council. That will conclude the individual voir dire for juror number 536. Thank you for answering those questions. We'll have you return with the bailiff to the jury room.
await some further instructions before you release today. And thank you for your patience. Juror number 617, we'll talk to next. We'll need a quick break or should we keep going? I mean, I think we might do another bit here. I'm inquiring for staff to. Are you okay, Mary? Okay. The state's okay. Thanks. Sorry. I just asked if anybody needed a quick break or recess before we got to the rest. I think we're ready to just push the All right. Thanks. Welcome back to number 617. This is the time we got you here for some individual questioning on these questionnaires. Uh, I'll note there's been a minimal discussion, but some knowledge of the case and not much in the way of hardship. So if the state would like to make any inquiry as to any potential bias, we'll start there and then I'll allow the defense to follow. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the only thing I saw on um, potential bias, so I just wanted to follow up with you. Um, it looked like you had maybe limited media exposure or limited knowledge of the case. You had written a statement on a question regarding your ability to act impartially. You had written, I would try to act impartially. So I was just going to follow up with you as to what you meant by that. Um, yeah. I don't know how you could live in Idaho and not know about the case. And, and so uh, try to, uh, at least I, I've tried to, you know, especially, I haven't you know, watched it all the news when the reference comes on sense. And, and actually, I stopped watching it because it sort of you know, beating us up a bit you know, a long time ago. You know, I was on Dateline and everything. And so I, I I, I think it's important to try. Like I said, I'd do my best and listen to the evidence and stuff because I, uh, I think a jury, serving on a jury, it's like one of the things that the American that we do is hear you know, the, uh, the economy of your off a trial by the jury of your peers. And so it's, it's to me, it's almost like a it's like something you're supposed to be an American citizen. You try to do your best for the person in the jury. Like you said, both sides actually talk about the case. And when you talk about the media coverage that you saw, and you said that you will try, and I appreciate your honesty. So, knowing everything that you've seen and heard, do you feel that you could set that aside and act impartially, or do you? Do you still have concerns as to whether or not you'd be able to do that? You know, I would try. I, I don't think it's like, like I said, I stopped a long time ago. Like I didn't even watch the day one thing. I remember day one. And uh, because it's just, it's just been overwhelming. At this point. So it's, it's a, anyway, yeah, I, I think I can set it aside. I'll do my best. I don't have any further questions. Thank you for that. All right. Thank you, Mr. Pryor. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, next topic, then, juror number 617. There is a section of the questionnaire that you filled out, and it's entitled Attitudes Regarding the Death Penalty. Do you recall reading through those questions and answering those? Yes. And are your responses contained in your questionnaire still accurate as to the way you feel as you sit here today? Yes. Okay. I'm going to walk through some of these responses you have here. Um, the first, uh, you made a comment in opposition and also 
It says, do you support or oppose the death penalty? You indicated you oppose it. Is that accurate? Yes. All right. Now, just so you know, that what I'll try to resolve here are your responses on that part C and D with the response you have on the next page. And again, we're, we're just getting information. So I'm on page 12 and kind of right in the middle of that page, there's a question C, 1C on page 12. And it says, if you've located it, do you feel that your views on the death penalty would prevent or substantially impair your ability to view the facts impartially? And you said no. And then the next question, do you feel your views on the death penalty would prevent or substantially impair your ability to return a guilty verdict of first degree murder against the defendant, even if the state had proven its case beyond a reasonable doubt? You said no, that would not impair that ability. Um, at the bottom of the page, you say it should never be used. And then if you just flip over to page 13, and I'll have you finally review your response at the very bottom of the page where you circle G. Okay, so the questions I'm going to have following up. If in this case, the court were to give you instructions indicating that you had to consider the death penalty, and let me go back before I finish that comment and, and say to you, as we've said, uh, in this case, it may be necessary for you to make a determination. So this is not a hypothetical and a determination in regard to imposing the death penalty or some other penalty. And also you have to consider here this, uh, you should consider that this could be done and it would be absolute and would be carried out in this case. So if that's where you, what you are considering, if the court were to instruct you that you were to consider death penalty, would you be willing to do that? No, sir. If, it, if that's the only option, I wouldn't be able to do that. If we couldn't, couldn't vote for life, you know, for all the things like that. Wouldn't be. Okay, so if that's the case, do you think your views now on the death penalty would prevent or substantially impair your ability to perform your duty and follow jury instructions if those instructions were included here? You know, I, I have a hard time reading the with it because I don't know how your instructions will go. Uh, I can't imagine you going to go back and sentence this guy to death. <laughs> You know, we're given the choice to do the penalty. You know, why couldn't we go for life in prison without parole? But if, but if the choice, the only choice is the death penalty, I couldn't do it. I just truly could not do it. Okay. And again, your personal views are absolutely protected and allowed. And we're just getting to a question of whether or not you are able to serve in this particular case where this is an issue. Um, I guess another way I would ask it then, and, and um, just to be clear, it's not necessarily some sort of voting system, but in terms of an instruction you would receive of considering how much proof there is or is not to determine if the death penalty should be opposed. If that's where this case ended up, are you telling me unequivocally that you would not be able to follow an instruction if it required you to consider and or impose the death penalty if the state gave you enough evidence that you had to do that. Sure. You would not do it under any circumstance. Okay, thank you so much for your candid responses. Let me ask the state if they have any follow-up for this juror. Your Honor, the state has no follow-up questions but would move to excuse this juror. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, um, Ms. Blake, please repeat, and then I'll go on to Mr. Pryor's position. Your Honor, based on the, the juror's response that he unequivocally could not uh, impose the death penalty, if it came down to that, the state would move to have this juror removed for cause. All right, there's been a challenge here, Mr. Pryor. What's the response? And you may inquire on uh, or Dyer if there's any rehabilitation. Like Judge, may I pursue some rehabilitation? Yes. And Judge, can I have permission to stand up? We've been sitting for so long. If you'd can like, you yeah. Podium? You may approach the podium to make sure you use the microphone. And juror number 617, I want to clarify something. If you were chosen as a juror in this case, and the judge gave you an instruction that said you were to consider either life imprisonment as an option or the death penalty as an option, would you follow the court's decision and agree to consider both of those? Okay. And let me finish that by curriculum, sir. Um, there are, would it be fair to say there's, there are circumstances that you would consider the death penalty? Okay. Could I give you an example? Would you mind talking about this a little bit with me? Sure. Okay. Um, it sounds like when you made mention that uh, you think that it's, it's a high honor to serve on a jury and it's our obligation as citizens. Would you agree with me in that regard? Okay. <clears throat> and as a high honor, it's also part of our laws of our country. To protect our country. Our president's job is to protect our country. So there are a very brave military and our police officers and all of the folks that are involved in any aspect of law enforcement. If we were attacked in a foreign country and they started engaging in genocide, do you understand what genocide is? Yes. And they started killing people needlessly. And at some point there was some sort of um, um, trial. And it's an egregious act. Children, young people murdered on the streets. Horrendous acts of violence against people and our citizens in this country. And at that point, we have to make a decision. And the options are to consider the death penalty. And if it means we have to take actions in order in the future to protect our country, is that a situation where you would consider, even consider, uh, make, you know, voting to uh, impose the death penalty on a situation like that? I even don't quite dislike it. It's who I am. And, and I believed it for years. I believed it from my teens. And once I became and joined the Catholic Church, my hope set in is just reinforcement. It, it, is, it is part of my mission. If I have it in my family, if I was killed, if I died by another person's hand in a violent act, my family is not to let the prosecutor pursue the death team. I, I, I understand, and, and I, and, you know, I have, you know, and I think I'm a loyal American. I would. Defend this country, I you know and stuff, but I just—it's different in a war. You know, you're taking somebody's life. I, I don't feel it's right. I don't—I don't feel it's justice. I, I feel it's revenge. It's—it's. It's, it's, I'm sorry. I no. I will not. I can't not vote for the death. And sir, there's no apology needed because you know what? Um, I think I spoke with all of you folks earlier and said there's no right or wrong answer here. It's what each of us individually believe in our hearts. So there's no need to apologize because what you believe, what we're trying to establish is, and, and my questioning is not to get you to change your mind. That's not what my intent is here, sir. What I'm trying to do is find out whether there is a very narrow exception that says, yes, there are exceptions where I would consider the death penalty. They would be very narrow, but I'm not absolute. I, I've got some situations where I would consider that. But I think you've answered my question. And I appreciate your candor and I appreciate everything. And I'm not trying to disparage you or in any way that as I stated to all the other jurors, there is no right or wrong answer. It's what each of us honestly believe and tell the court what we believe. And 
And I want to thank you for your honesty. Thank you, sir. All right, the court has considered the motion to strike as to this particular juror, juror number 617, the juror stating unequivocally they would be unable because of personal views and beliefs to follow or unwilling to follow an instruction if it involves imposition of the death penalty. The court finds there is cause to strike juror 617. Uh, thank you so much for your candor and expressing your opinions on that issue. You can be excused with the sincere thanks of the court for your service today and for last week filling out the questionnaire. And we will go ahead and discuss this with another juror. And you can be excused. Please drop the questionnaire off with the bailiff. Juror number 631. All right, thanks for returning juror number 631 uh, for individual or dire counsel. There's a bit of a expression of concern on hardship and there was a request for hardship excuse. Uh, let me just start off by asking for a little more detail. You stated maintenance of medical equipment at a hospital. Um, can you explain how that issue would be addressed by you if it's still a concern? Uh, I'm, I was the only technician trained at our hospital to work on uh, MCG machines. I've spoken with the management about that. They were calling me outside for if I do this question. Okay, so you no longer have a concern about a possible hardship if you're required to serve in this case? No. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Council, I don't see any other uh, grounds of inquiry in terms of bias or uh, hardship, so I would propose we move on to the next topic. Does the state agree? Your Honor, I just ask one question. Go ahead, Mr. Juror 631, would, uh, would this pose any type of financial hardship? No. Okay. My company pays for That's it. All right. Any questions? Thanks, Judge. All right. So the next topic the court wants to discuss with you then, Juror 631, is in relation to your attitudes regarding the death penalty. Um, you filled out a section in your questionnaire starting on page 12 there and advised us of your views on the subject. Are the responses you made there still accurate in the way you feel as you sit here today? Yes, I think so. Okay. Uh, let me advise you in this case, um, it may be necessary for you to make a determination in regard to the imposition of the death penalty or some other penalty. And when you're thinking about that, you should consider that it would be done as if it's absolute and would be carried out in the case if that was your decision. So with that in mind, uh, looking at your questionnaire, you've stated on the B section in the middle, page 12, that given a choice of support or oppose the death penalty, you indicated you support it. Is that still the way you feel? Yes. Okay. And then just given a choice of selections about what accurately represents the way you feel uh, on page 13, you circled paragraph C 
which reads, quote, I generally favor the death penalty, but I would base a decision to impose it on the facts, law, and instructions of the case, end quote. Is that still, you think, the accurate representation of your thoughts on the death penalty? Yes. Okay, where you've indicated you would follow the instructions if required to do that. Um, one other question I'll have for you then. Would you, um, pardon me, would you be in favor of the death penalty on every case where a murder has been committed? It depends on the case. Okay, so if the instructions were there that you were to consider it, you would be able to consider it. If you were not instructed to consider it or instructed not to consider it, would you be willing to follow those as well? Okay, that concludes the court's for dire of this juror as it relates to the death penalty. Is the state wishing to have any more dire on that issue? All right, from the defense, any questions? Just a few. Sir, so I'm, I'm looking at your questionnaire and it's on top of page 14. Could you refer to that for me? And, and I'll read that uh, as best I can. If you were in favor of the death penalty in some cases, do you agree that a sentence of life in prison rather than the death penalty would be appropriate under proper circumstances in some cases? And you marked the no. So I guess I, 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 I'm just, and this is not a quiz or anything else. Obviously, I think we spoke earlier and I mentioned that there's no right or wrong answer. It's what each of us personally believe in our hearts. And that's what we were trying to arrive at here. What are your personal beliefs? And what are those beliefs? 16 or 20 people, everybody has different beliefs. But there's no right or wrong. You get to say what your beliefs are and, 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 and let us know so we can do an assessment of where we think whether you fit here or not. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay, so when it says that um, you would not consider life in prison as an option, if the if for some reason, and this isn't to apply to Mr. Daybell, so he'll be found guilty. But if we are in front of a, and the jury uh, makes a decision that it's a guilty verdict, and the court gives you a life sentence as an option, and the death penalty as an option, and you two are, you are have to decide which of those two you're going to choose. The way I'm reading number seven there is that you will always choose the death penalty. I didn't interpret that question that way. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so is it fair to say then that under certain circumstances you would not impose it? Yes, and on the circumstances, yes. Okay. When you're looking at those items, A, B, C, D, E, and F, and G, and that would be on page 13. Did you go to 13 for me? Do you mind? Let me know what you think. Okay, here it is. Um, you marked number C. And then right below it is number D. And the only difference between C and D is C says I'm generally in favor of the death penalty, and D says I'm generally opposed. But both of those say I'm going to consider other options. Would you agree with that? With that, that both of the relatively close with the exception. One says generally opposed, one says generally agreed. Am I confusing you? A little bit. Okay, sorry. In looking at those, you mark number C, and then right below that is number D. Do you see number D? Yeah. And it's basically the same writing in D, except the first part says generally opposed. You see how that's written? Okay. Would it be fair to say that you're between the generally opposed and generally uh, agreeable and that you're more neutral on this and you're going to take the time to look at the facts of the case and make a determination how you're going to vote 
based on the facts of each individual case. And I'm not saying that. I'm not necessarily saying you're not opposed to it, but when given that opportunity, if that should happen, you're going to weigh both of those equally, aren't you? Yeah. And you're not going to rule one way or the other until you have all of the facts and make an informed decision of which way you're going to go. Would that be fair? Would that be fair? Okay. Is that how you would feel in this situation? And you would be neutral and weigh the facts one way or the other before you make that final decision? Well, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Is that, is that how you feel? Or do you feel that you really just agree with that penalty and then that's where I tend to where I tend to be wanting to be? I guess that's what I'm trying to establish here. I would say I'm not opposed to that penalty. It's on the table and you know if I feel it's needed, then that's the way I'm going to do it. Okay. So you're gonna look at both circumstances then. Yes. Okay. And Judge I have nothing else. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Uh Turn number 631, then that will conclude the individual for Dyer. Have you returned to the jury room? Thank you for your patience. I know it's been a long day for you today. We'll have you instructed to further as soon as we can. We've got a few more to get through, and then we'll call you back into the courtroom shortly. Juror 647. All right, juror 647, thank you for returning. We're going to conduct some additional voir dire here. The court wanted to first address issues of potential bias. Um, I don't believe there were any concerns regarding hardship. Counsel, the court did offer a special instruction, and I would note that uh, this juror has some specific knowledge of the companion case. And so perhaps those are appropriate lines of questions here too. Uh, I am going to let the state first inquire as to whether or not there would be a bias to be considered, and then I'll let the defense proceed after that. So who's conducting board diagram for the state? All right, Ms. Beatty, go ahead. Hi there. Uh, just a few quick questions. I saw that you uh, had seen a little bit about this case on the news. Uh, and I, I want to specifically talk about um, on page 15, uh, you indicated that you had seen on the news uh, that Lori Vallow was recently found guilty and sentenced uh, in her case. Knowing that, uh, would you be able to take Mr. Daybell, the defendant, and give him a clean slate and a presumption of innocence for going into this case? Yes, and fair and impartial. Okay. And there's nothing else that you saw about this case that would influence your decision making process in any way. And just if you understand that what you've seen on the news or heard on TV or social media is not evidence. Correct. That's all the questions I have, Connor. All right. Thank you, Mr. Pryor. No questions, Jared. 
All right. The next topic then the court will address a future 647 relates to responses you provided on your questionnaire starting on page 12. And this is on the topic of attitudes regarding the death penalty. Do you recall reading through those questions and answering those in the questionnaire? Yes. And are the answers you provided still true and accurate in the way you feel as you sit here today? Yes. All right, as I previously stated in this case, it may be necessary for you to make a determination in regard to the imposition of the death penalty or some other penalty. And remember, any penalty you consider should be done as if it is absolute and will be carried out in the case. So considering that then um, you were posed a question about the supporter opposed the death penalty and to summarize you said it's more complicated than that for me is that a good summary of how you answer you question mark both of those options yes because i don't think i actually have a strong opinion and um i know when i got maybe over to page 13 and just talking about that there is law and there is rule i don't know those and i'm not familiar with it so that is something that um kind of swayed my support or oppose, I would need to have more information. Okay. To grasp that, like understanding the process. You stated in your questionnaire that your views on the death penalty would not prevent you from being impartial in this case and viewing the facts impartially. Do you still feel that way? I do feel that way. You've also stated that your views on the death penalty would not prevent you from the ability to return a guilty verdict of first degree murder if the state proved its case beyond a reasonable doubt. Do you still feel that way? Uh, yep, I still feel the same way. All right, on page 13, you did circle D out of the choices there to say what most accurately represents how you feel. You said uh, the choice you made, not your words, but in the questionnaire. I am generally opposed to the death penalty, but I believe I can put aside my feelings against the death penalty and impose it if called for by the facts, law, and instructions in the case. Um, you added some additional language on that, but is that still the way you feel at this time? Um, given those choices that I was given, yes, that was the one that I would say would be closest to my alignment. Okay, so to be clear, if the court did instruct you that in this particular case you were to consider it, you're telling me that would not impact your ability to return a verdict, is that correct? Correct. And if the state proved its case beyond a reasonable doubt, you would be able to return a guilty verdict, is that correct? Correct. And likewise, uh, you would be also willing to fully follow any instructions the court gave you, even if it required you to consider the death penalty. Is that accurately how you feel? Yes, correct. All right, that will conclude the court's inquiry on for Dyer for this topic. I'll let the state proceed if they have any questions. And Your Honor, I don't have any additional questions. Thank All right, thank you, Ms. Bailey. No questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay, juror number 647, then that concludes your individual for Dyer. Thank you for your candid responses today. We'll go ahead and have you return to the jury room while we go through our remaining jurors and call you back as soon as we can. Thanks Thank for your you. patience. Juror number 653 will be next. All right, juror 653, thank you for returning for some additional board questioning. Uh, there's a bit of 
previous case knowledge you do have in addition there was a concern of hardship let me first ask you some additional questions about the potential hardship here um, you did fill out on your questionnaire and you said it could be a financial hardship given 10 weeks and no paycheck is that still the position you're at currently no that was before my employer told me that i was covered okay thank you so much for clarifying that Given that, then, do you have any concerns about a hardship if you are required to serve in this case? Yeah. All right. Uh, with that, then, let's have this for Dyer limited to any questions on potential bias with some case knowledge. And then we'll move on to the next topic if we get through there, beginning with the state. Your Honor, the state doesn't have any questions as to bias or case knowledge on this arbitrary. Okay. No questions, Judge. All right. Um, so, juror number 653, then the next topic we would discuss is it in relation to your answers about your attitudes regarding the death penalty? Mm -hmm. Do you recall reading through those questions and answering those questions on that topic? It starts on page 12 in the questionnaire if you want to refer to your copy. Yeah. Okay. Are the answers you provided in that section of the questionnaire still true and accurate? Yes, it is. And that's the way you feel as you sit here today? Yes, it is. You indicated that you would support the death penalty and say you agree it's appropriate under Idaho law. Is that correct? If it's appropriate, yeah. All right. And on page 13, you were given some options about what best represents how you feel. Um, you circle D, and D says, I am generally opposed to the death penalty, but believe I can put aside my feelings against the death penalty and impose it if it is called for by the facts, law, and instructions in the case. So do you believe that accurately represents your feelings about the topic? As far as all of the choices were, that was the closest, I guess. I'm not one that I'm not just straight and fall for it and I'm not straight against it. It's just okay. In this case, I will advise you that it may be necessary for you to in fact make a determination here on the topic of death penalty and make a decision in regard to the imposition of the death penalty or some other penalty. And you need to consider that as if it would be done and would be absolute and carried out in the case. So knowing that then where you've indicated maybe some opposition to it, would you be willing to follow the court's instructions in this case, even as it relates to any instructions on the death penalty? Correct. No way. Okay, is there anything about your personal views or opinions or beliefs which would make you be unable to or unwilling to follow any jury instructions provided to you? No, not at all. Do you have a feeling that or a belief that it would be appropriate for the death penalty to be imposed in every case where a murder has been committed. No. Okay, so you'd be willing to consider each case independently based on a court's instruction. Independently on the facts of the case. All right, that will conclude the court's inquiry as it relates to this juror. Does the state have any questions for juror 653 on that issue? We have no questions, Your Honor. No questions, Your Honor. Okay, thank you for returning, juror 653. We'll have you go back to the jury room and we should be getting to you pretty quick here to release you for the evening. We'll next bring in juror 686. <laughs>
All right, welcome back to number 686. This is the time we have for some individual questioning. Um, I'd note that you didn't indicate any previous knowledge of the case. So in terms of bias, will the, I'll just inquire of the state, the state with any further or dire on bias. Your Honor, I have no questions regarding um, bias or hardship. All right. I don't need judge. Okay, um, I've actually got one I do want to follow up on, on on hardship, just to be clear here, juror 686. So you said the length of the trial wouldn't be a problem. Uh, you did make one comment on page 20, um, and you said that with the court's trial schedule of finishing each day at 3.30, it said that time would allow me to continue to fulfill work obligations. So I wanted to sort of clarify what may be happening here. Is it your uh, proposal to us or yourself that would you believe you're going to be working full time or maintaining whatever current job you have while this trial is, is going for those 10 weeks? Uh, not full time, uh, part time. I'm a resident for my clinic. And so I would either need to um, contact the residency or, and my company and kind of let them know that I'm going to be completely off for 10 weeks or work you know, a few hours um, every day just to kind of maintain my residency position. Okay. The reason I bring that up is I believe you may find between the time to get here or even listen to trial through a day that might uh, you might be mentally exhausted and done working. So I just want to dispel any uh, sense that maybe somebody could have work full-time and do this full-time, I think it'd be very difficult. Um, so I appreciate your response. The court raised that. Any further questions on his work obligations from the state? I guess just briefly, without additional information, does anything about that in your mind impact your ability to sit on a jury in this matter? No, if I'm here, I'm committed. Thank you. I have no additional questions. Okay. No questions, Josh. Thank you. All right. The next topic then we'll get to uh, is on your attitudes regarding the death penalty. That was addressed in the questionnaire starting on page 12. Do you recall reading through those questions and answering those questions? I do. As you sit here today, do you think your responses are still accurate in the way you feel? I do. All right. Let me just advise you uh, that in this case, it may be necessary for you to make a determination in regard to the imposition of the death penalty or some other penalty. And remember, any penalty you consider should be considered as if it is absolute and will be carried out in this case. So with that in mind, I'll note you had a choice first on page 12 on the question, do you support or oppose the death penalty? You said you support the death penalty. Is that still your position here today? It is. You next stated you didn't think any opinion you held on that would prevent you from being an impartial juror. Is that still the way you feel? Correct. And do you believe you'd be able to follow all of the court's instructions relating to the death penalty if they were provided in this case? I do. All right. On your selections on page 13, where we gave you some options about what most accurately represents the way you feel. You selected choice D that said, I am generally opposed to the death penalty, but I believe I can put aside my feelings against the death penalty and impose it if it is called for by the facts law and instructions in the case. Is that the way you feel about it? Yes. Okay, so with that general opposition, um, I'll just ask you to cover this, you would, does that mean you're not in favor of the death penalty in every case? Um, so I guess to clarify, I support the death penalty as an option. I personally feel that um, I generally oppose it just because I feel that death might be considered an easy way out for some people. And so part of that goes along um, with the argument against it, which is the life imprisonment in a small cell would be, I consider, a far worse punishment than killing someone. Okay. 
given all of your thoughts on this then and your responses, is it correct for me to say that you would be willing to follow any court's instructions, even if it required you to consider the death penalty on proof of evidence by the state? Yes. All right, that will conclude the court's for dire on that topic for this juror 686. Does the state have any questions? The state does not have any additional questions. All right, thank you from the question. Okay, juror 686. Thank you for returning for individual voir dire. We're going to talk to one more juror individually and then we'll bring you back in. Oh, thank you. Sir. You're welcome. Our final juror of this group will be juror 740. All right, you're 740. Thank you for returning. We've got some additional individual questions for you. Do you recall filling out and completing the questionnaire last week? Yes. And is everything you provided in there still true and accurate as well as you remember? Yes. Okay. Council, there are some indications here both of a potential hardship and also a knowledge of the case we need to discuss. Let me first. Uh, indicate you you said and we don't need to discuss terms you can if you would like you've got a medical procedure that would need to be rescheduled um, you did indicate you thought that would be a hardship if you were required to serve here for 10 weeks let me just confirm is it still the status as you mentioned in here that that procedure would have to be rescheduled yes and how can you just explain to me a little bit about how much of a hardship that would be or whether you just simply think that shouldn't be rescheduled? Uh, no, I don't think it'll be a hardship. I can just have it rescheduled until August. Or, or... Okay, so it's an elective procedure and it's not on some critical time frame. No. Okay, that was my only question on that. Council, you can inquire further on any hardship. In addition, there is some case knowledge uh, starting with the state, if you'd like a question on bias, we'll begin there. Your Honor, uh, juror 740. So, it, reading over your questionnaire, it looks like you uh, you have followed this case fairly closely. Is that accurate? Yes. And uh, it, it looks like, and I'm not going to delve into it, but you know a lot of the facts, or at least the facts as reported by the media. And you're familiar with the defendants uh, with his with his wife's case. Correct. And you mentioned um, did you did you follow that trial? Just from news reports. The news reports, okay. But you did keep her with it. Yes. And is there, you have your, your questionnaire with you. Could you open it to page 19 and question 10D? Yes. And so is it is it fair, and I don't want to mischaracterize what you said, but is it, is it fair to say that you feel as though the media has uh, trade this defendant as well? Correct. And 
he then go on to say you'd be able to put that out of your mind if you render an impartial verdict. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. Um, understanding, uh, <clears throat> understand that the state has the burden of proof, and that this defendant has has the benefit of uh, the presumption he is innocent until proven guilty. And so. When you say, I think I can, and, and there's not a wrong answer. There's nothing wrong with your answer, just, just to be clear. Um, can you understand how both the state and the defendant might be concerned if that's not an unqualified yes, I can set it aside? Yes. Um, Uh, I did want to ask another question, maybe related to bias. Uh, and I don't want to go into the details of it. It sounds like one of your siblings may have gotten into a little bit of trouble. Okay. Uh, would that affect how you view law enforcement or the court system in any way? I have a bias against how his court is Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. Uh, do you think, is it possible that that might uh, even unintentionally seep into how you view this case? It's possible, but I think it would seep in that innocent intent. Okay, so on, on the benefit of the defense. Yes. Your Honor, uh, based on Juror 740's answer, they, they think they can, but without that unqualified um, ability to state that she can render an impartial verdict, the state would move to excuse uh, 740 for cause. Uh, response from the defense. Judge, I guess I, I given that, uh, that uh, slightly unclear answer. She could or not, she's sure she's I'm sure she's trying to do her best. I'm sure she I think I have to start being All right, there's been a motion to strike the cause 740 from the state, not opposed by the defense. Uh, the court was likewise concerned that too much knowledge and information about this case may have led to a shifting of the burden uh, against the presumption of innocence of the defendant. Again, it's nothing personal. Everybody's certainly entitled to follow the news. Many people do, and oftentimes draw opinions based on what they've seen. In this particular case, that would make it inappropriate for you to continue on as a juror. So if you have basically concluded your service as a juror in this case, thank you so much for taking the time you did to come in today, as well as filling out your questionnaire last week. You will be excused for cause, and please leave your copy of your questionnaire with the bailiff on your way out. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Bailiff, we'll have the remaining jurors return, please. If there's something brought back in your honor. Okay. All 
Thank you. Please be seated. All right, if I correctly organize my stack here, uh, biggest number smallest, we should have returning here 0686, 653, 647, 631, 536, 526, and 505. Did I catch all of your numbers there? Is there anybody here that I didn't call their number? Okay. Um, thank you for returning then. At this time, I'm going to ask, beginning with the state here, will the state pass these remaining jurors for cause? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Does the defense pass this group for cause? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. I know it's been a long day for you. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have been passed for cause. We'll continue to question additional groups of jurors until we reach the necessary number we need to exercise peremptory challenges. You're going to receive additional instructions through our jury commissioner, Andy Rutland who will advise you of when you will be required to return to find out if you are selected to serve in this case. While you are waiting for that to happen, please follow the court's previous admonishment not to do anything to uh, develop a bias in this case by investigating the case. Don't do any investigation of the case. Look into the case. Discuss your jury service with anyone other than to talk about uh, potentially and arranging schedules to provide for your jury service. And I'll be asking you to complete an admonishment when you return that you have followed that instruction and not investigated the case. If anybody wants to talk to you about the case, don't allow them to. And if they persist, you can report that to the court. Uh, with that in mind, then I believe this group of jurors can be excused awaiting further instructions on when you'll return anything else before we allow them to be released today from the state. No, Your Honor, thank you. From the defense. No, Your Honor. Okay, everyone, please rise. We'll let these jurors be excused. Just wait for this. Thank you. Please be seated. Council, we have another group lined up for tomorrow, nine o'clock, given uh, the schedule and where we went today. The good news is we did go through a lot of jurors and get some available for peremptory challenge. Uh, it took a while and we still need to get through questionnaires to be releasing jurors that simply aren't going to be able to serve. So we don't have so many being held up. So my proposition is to do that group at nine and then work through some questionnaires and a few other additional matters the court needs to attend to. Um, does the state approve of that plan going forward for tomorrow's schedule? Yes, Your Honor. If I might inquire if the court happens to have an idea of how many groups you'd like us to have ready to do the questionnaires. Okay, I'll probably address that as an administrative matter off the record and we can talk about that before we leave today. From the defense, are you okay with that time, Mr. Pryor? Yes, okay, we'll take up that group tomorrow then. Uh, we'll go off the record at this point, and I'll talk to counsel about preparation for jury questionnaire reviews tomorrow. That will conclude the proceedings. Thanks everyone for complying with the court's administrative order for the courtroom. We'll be in recess. So here we are. Well, I guess we can. Crash. I'm oh, sorry. I'm trying to find. My... I look. I ran back here to my room. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh, he's about to end. <laughs> Thank you, Beach Bum. I meant to tell you that I, I wasn't on the thing. I was watching it on my TV, but. Oh my God, y'all just ran. I got my exercise done just now. <laughs> Holy crap. There we are. Thank you. I, we are. I, can't, I can't think about all that stuff. <laughs> hey, y'all are some freaking troopers, y'all. <laughs> this was a long ass day. Uh, I, we lost no, stream was. or we, we lost our feed to Facebook. So 
I think there's like a stipulation as far as how long you can stream somewhere. So <clears throat> I, if they're going to be long days like this, you know, I'll have to like break it into two, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, I feel bad, but you know, that's why we're doing it this week. That way we can kind of work out the kinks. The other thing, Donna, in the, in the corner where in StreamYard where it tells you how many people are in here, it's been saying four and 500 all day. I looked on YouTube and it's like, I think, that's, it's, I, I think it's the views. I think like that people come, people, yeah, people coming in and out. But it's been like that since way earlier. So I, I really don't know. I mean, that was like, I, or maybe, maybe Chris people on earlier. those, are, yeah, maybe the uh, people on other platforms too, like, uh, x or twitter whatever the heck it yeah. is i don't know but uh we had a, we had almost 300 people in in the uh chat at one time so yeah well that's yeah. awesome it, i mean it doesn't matter i just am wondering why the numbers are you know different that's that's not i don't usual. know i don't i don't know different, different, the different. likes either yeah well thank you guys thank you mods you guys are awesome thanks for thanks to all who you know, donated through PayPal and Venmo and Super Chats and gifting memberships. And I mean, just all the things that you guys do, it's so appreciated. The conversation was great all day. You guys are humorous and informative. And, you know, y'all just have a really good. We've been in this for a long time. So I, I just I can't imagine being with anyone else you know i only want to do this with you guys <laughs> uh, a live stream on youtube max is 11 hours 59 minutes well hmm. all righty <laughs> thank you mohawk mom but thank you so much everybody and um we'll see you tomorrow same time same place <laughs> thank you all it's good uh love always wins justice for tylee charles tammy jj and joe <laughs> Bye, guys.